the pound. Break you up, then bring you down. When you ain't looking, I'm gonna hit you like a hundred pounds. Break you up, then bring you down. When you ain't looking, I'm gonna hit you like a hundred pounds. Break you up, then bring you down. When you ain't looking, I'm gonna hit you like a hundred pounds. Break you up, then bring you down.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to round five. It's Sunday. We have 12 best of three, six players. Move, well, actually, no, excuse me, 12 players move on to the playoffs. Six or six from Europe, three from Asia, three from Americas. I don't know why I like the number six, but uh, I have six reasons why it's a good time that Ravi is joining me, although don't ask me to actually use them at the moment. Anyways, <laughs> before we start talking about StarCraft and everything else that's important, we do, of course, have to talk about the fact that we have awesome sponsors. Monster Energy, the U.S. Air Force, ESL Shop, Blizzard, all working together to make sure that today, of all days, when players eliminate or get eliminated, get are able to advance, well, <clears throat> making sure that, that those games are fantastic. And by the way, you want to know that they're advancing and they're going somewhere and they're doing something well, they're qualifying for Dallas, which means it's going to be an offline event. It's going to be great. If you want to go get your tickets right now, you can use promo code StarCraft. Get 15% off. Go and uh, spend the savings on barbecue or barbecue cauliflower or something. Uh, anyways, you can spend it on food, and that's, that's, that's a pretty good thing. Absolutely is. Honestly, in uh, the Dallas events, if you've ever been to any of the StarCraft events, we had like DreamHax for you know, Atlanta or Valencia and everything, they are an absolute treat, especially, I know I have a lot of North American bias, but the North American events, they truly do live up to the hype. The audience and the people and the crowd and everything over there is usually absolutely lit. So I heavily recommend going if you've never been to a StarCraft event before. Is that is it lit like the the smokers are lit in the early in the wee hours of the morning? So I you don't can... think you're allowed to smoke at the venue. <laughs> True, I guess that's fair. Anyways, as we get ready for today, we should talk about what's happening today. I mentioned at the top of the show, three series from from Asia, six series from there we go, six series from Europe, and then three more series from America. And Ravi, as we take a look at what we start with here with Asia, Oliveira. On round five, Firefly on round five, Cyan on round five. These are three players that I really would have expected to qualify much earlier. Yeah, Asia truly has been the sort of mystery region this season because like you were kind of alluding to, we have other players who have already made it through. And it's not necessarily that they are bad players or anything, but I would say another notable player who I kind of expected to make it through earlier, if not on like round four or something, or after Oliveira, it'd be like nice. Nice also making it through in like round four as opposed to like a round three when Oliveira and you know all these other like Cyan and everything are not actually through just yet. It's kind of crazy right now. We've had such a hectic Asia group stage. Yeah, I mean, you talk about you know, nice making it through round four or round five. Oliveira's not there. The fact that we have these three Protoss upstarts, we have Jayshi, Lemon, and Nami, all of whom have really, I mean, Jayshi's been up and coming for a little bit. He's been solid, but all these three players who, <laughs> this is kind of their first exposure to the scene realistically in terms of making a deep run. I know uh, I was talking with some people like at round one, I think round two about how you know, look, Nami was impressive last season. He, he looked good. But there's a difference between now, ah, like he didn't look like he was dying immediately to, to Oliveira versus beating Oliveira in round four, qualifying with a three and one scoreline. That's pretty impressive. Uh, but that also means, of course, Ravi, as we talk about things, this is a setup now where this is Oliveira, our reigning world champion, the champion of every single season since we moved on to ESL Masters Asia versus, you know, Chinese region, Cyan won one of those. He's won every single one of these. And now there's a very real world where he's not going to make playoffs. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I do think it's kind of weird because I say this, but also Oliver has been the favored player in I think all of the matches he's played. Um, reigning world champion. But he should be favored coming into the series versus SCV, who I think is a promising player. He is a player that has definitely shown some good games and everything. And I definitely think that he absolutely is capable of at least like taking a map or something off of Oliveira. But if you remove the group stage context, I would have said, yeah, I think he can take a map, but Oliveira really should be winning this. Now, it's a little bit more up in the air. I actually don't know 100%. Well, we're going to figure that out because, you know, we can talk all we want about what might happen. We can talk about what will happen because game one, Oceanborn, Ravi, we're ready to go. 
And at the bottom right here, the young upstart playing for Mystery Gaming. He's the Brodos player. It's SCV. And up here at the top left-hand side of the map, we have the red Terran player. He is Oliveira. Representing DKZ Gaming. You know, Ravi, I think it's actually really fitting. As, as we look here, Oliveira, he's spawning on the top side of the map. And for whatever reason, just because of how the logo's mod works, his team logo is upside down. And I think that's fitting because not only is the team logo upside down, this the entire format of this group stage is upside down. Oliveira here in round five. And, you know, you talk about, okay, if this isn't the context of this series, of this group stage, Oliveira's, we would expect maybe SCV takes a map. But Oliveira played a best of three against a Protoss player yesterday, yesterday against Denami. He won like a five minute all in, a base and a half all in push on Ghost River. But other than that, he tried to play two max, slightly weird macro games. They were Banshee's things in involved. Did you see five and a half base all in? Five and a half minute base and a half oh, all okay. in. Oh my God. Okay, sorry. I, <laughs> I was like, I was sitting here and I was about to go on this like massive rant about, you know, Beomov, at what point is it no longer an all in? Okay, five and a half minute all in makes a lot more sense. Yeah, sorry, yeah. continue. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so he, he plays these macro games, right? With Banshee and it's a little weird, right? Yeah. Your Banshee openers are not the most standard thing in this matchup. And he just dies. Like, uh, Nanami out macros him in the macro game. Like, granted, again, the Banshees didn't get a lot done, and we can talk about that. But to me, as much as anything, it looked like Oliveira feels uncertain in the matchup. You know, you, you go for an all in <laughs> round one or map one, it works. And then you do something off the beaten path time and time again, because generally, either you don't respect your opponent, but you're in round four and you just lost to him, or it's because maybe you're feeling a little bit uncertain with kind of just a really standard game. Yeah, and that's going to be a little bit tough. I, I know that Oliveira has definitely had some pretty okay, like, TVP in the past, but I guess it's not necessarily the matchup I think of him for. Even though it's kind of funny, I, I know that that's kind of the matchup that he probably plays. Not necessarily the most, but pretty close to the most, I feel like, in the Asia region. I feel like a lot of the other Asia region players are actually just Protoss players. Like, a you know, <laughs> defeating a very strange Protoss player, like a Haas or a Nice, but then also facing off, it's like Cyan and Jayshi, and it's just, there are Protoss everywhere. So it's kind of funny, but I know that Oliver has good enough TVP, it's kind of unfortunate if he is struggling a little bit more right now, though. Yeah, well, you talk about you, you want you want some numbers to go with that. Of the five players that have qualified into the playoffs right now, four of them are Protoss. So <laughs> there are plentiful, plentiful opportunities there. Of course, the other one is Coffee, who has been this also this kind of tearing up and comer for a while. He played a really good matchup two seasons ago against uh, against Oliveira that made us say, hey, this, this guy might have something. This guy might yeah. have some opportunity. But before this game gets, we, you know, as we talk about the macro game a little bit, I, I want to talk about the macro game that SCV is playing. He's opening Stargate, which is something that is really not popular in the region, right? He's gotten Phoenix first. He's going to go Phoenix into Colossus here. But generally, we're seeing a lot of Protoss players maybe open charge, generally open blink in the Asia region, go for just very heavy mass expand builds. But SCV kind of playing his cards a little bit more close to the, close to the chest here in game number one. Yeah, I think you kind of alluded to this also, just the Phoenix Colossus style being very, very common to do if you're going for this kind of setup and everything. And I think this has been relatively popular still, I would say, like outside of Asia at least. And it can do very, very well against these kind of Widowmine drops as long as you're on points, you're in position. But this is, this is a fascinating decision. Is he <laughs> trying to do this like ultimate bait play where he burrows the widow mines then uses the medevac to try and bait the phoenix to chase him and then kills the phoenix with him absolutely i mean he saw the phoenix early on the first phoenix from his scv ran onto the other side of the map and tried to make something happen so yeah i love this Oliveira's is boosting he's like come on dude let's go chase me down let's do this thing and oh scv is falling right into the i don't know if he's gonna fall into the trap he may see the widow mines in time and respond oh, oh nope nope no, never mind oh my god that was so sick I, you know, I really thought with the changes they made to Widow Mine, so you have the tracers on top of it, the, the your, 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 your units are under attack notification. I really thought that there was no way that that was going to work. But instead... Here's the thing. Like, you have to remember, Phoenix move quickly. It's almost like the faster you move, the faster you run straight into the Widow Mines. And it's kind of like you have less reaction time in a weird way. The, the Widow Mine still takes just as long to lock on. But you're so deep into the Widow Mine's target range by the time you actually notice 
I think it's it's actually a little bit scary and hard to even try to react and pull away in time. I, I mean, at the end of the day, it means that three Phoenix are dead, one takes a ton of damage, and that actually takes a lot of power out of this army. As a Protoss player, you're playing Phoenix Colossus, your entire job is to pretty much not lose a unit in the early game, right? Because every unit, ev everything you're building is tech. You don't have a lot of gateways. In fact, I think, what are we looking at right now? Yeah, it's two gates. It's a two gate expand out of SPV. Every single unit you're making is so important to defend against the early aggression coming out of the Terran player. So losing three Phoenix like that, you lose so much tempo on the map. But luckily for SCV here, while well, Oliveira, he's going to have Stimwell time. It's going to be done right around like that seven minute mark or so, 730. He went for a very quick third base. So yes, you know, theoretically, he's going to try to get a little bit aggressive on the map. He's got this eight Marine drop on the right side. But at the very least for SCV, the fact that he has less Phoenix isn't really gonna hurt him as much because again Oliveira playing a little bit more greedy yeah he is gonna have a little bit less aggression in the sense that he's not gonna be facing off against like an eight racks like immediately barreling down his throat or something right now but uh there is still gonna be like you said a little bit of that aggression and you can see he's got another couple of medevacs set up to move along the south side so I do like the setup here for Oliveira to kind of exploit what you were talking about. There is a replenishing of the Phoenix and it's actually going to be able to potentially catch one of these medevacs, but it looks like it will unload safely. SCV not entirely noticing in time to actually jump in and punish that super quickly. But that means that the double medevacs on the south side of the map are going to have an opportunity. And there's a third Colossus, or sorry, second Colossus is now popping on out. There is a very real chance that Oliveira could jump in on that army. There is. I mean, this army's all over the place, right? We got the drop on the left side. Benefits of the plus one pylon range actually just really coming to the fore here. Uh, I'm joking, but also like that the pylons there are really well placed. So SCV is aware that, yeah, there's an attack through the middle, cancels that pylon as well. He knows where all the armies are. He knows where the drops on the left side. He knows the army in the middle. That means he can consolidate things because again, he knows everything is now getting ready to collapse on the third base, but double shut down the Colossus right now. And this is just a surround from Oliveira. What's she gonna do? Shield battery overcharge is nice. One Colossus is dead. Immortal's gonna fall down. Phoenix, we're just not positioned somehow. But now the Colossus is here. And despite this feeling pretty rough and a Colossus falling down, the first defense from SCV is not all that bad. Despite again, the Phoenix being out of position, the Colossus getting shut down. It pretty much was a single Colossus that died. I, I, well, I guess an Immortal died too. Given how that started for Oliveira, that was a solid defense from SCV. Yeah, I think it seemed like Oliveira maybe felt like he had the DPS to actually go through the shield battery overcharge, but not just killing the shield battery. It seems like it really ended up backfiring over there. And you can see over here that the Colossus are still staying alive. The Phoenix are also tanking shots from those Vikings. A lot of Zealots and stuff go down, but at the end of the day, SCV is probably happy losing those units if he's going to lose anything. Obviously, having the fourth base delayed and canceled and everything over there is going to suck a little bit for SCV. I think it's maybe where some of the supply dip is for him but he's been able to keep alive a lot of his tech units he killed off so much of the kind of army value there for Oliveira. i think scv is going to be feeling pretty decent about how this went so far yeah i mean it's wild though i've been tracking just how aggressively we see these korea or not a korean these these asian uh protoss players expand we saw it yesterday with nanami and firefly and everyone's boy <laughs> they take one good fight and they take like five bases and it's really really cool Oliveira is the one doing that in this game is the phoenix will fall his fourth base is ahead of the Protoss player. The, the, this aggression that he's going for, while, you know, somewhat committed, he d did commit the Raven to it, did all of that. He had a fourth base on the way behind this. Like, you don't see Terran players get this economically aggressive in PvT. It just feels too hard to defend. It, it really just seems more that the Terran players just say, look, we got mules. We're going to get aggressive off this. We're going to then eventually expand. But SCV, he's behind the Terran in economy in a 10 minute game where there's really only been one big interaction. That's really not, despite how everything has gone, that's really not where the pro player wants to be. Yeah, I think that's going to definitely be the biggest problem for him. And the fact that Oliver is still also getting up, he managed to do these transitions, everything into ghosts. He got up his Viking count during the kind of hiatus where both players had backed off from each other. I think that is going to be very, very difficult for SCV to actually deal with. So the ghosts are going to be able to easily deal with just a small number of Archons that are on the map. The Viking count is more than healthy enough to actually deal with just three Colossus. Transition Disruptors is nice as there isn't really going to be any like Liberators or anything out on the map. But I think for the numbers, plus 
some just good micro from Oliver should easily be able to handle one or two disruptors. Yeah, and I love this as well. You're like, ah, yeah, we're going to go liberators because there were, we're going to go disruptors. There are no liberators on the map. You know, as you say that, the first two set, this first two liberators enter the production queue and, and really go from there. But I am more worried about this fight right here. The 10 Vikings are just going to shut these Colossus down. No anti air. Archons are going to try to sit underneath, but I mean, there are ghosts, Ruffy. That's not going to work out. And Oliveira, I shaky as he looked yesterday and he would truly did look shaky actually against lemon as well this game he is running he's running stv right on over there this looks from beginning to end like there was no shot for stv to take this game so game one goes to our defending champion Oliveira. he's up one really really well done there by Oliveira. i mean two standout plays in the earlier stages for me uh obviously the very very flashy widow mine phoenix bait which i think was just super duper well done i haven't actually seen anyone try that with like a triple widow mine drop before Not a while, it was yeah. really really cool to see the second thing also is just the follow-up aggression of having the first medevac moving forward the second medevac or the second two third and four second and third medevacs moving along the south side of the map and then also just that Raven with a small number of bio units moving through the center. All three of them hitting around the same time. And yes, they all pretty much got spotted by really nice spotting from the Phoenix. You also had some prox or like pylons that were spotting on the south side. And I think he had an adept at the ramp that spotted the army through the center. So SCV did a good job of spotting all the kinds of waves of aggression or all the different angles of it. But just really nice setup there from Oliveira. Because even though, and you were pointing this out, even though Oliveira didn't massively make some big damage happen there with like a big army fight that ended up going swinging in his favor we kind of saw it didn't actually go that well he killed the fourth base he canceled the fourth base and he shut down a lot of the vision there he like kept the phoenix at home so they weren't doing any counter damage he was able to basically secure that economic advantage through that kind of setup for the aggression and scv really like he had to escape that kind of completely unscathed and losing the fourth base was kind of rough yeah it really was and it's kind of funny as well we generally when you talk about phoenix colossus you want a bunch of vikings well depending on the, if you're beyond you want no vikings because you're beyond and you think you can beat anything with with bio but in general you want a bunch of vikings because the vikings deal have to deal with the phoenix soaking shots and the colossus as well and i love that Oliveira didn't get too egotistical uh, egotistical about it like sometimes you'll see a terran player they, they won't build enough vikings or they'll <laughs> try to do it off one star port and then they get absolutely run over by the first colossus attack it's like okay well you know anti-air is probably good here olivera slapped the second star port down he played greedy behind it he really he crossed his eyes he dotted his t's he didn't go for some weird banshee something he just said no i'm gonna play the most standard actually that's not even standard because he played so greedily but I'm going to play the most economical macro game I can. And I just don't think SCV can keep up. And, you know, Ravi, in game one, at the very least, he was right. Yeah, we're going to get ready to move into game number two and see if uh, our Protoss player can turn things around or if our reigning world champion will uh, continue on forward with a 2-0 into the playoffs. And in the bottom left, he's playing for Mr. Gaming, looking to take us to game three to showcase just exactly what he can do. It's SCV. And up here in the top left-hand side of the map, we have, representing DKZ Gaming, our Red Terran player, Oliveira. And he's sitting at that comfortable 1-0 lead, and yeah, this is final round. This is also the nice thing about today. I mean, it's not nice to the players, but it's nice for us. It's really simple. Any players who win today are advancing to the playoffs. Any players who lose today are knocked out of the tournament. It's there's no more group stage finessing and saying, oh, well, this player if earned themselves one victory, which is gonna put them closer to advancing, or like this player lost, but they're not out of it. Just no, it's just it's just really simple. If you win, you move forward. If you lose, you're dead. You know, today really is the best part of the Swiss. Like Swiss stage is cool, right? Because winners play each other. You, you get theoretically more parity in each round, especially as the rounds go on. But yeah everything's on the line here you win you move on you lose you go home it is truly my favorite day of the swiss stage and you know and that the fact that we got 12 best of threes here we just get so much starcraft we get to start a force with this storyline like scv has been playing well Oliveira has mm -hmm. not been playing up to snuff and there were questions going into today about would this be the first playoffs in a long long time where Oliveira 
time as he was known back in the day it is not in the playoffs well you know Ravi as much as that would be a really cool story and I, it's hard to root against Oliveira right he's just got such a good story but if you're looking for something different the way Oliveira played game one is telling you it's like yeah you know I, I messed around I tried some things but when you know when pedal goes to, when tire goes to rubber or whatever the idiom is because I'm you know, not a smart man whatever the idiom is he's there and he's ready to go and he can turn it on when needs be now he is absolutely able to turn it on like you said we saw a really good showing casing of what he's capable of in that first game second game he is uh going to be still going for that kind of barracks uh command center factory setup so kind of like that very very typical kind of setup for a uh, terran player he's going to be opening up with the cycle in this game not like immediately adding on a reactor not going for the kind of same widow mines drop style so scv is also going to be mixing things up so it's a it's a mix up on both sides neither one of these players are playing the same thing as last game which i don't mind at all no but i gotta say though i'm a bit surprised to see it be a twilight opener on this map in particular antheon there's no good access point to the main base for blink stalkers and uh, you can like do a double blink past the mineral wall and then up and it's not great it can be mm -hmm. very easily punished and there's also a bunch of effective dead air space right is this the is going to go in try to get the well the 50 percent mule is gonna knock that down but cyclone will kill in, in response not not really worth it as a trade so there's not a really a lot of good access points for blink stalkers eh, not really and on top of that because of those walls in the middle it's effectively a map with a ton of data space so that makes it very droppable from a terran we might see Oliveira. well in this case we're seeing Wid widowmine drop on the way adding an additional barracks just again getting that six ish minute stim timing maybe uh, going maybe going for something a little bit later but point being there's a lot of dead air space that uh, is really useful for a Terran player to drop through there's not a lot of space for blink stalkers to really get a lot done of all the maps it really does surprise me that we see that we see a blink stalker opener on Amphion yeah I'm kind of with you there in the sense that I do like this map actually for Phoenix play because of all the things that you were talking about I think it helps deal with the dead air space and those medevacs and everything but I also don't mind it too much in the form of like a defensive blink soccer opening. And then it's not necessarily about trying to do the two or four gate aggression where you're blinking up into the main base and getting tons of damage done, but doing it a little bit defensively to deal with drops, which is the most unfortunate move out timing for these stalkers for the main base that were so perfectly situated to deal with the drop. And Oliver just waiting a few seconds is actually throwing off SCV's timing with these stalkers. Oh no, that's so unfortunate. I mean, in fairness, right, there is so much space behind the mineral line that, yeah, even if they were well positioned, they weren't going to hit it. Not until he actually dives in. And it looks like SCV just wants to shut down scouting. You know, knock this Reaper down. Unfortunately, though, Oliveira is very much on top of things. At the very least, you know, we talked about this. The drop hasn't gone in just yet. And SCV, he got his fourth and third base up well timed. And importantly here, we're not seeing a quick robo. I mean, or we have a robo, but we're not seeing a quick robo bay. This is going to be Blink Stalker. It's going to be charged. Thinking about blinking up onto that high ground and hey there we go there's a free cycle and so step one mm -hmm. this is what we talked about though ruffy right like you have the first blink and then you have to blink a second time and that just doesn't really feel all that good so for now he's gonna try to get as many marines as possible with a mind drop on the other side and scv is gonna pull in no oh, barely not barely in time two probes go down but man ruffy that could have been so much worse yeah i think the stalkers are still fighting versus the marines they've killed off a majority of the marines while the widow mine drop was going on so yeah maybe three workers go down to the widow mines but absolutely phenomenal damage with those blink stalkers i would say to the bio force i think if we take a look at the resources lost they have 13 marines that have died for one stalker basically and i think an adept died earlier on yeah no that was one cyclone 13 marines and a widow mine all dying there for the cost of three probes and a stalker you take that as a Protoss player, you're very happy about that one. Now, the one thing I, I will say is that if you look at the Observer positioning from SCV, he, he's got an Observer in his main base. That doesn't really scout you all that much, uh, <laughs> especially when you could have an Observer a little bit further out, let you know that these drops are arriving. Reaper tries to dive in. Not going to get a lot done. This drop in the main base. Now there's three medevacs here. Widomine is going to try to burrow up as well. Mm. Stalkers have to blink away from this. Shot goes down. Widomine. Well, it's going to get something. Medevac falls here as well. Importantly, though, all this bio is going to shut down plus one. This plus one charge lot idea. This plus one colossus idea is this one of mine is going to get another. Oh, Ooh. God, that's a massive shot. And yeah, the first hit from STV was really nice. Oliveira not getting a ton done. Canceling plus one like this into this aggressive option out of STV or even just defensive option as Oliveira tries to move out across the map more. 
all of a sudden, Oliveira's he's widened his window to do damage. Yeah, things are looking a lot stronger for him, especially after having lost a bunch of those bio units earlier on to the stalker aggression. I think the CV actually had it was having a good start there, but being able to find the plus one weapons, being able to force all these stalkers back home, taking decent ish trades with like you were saying, the widow mine attack or even just some of the bio trades versus those early stalkers was not bad at all for Oliveira. And he's going to try and move around over here. If he could have shut down the fourth base right there, that would have been really massive because that's coming down on the bottom right hand side. It's nearly halfway done. There's not really anything that was defending it, but Oliveira is going to catch wind of the location of it a little bit too late to actually shut that down. I think that now SCV has had enough time to get warp ins to actually deal with that. Yeah, I really do like, by the way, that SCV is taking that fully linear fourth base, you know, not when we saw Protoss players play on this map yesterday, they were taking the more forward base because it's, you know, it's just it's a little closer to your third, right? So maybe a little bit easier to defend. But when we talk about playing against the Terran, right? It's all about how far is your base from their rally? And that bottom right base is just so far away from wherever the Terran wants to play. Theoretically, it's pretty good. Now, granted, it's also really far away from the Protoss player third base. So that can be a little bit difficult. When we talk about how much dead air space there is. Regardless, Oliveira, big army on the right side. SCV has to defend this. And what this is doing, as we see what Oliveira is getting set up for this, he's queuing up drops into the natural, into the third base. He's getting himself ready for these two attacks. And those Widow Mine shots, Ruby, to start here, those Widow Mines are massive. A uh, little bit of a Bioforce on his left hand side. Going to be able to find a Colossus potentially. Is there a shield battery for it to run back to? Doesn't look like it. Robo not going to be making anything more. This Colossus is also going to end up falling as the Viking is able to secure that final little bit of damage. A couple of the D ga uh, gateways gain D power. Robo also gets D power. I want to note this was a single Robo opening here. So no Colossus production. Going to be able to make use of that Thermal Lance finishing up. And now probes are starting to fall over here. Oliver is finding some pretty substantial damage at the end of this attack. Yeah, Oliveira set up the pins and then just knocked them right down. He knew how to play his opponent like a fiddle. Move on the right side. That position is so... That's actually really a, just a key mo, a key marker of a lot of these new maps. Your fourth base is so far away from your third. You're, you know, you talk about uh, post-youth. Your third base is so far away from your natural. It becomes very hard to defend. So SCV has to extend himself on the right side to make sure his fourth base doesn't go down. And in doing so, unless your army splits are really good, these counterattacks up the middle, these drops into the main base, they're so far away that they are really hard to rotate to properly. And Oliveira, knowing that, got himself set up perfectly for it. So now, Oliveira, he's got 1-1. One, one. There are no upgrades for SCV because the forge going down earlier. No Colossus in this army. The Winamine shots, again, they're oh. going to go massive here, despite the radius nerf. And at this point, Oliveira, he may not be able to run through this because, yeah, it's a decent amount of gateway units at the moment. He's up three upgrades, Ravi. He's got the Widow Mines. Ghosts are on the way. There's no fifth base on the way for SCV because, hey, you know, there's a Widow Mine right there. The world's Oliveira's oyster. The universe is Oliveira's oyster. SCV, I, I don't know what he's supposed to do right now. It's it's looking pretty rough. It really is. And there's just the fact that it's just gateway units right now. It's unupgraded gateway units with a single Colossus there. Shield Battery is not going to be able to heal through this kind of damage output. You see that Oliveira is just continuing to barrel on forward. Zell's trying to buy time, but they disappear very, very quickly. And so does the front line there for SCV. Oliveira takes the 2-0 and is going to finally advance on to the playoffs. Yeah, Oliveira was, was far enough ahead there where he could just all... He, he didn't have to, have to micro, really. He just A-moved and everything died. <laughs> Man, what a mines and then three upgrades uh, against a Protoss player. When Pretty good. units aren't that good anyways. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's, a, that's a rough way to lose a game, but really nice play from Oliveira, sniping down the tech, sniping down plus one, delaying Robo production, getting Colossus off to the side. He just played the map beautifully. Yeah, and I would say like really nicely done from Oliveira because it really did feel like he also, the entire series, he was in control or also at least like even at worst he felt like he was in an okay-ish spot and i think scv definitely had some nice moments there like he had a really nice moment with the blink stalker micro in that first game he actually had a pretty decent fight versus Oliveira. but at the end of the day every single time you look at the supplies or you look at where their tech was or their economies and everything oliver always seemed like he had a nice little comfortable padding for his lead and didn't really ever end up disappearing very much. So really, really nicely done. That's kind of the Oliveira that I 
I was expecting to see moving to this group stage. So it's good to see that right before the playoffs start. Yeah, it's like, you know, I think it's one of those things, right? Where you can go and you can mess around. You can try things out because yeah, why not? You know, it's the group stage. But at a certain point, you have to qualify to the playoffs. You know, at a, at a certain point, you do have to go and play the game that you can play and put some people on notice. And that's what Oliveira was able to do, right? Just stomp at the end of the day, finally just stomping his opponent, making his way through. And you know what? Look, if, if if you want to talk about maybe some uh some bright sides, some uh, silver linings here for Oliveira, he just showed us that he can dominate some Protoss players. And again, hmm. we're looking at four of the five, well, I guess four of the six players that have qualified thus far. Uh, they are Protoss players, and we're guaranteed at least one more. Firefly Haas is up next. It's a PvP. And if Oliveira can look that good against SCV, hey, it, that's a lot of Protoss players you can try to brutalize, right? No, absolutely. And I'll say it's like, it's not unusual for that many Protoss players, I think, to qualify from the Asia region. I think like last season it was like five out of eight or something. But uh, I think, yeah, Asia is just a good place, a good region to be good against Protoss with. That is that is very fair. Uh, well, another thing that we have to be good at, about or good at being good against maybe is good against a break because in four minutes, this transition makes no sense. But in four minutes, you'll be able to make some more sense of it. And we'll have a PvP. It's going to be Firefly. It's going to be Haas. Wear your passion. <laughs> Share your passion. Wherever. Whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ASL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everyone. There could not be a more dangerous opponent for either of the players, actually, as we take a look at what's going to happen. Round 5, Match 2 of Asia. It's Firefly, it's Haas, and you know what? Look, Ravi, pulled all cards on the table. I'm going to do my best to not be a little biased here because Firefly, I love him. I think he's awesome. He's a super exciting up-and-comer. But against Haas, the king of cheese, who's made it onto round five with some wild build, some builds that, you know, quite frankly, Ravi, yesterday, they shouldn't have worked, but they did anyways. Does Firefly have the game sense to handle that? That's always the question with Haas, right? Yeah, Haas doesn't play Protoss. Yeah, I think he can play Protoss sometimes, but a lot of the time he just kind of plays his own style. It's just its own category of StarCraft. So it's always fun to see how players deal with it. It's always hard to predict how Haas is going to be able to play. And I don't even just mean st like strategy-wise. I feel like even form-wise, it's oftentimes hard to predict because sometimes we actually see a really sick version of him. Sometimes it's a little bit less so. <laughs> Well, I don't know what we're going to see this time, but it is round five. All the cards on the table. You win, you move on. And for offside, it's Firefly. And up here in the top left-hand side of the map, our blue Protoss player, he is Haas. Now... I think it's worth mentioning that Haas has played like three different Protoss players already in this group stage. So Firefly across the last day sees, oh, I have to play versus Haas. This is the decider match to see whether I move on to the playoffs or not. Okay, let me go see what has Haas been doing in these PVPs so far? Because I think across all of the games, I think he has what? Eight different games of PVP from Haas that he can study between Nanami versus Cyan versus Nice, two of which Haas ended up losing as well to both Nice and Cyan. So I do think that is a really, really big benefit when you're facing off against Haas in this kind of format. I, I, when I think of Haas and I think the, uh, the kind of tournament formats he does best in, it's like the weekend tournaments, the tournament where you're just facing off against a series of opponents. Haas can kind of ambush this opponent and say, I'm going to face off against you. You know that I'm going to play weird, but you, you don't always know exactly what I'm going to do. I think it's where Haas does his absolute best work. He can still do very well in these kind of prepared formats, but I think it's a little bit harder for him. You know, by that same metric though, Ravi, uh, Firefly, or Firefly has played five individual maps against Protoss. He beat him 2-0, mm -hmm. or 2-1, excuse me. He lost to, uh, set it up actually. Um, but anyway, like he's played five maps as well. Ooh. And it's one of those things where Haas, you know, yeah, he's got some mad, and yeah, he lost to Lemon. Haas has got some madness to him, mm. absolutely. But on hmm. the flip side, is you if you talk about that, we're also in the scenario where Haas has had 24 hours to prep something that he thinks is going to work really well against what Firefly is going to do. But for now, Firefly is actually the one that gets to get aggressive here. Two more gateways going down, a Robo going down. Yeah, technically he's pantomiming a natural, but let's be real here. This is aggression. Well, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating because Firefly went for the one gate opening which made it look like he was just going to do the one gate expand kind of style of things. But because his like natural got blocked for so long and like the probe there, I don't know if this is just like a fake out or something, but he didn't start a gateway unit for such a long time. The first adept I think came out after the second or the, sorry, the third and fourth stalker had already started. So this is going to be really, really weird. A single adept makes its way across the map now, but with a, such a stalker heavy opening here from Haas, how on earth is Firefly supposed to deal with this outside of literally just, I guess I have a very, very fast Immortal, but that's also going to reveal the hand of what he's kind of doing and the fact that he hasn't expanded. So Haas is going to have a lot of time to react to this. This is going to get really, really weird. I, I'm very interested to see what Firefly's strategy is here. All right, so taking a look at things, right? So this is technically a 3K Robo out of Firefly. It's a weird yeah. one though. It's pretty late. That being said, Haas does have his natural on the way. So he, he does have, he spent 450 minerals on a Nexus. There's that. He spent money on a Twilight. He spent money on Blink. None of these things are really going to matter for the next minute or so. Like when, when Firefly actually wants to make something happen. And look at the bait here as well. Oh He's going to trap. Oh, this is beautiful. And with the sentry buff as well, all the shields go down. It's going to tickle it to death. Okay, it's dead. Maybe I'm giving the sentries a little bit more credit than they deserve. But I mean, look at this. And Haas... <laughs> 
I love the man, but I don't think these two gateways right now, that's not what he has to be doing. He has got to defend back at home because this immortal, these stalkers, these sentries, he cancels the Nexus. Yeah, the gateway is in the blink and sure on the map, that's, that's fun. He's got to deal with something a little bit closer to home, at least at the start here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all of this has really, really not gone very well to start off with. Another couple of these stalkers get force fielded off, and this is just an overwhelming number of units. The Immortal can also target fire down that shield battery alongside the stalkers, and I don't know what Haas is supposed to do over here. I don't think there's any numerical way for him to actually defend against that. He doesn't think so either. He taps out. Firefly taking that first game, and I really have to wonder, if Haas had moved forward if he hadn't been distracted by the adept i mean very understandably the adept moving across the map why wouldn't you focus fire that down but he didn't actually end up scouting out the natural again his even though he did the move out with the stalkers he never got across the map confirmed that there was no natural or anything there i think if you realize that you're either throwing down shield batteries in your natural to try and defend that or you cancel that earlier you're trying to get out more shield batteries that are in a safer spot or something like i think you you're there's a very very heavy reaction at that point from there from haas but just not getting that scouting information really really ends up backfiring there yeah just a wild game a weird game too right we saw haas he proxied gateways that was not the play and even he proxied those gateways, by the way, like after he saw the immortal on the map and after he saw his, his stalkers get, get gunned down. So I don't know, maybe this is like, ah, you know, maybe I survived long enough and then I got this really strong counter punch. I don't know. But most games, a three gate robo that's delayed by that much shouldn't work. You know, your opponent should have enough stuff. They should be all properly positioned to, because, you know, it, it's a weird timing. Generally, you should have enough stuff to defend by that point. But losing those two stalkers on the map, as you said, and then those force fields on the high grounds to gun down two more were really nice uses of some force fields. And all that together means mm -hmm. you get four stalkers for free in an early game like that when it is unit by unit so important. I mean, yeah, Firefly just shoves right through. But it's another day. It's another game. Uh, it's going to be Golden Aura map two. And technically, Revy, this is where I would start talking about how, wow, you know, Golden Aura is a really defensive map. How are these players? No, this is Firefly and Haas. We're going to find some sort of one weird, one weird, one base, two base, despite the fact that, again, this is a defensive map, not for these two. Yeah, and I want to know, like, that last game very much so was a kind of fake out build order there from Firefly. He was going for a one, what looked like a one gate expand, but he gets his robo up before he even starts up his first gateway unit, which is or it's just very, very strange kind of out there. So I think that was something we should not expect to see again from Firefly, unless he's going for, you know, a seventh level mind game against Haas, which is kind of crazy to even think about trying to do. But uh, yeah, I'm expecting we should see something different. But I also agree that we could very well be seeing still a, a strange kind of mind games and styles come out from both these players. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, right? We talked about how these players have 24 hours to prepare, right? Well, maybe a little less because, you know, the, the matchups had end at the end of the broadcast day and these players played 18 to 24 hours to prepare for their next matchup, right? That is time to study the large amount of, of PvP that both players have played. Looking historically, what they've done, Firefly plays a little bit more in, in Open Cup, so he Haas has that to go off of a little bit. And it, it's kind of funny, especially when you're dealing with a player as, as wild as, as Haas is. And, you know, Firefly... He's a little bit more standard. He loves loves the Zell. It's a little bit more standard. Sometimes when you have a ton of data to work from, that data can lie to you because you've done all this prep and you kind of you have so many thoughts twisting in your head that you missed out on the obvious thing. Don't know if that happened mm. here, but you know it is something that you can kind of you know you can run into. But for now, the thing we're going to run into is game two. Bottom right, he's up one here for offside gaming. In the red, it's Firefly. And up at the top left-hand side of the map, our blue Protoss player from Taiwan. He is Haas. One you know, I know that it's uh, Haas has not necessarily been in like what you would call the best of form. This year, I would even say like last year, but it would be pretty disappointing to me if Haas was not one of those players I was able to make it to the playoffs. I, I always feel like he's one of those players that pulls in a lot of attention. He pulls in a lot of like both lovers and haters, I think out there. 
and it's always it's always a delight to see him in the playoffs but it'll also be really nice if uh firefly can make it so it's i would just say it's unfortunate these two players are playing off in this final round to decide who's going to get to advance on who doesn't but and i know that there are a lot of Haas supporters out there who are hoping that Haas can make his grand return to that kind of playoff stage and make a deep run well you know look as the world's biggest firefly fan it actually was funny at, at atlanta alex uh alex 007 right the, the project manager came up to me he's like you know what because we got player cards from working the event and he has you he fans them out randomly and said hey you know pick one it's gonna be good but uh he told me afterwards because i drew the firefly card he's like look you know i, I knew you were really excited about him so i was gonna make sure you got one you, you got a firefly card like even if you didn't draw it <laughs> um because you know ravi i know you talk about haas he brings all these eyes and by the way we have to talk about firefly going single gate expand on the high ground taking a page out of max pax's book here but you know you talk about fire i bet haas drawing all these names fandom is not rational and i think firefly is the most exciting player we've got coming out of asia right now so all bias on the table here if firefly wins i yep i mean look how much damage that sentry does to shields i'm memeing a little bit it's fine um i'm not gonna be upset i i think firefly i'm really excited to see what type of damage he's gonna be able to do again assuming he wins this this series yeah, I know. I'm also definitely very excited to see what Firefly can make happen. And you're kind of pointing out that this is the one gate expand. Again, this two Haas might look very similar to the last game in terms of what this looked like it was going to be with a one gate expand. Except last game, there just was never an expand. Haas did not go for the body block on the Nexus and everything because he did go for a proxy pylon, which is going into a proxy Stargate. So Firefly is going to be dealing with the proxy Stargate. He has gone for a single gate Robo with a War Prism. And he, all he has is two sentries. I know that sentries don't have the light tag, so they won't die fast to the Oracle. But Beowulf, we're going to really truly see the test of how effective sentries are at dealing with the Oracle. Because Jose Phoenix has scouted at the proxy Stargate. He knows that this is coming. But literally all he has right now are the sentries. And I guess now he does actually have a shield battery at each base, which is going to actually be very, very crucial. Oh, look at this. Halluc oh, I love this. Hallucinated stalkers. Oracle's like not even going to try, right? He's like, ah, two stalkers, two sentries. There's <laughs> no way I get anything done. And Firefly, he's got a very quick warp prism. The cool thing about this is we're going to see a couple probes go down because unfortunately, uh, shield battery only in the main base, not in the natural. But the cool thing about this is I think this is just for two and oh, almost goes down. I think this is just for like, yeah, an adept or two warping into the main base from a weird angle. And this is such a weird timing. There's, there's no world where Haas expects this. He's gone for blink behind this. He's committed a lot to his to his economy, trying to make a comeback happen, a lot to his tech. There's nothing in the main base. These two adepts, they, they got a ton of damage potential here. This is going to be so annoying for Haas to deal with. And he does have a couple of stalkers that are already in his main base. and. He can quickly warp in some stalkers in the main base to try and body block those adepts. Does not quite manage to get the kill on one of those adepts, but three workers killed for free. I, I think Firefly is going to still be very happy about that. He has to be careful as he is going to move back in. I don't hate this right now because we can see on the actual production tab, Blink is not finished up just yet, but Blink is getting very, very close to finishing and he is going to end up losing looks like one of the adepts. And dragon on the flip side though I, I look at this and like this is why i'm excited about firefly he's just it's small thing he hallucinates mm -hmm. stalkers to ward away the first oracle because yeah, with how much unironically with how much damage the new the new century cannon the new century beam does against shields and two stalkers i mean the century where the oracle would not survive that so hallucinates a couple stalkers to make sure he doesn't take any oracle damage he gets a really quick warp prism puts the depths in the main base plays around with shield with with hallucinations to bounce your way out to try to mi optimize their lifetime and their damage gets eight probes and these are small things absolutely but you put it together this oracle is going to go down as well these are small things but you put them all together and it turns out to a, it turns into a player that you can tell like really understands the game of starcraft and really thinks deeply about how they can go optimize their gameplay to properly respond to whatever their opponent's doing and to me when you see a player that is just kind of so obviously cerebral about how they play that's kind of, that's a rarity sometimes and it's really exciting to see where he's gonna grow no I'm 100% with you and I feel like Firefly has definitely demonstrated that he is 
really just kind of playing around Haas right now. He's kind of messing with him, and Haas has not really been able to deal with all this weirdness with the openings, all the little mind games and stuff. Haas is kind of getting out like Haas in a weird way. I, I know that Firefly is not doing anything as strange as some of the stuff that Haas has done in the past, but he has definitely been, been thrown some curveballs, and Haas has not really been able to deal with it so far. Now we end up seeing this kind of like nice little move out timing where Blink is going to be finished up for Firefly and he's going to have the Immortal in the mix. He has more Stalkers and more Immortals and also a Warp Prism for this attack. The third base, how on earth is this actually supposed to stay up right now? I mean, you just got a wall here. The force fields, yeah, technically, technically Haas can Blink over them, but you not worth doing, right? Then you actually can't make anything happen. As a Zealot, I think it's going to something sniped down but anyways now moving into the naturals a little bit dicey charge is done right now stocks try to get on top of the immortals and one will fall but it doesn't matter i, I don't I actually don't think it does the immortals get enough damage on the third base is down stalkers starting to fall down even with overcharge there is far too much here and yeah the sentries are falling yeah zealots are really good against stalkers and immortals there's nothing here it's 43 army supply to 18. Fireflight is running rough shot over Haas in this game number two and as he blinks around, yeah, Zealots are trying to chase things down. The Stalkers die. That's the damage. Firefly, he's not into the playoffs. Really, really well done there by Firefly. I mean, you were actually talking about this earlier, Balemolf. So, I mean, credit to you on this. Firefly came really well prepared. He actually had a very, very solid game plan there that he showcased, you know, coming into the uh, this like series with a very specific set of uh, build orders and kind of plans and a whole mind game set up there of how game number one was the fake proc or the fake one gate expand but it ends up being this three gate robo all in it had like a little bit of weakness of the sense that he literally makes a single gateway unit of like an adept before he go and, and like this is after he's made his robo so like he's very light on gateway units but he did a great job of just buying himself time turn that into a W off of a really sick mind game there. And game number two, kind of like the opposite end of it, still goes for the one gate expand, but then doing that kind of robo adept drop that you're talking about, the eight workers killed absolutely massive. The identifying of the uh, Stargate location and still getting up the defenses and everything in time, the hallucinated stalkers, all of that really, really working out quite well. I mean, Firefly truly came to this series prepared today. Yeah, no, it's, you know, you talked about prep. Uh, Firefly had a very specific type of prep. A pre type of prep makes him a nightmare for players like you. Um, <laughs> apparently, actually, apparently he's just uh, Liam Neeson. But anyways, uh, we have one more series in Asia as we figure out who really our last player is. We have seven players and six Protoss players. Uh, or no, five Protoss players on in the playoffs. Now we get to determine whether it's going to be six and two, six Protoss, two Terrans, whether we get the rare Zerg and Mio Micah and the King of Hydras, the King <laughs> of SCA into the playoffs. I don't know. We're going to find out. But... We'll be back in four minutes. See y'all soon. You love it, you wear it, wear it. Wear your passion. <laughs> Share your passion. Wherever. Whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everyone. We got two series, and one was actually, I mean, both pretty quickly, but now we're looking into a PVZ, and Revy, actually, this one feels pretty short, too, just because it's Mio Micah and Cyan. He's a macro pro last player, but Mio Micah, if you want to look at one thing he's going to do, it's going to involve two bases. Gonna involve a lot of hydras, very quick lair, maybe some lings, maybe some roaches, but uh, lots of aggression and lots of hydras. Mew Mika is certainly a a monster in a, of his own right. He is, I think, sometimes been compared to being like a Zerg version of Haas, which is fun because he's in the region with Haas, and he truly can bust out some absolutely ludicrous looking aggression uh like you were kind of hinting at i think it's going to be very very fun to see how cyan is able to handle that i think cyan should be familiar with how mia micah plays even though i was sort of surprised to see just because i know that uh mia micah used to play in kind of the oceana region which was separate from like china and taiwan originally like years ago so i understand that they weren't exactly competing in the same regions for a long time but I was surprised the last time and pretty much the only times that they played were like 2017. So they really haven't played very much lately. But I know that surely at this point, both these players are going to be familiar with each other. Both these players are going to be familiar with each other's reputations. So it should be a fun one. Yeah, absolutely. But for now, it's not a rap game of reputations anymore. It's a game of action. And on the bottom left, upper left, in the blue on Oceanborn, it's Cyan. And down here in the bottom right-hand side of the map, we have the red Zerg player. He is Mio Micah from Team Gosu. And Ravi, so mm. we've had two series thus far today, right? We've had Oliveira, we've had uh, Oliveira qualify, we've had Firefly qualify over SCV and, and, and Haas respectively. And I would argue that the two favors, the two players that we expect to advance, they did what they expected. They 2 0 They're on in the playoffs. This really is everything kind of is going as, as we expected to go here in round five. So if we're going to continue that trend, right, of the favorite 2 0 maybe to maybe getting a 2-1, but advancing on to the playoffs as, as expected, who's the favorite in this series? I think that this is probably the closest in terms of before the match, who's supposed to be the favorite of like the three series we've had so far today. I would actually say, and I say this as a big Mio Micah fan, I think Cyan is the kind of favorite coming into this. Just on paper, if you're just looking at these two players and what they should normally be able to accomplish based on like previous seasons and stuff and current form and everything, I think that I would probably give a little bit of favoritism to Cyan. That being said, I think that Mio Micah, especially versus like some Protoss players, can bust out some ludicrous looking, silly, silly aggression. And I think that he still has a very, very solid shot at defeating Cyan in this. I, I don't think that by any stretch of the imagination, this is a match where I'm looking at it and saying, oh man, gonna be a really, really tough match for Mio Micah to make something happen here because he is truly going up against someone so much stronger than him. No, no, not that out of case at all. I, I really think this could go either way. Yeah, it's pretty funny because I'm kind of in the same boat. I'm like, eh, 60, 40 Cyan maybe, 65, 35. Yeah. Then you pull it up on Aligulac, and Aligulac says, ah, yeah, 90-10. Mio Micah's got, but, like, no shot here. So, it is again, interesting. Again, this goes back to what I was saying, though. Like, yeah. they have not played tournament matches since 2017. They played 
six matches in 27 or i think six or seven matches in 2017 of which cyan won most of them and then also 2016 they played like a single series but meal micah did not start getting meal micah good until around like 2019 2020 yeah he had that one katavitsa run right where he almost took down Estrella, looked really good convinced lambo briefly that hydras were okay uh up until <laughs> lambo started playing with hydras and realized eh, maybe not but um didn't convince lambo briefly that hydras were okay which is you want to talk about the annals of starcraft winning a world championship winning multiple world championships in fact winning gamers without winning gamers eight all of those are really uh impressive results you know errol and rogue and uh, Oliveira doing that doing that over and over again but convincing lambo that hydras aren't horrible units that's probably the most impressive thing you can do in starcraft <laughs> that's pretty high up there i think uh really quick note this has just been something we've been seeing more of lately i feel like at first for a little while i was seeing protoss players opening up with these void rays instead of the oracle first and i was thinking oh you know these Protoss players are kind of playing it out safe. I really like that decision against like, you know, more aggressive players like Amiya Micah. But I've been seeing so many Protoss players open up Void Ray first lately that I really think is just, it's not even necessarily that it's coming back as, oh, I'm trying to play safe against my opponent. It's, I think this is just something that Protoss players are realizing is still good again. Yeah, pretty much it works out that if you're able to go and snipe down two Overlords, it's worth it. So now I love this adapt Oracle thing as well. We see Hero do this quite a bit where you dive in and you have, um, Killing the extractor is not really going to do anything right there. But um, you dive in with the Adepts and the Oracles, and generally these defenses are so predicated upon just having a couple queens where they need to be that you can get a lot of damage. So seven drone or seven drones go down with the first Oracle with the first couple of Adepts there. That's a lot of damage. Now, granted, Adepts did go down, and that does mean that uh, Cyan has to be a little bit careful about his third base. Lings are going to get on top of that. Ooh, and this okay. is... This is really brutal, actually, right now. I feel like to Emil Micah, he not only lost a lot more workers than I think he was expecting to there, he also lost two overlords out of the map and was stuck at 52 supply for such a long time. The only reason why it ended up kind of being okay is because he lost seven or eight workers, which freed up the supply for the overlords that got started so late. Uh, I mean, this is this is definitely not the start that Mio Micah was looking for. I know Mio Micah can do some hyper aggressive things and his supply can be a little bit further down below because he's doing some big teching or something for some crazy play. But this is certainly not the kind of start he was looking for. Dude, look at the production tab right now. I'm looking at this like, okay, clearly it's it's Ling Hydra. 1-1 one, one is a... These days traps are weird. Uh, I, I, <laughs> okay, they get a couple gas drones. Sure, <laughs> I I guess that was the plan. Uh, but we have, this is Ling's Swarm Host? Plus one melee, plus one range. There's a Nidus on the way. But I I don't think I've ever, I, I've seen Roach Swarm Host. I don't think I've ever seen Ling Swarm Host. It's also going to hit at such a weird time too, right? Because the Swarm Host is starting up now. The Nidus Storm is going to be finishing up. And by the time a Nidus Storm even pops up, it'll be like, 645 almost like seven minutes or something I, I think that there's gonna be the big gateway flood will have already finished up cyan will have like a couple of these you know air, sky toss units also to help deal with things if he sees this coming with the hallucinating phoenix scout as well he can try to position his units in uh in time but it does seem like that first size from is gonna go unnoticed for now i mean now now the oracle is gonna see the yeah there's a nidus right there but if you look at the composition we got out of cyan it's two immortals it's a void ray sure it's all these gateway units it, actually both oh. mortals go down that's a big deal but there's no splash in this army there's no charge there's no blink in this army it's a lot of stuff but it's low as this okay that that <laughs> that storm host shouldn't have been there but in general there's not a lot of splash there's not something that really deals with these with these locusts all that well i, I do like the immortal drop but you got to be very careful with the queens here these lings will have plus one. If they were on, if they were in position, they could have gotten on top of them. But as it stands, it's just a little, it's a very disjointed fight. Even still now, lings are going to get on top of these immortals. They're going to get saved. Sure, fine. But queens are zoning. We, I would have expected to see some creep. That's not really going to be the case. <laughs> At the end of the day, I guess. The lings, despite having plus one, swarm host on, this is like the third dead swarm host. This just is not really working out for Mio in the way he would like it to work out. Yeah, but I think at the end of the day, this is what we were talking or I was talking about before. 
Cyan actually just has enough gateway units and enough of a large enough or a large enough army to just take on the Swarmos Locust Wave. It's not what you're supposed to do normally. You need some kind of splash damage or you need to try and, you know, pull back the shield batteries and heal up your units. It, I think it, he didn't even really need it, weirdly enough, because this comes so late on. This hit at like seven minutes or something. And now he's taking out one of the Night of Swarms. There's no additional Night of Swarm coming on up. But Mio Mike is working off of such a terrible economy. He needs to get something done. He has to get something done right here. Yeah, and it's weird too. Like, I think that army, I think that absolutely could have worked if the army was together. But the Lings were on one side of the map and Queens yeah. were slow to respond and like three Swarm hosts just got caught off on their lonesome and died before maybe they got one wave out, but that was about it. So generally when you're playing the style, the Swarm hosts aren't supposed to die. You're supposed to just find value with them time and time and time again. And because that's not happening, it's a really rough game for me and Mike. Now he does have one, one, two twos on the way. These Lings are going to be pretty feisty and the Zealots as they warp in, not getting a lot done. But this twos collide, it's not at all in because there is a fourth base attempted, right? It's on 69 workers. But this two Colossus timing that Mio Mike, that Cyan has to work with, it handles the Locust pretty nicely. There's not a lot there to defend. So yeah, these Lings on the other side are trying to be annoying. There's not a lot there. Now Stalkers are going to get on top. I, I think Mio Mike is just dead. It's going to be very, very difficult for him to defend. The supplies are a bit misleading here. And I think if Mio Mike knows it, Cyan takes the first game. And yeah, just a really, really kind of rough start there for Mio Mike in terms of how many drones he lost the oracles and everything there just even the supply block was really really rough but uh i don't know if it was just he had to adapt to kind of already tough situation and so he went for this kind of like nidus ling swarm host play but it still hits so so late and then even with the swarm host locust wave i was kind of surprised he attacked in and maybe he got distracted because he's trying to pull the Swarmos back in. He's a little bit disjointed like you were talking about with the Lings. But then the Locusts were also just like attacking the gateways and kind of barely attacking some of the gateway units that were there. But there was just enough of the gateways finishing up. He could take on the Locust Wave. It just nothing about that attack seemed to be going well there for, uh, for Mio Mike, unfortunately. Yeah, I, it was weird, right? Because I think the idea for Mio Mike there is everyone knows he's going to go Hydras, right? That's the play. Mm -hmm. And if you go like a Swarmos Nidus type of idea, maybe that's somewhat counter to the counter. But even then, Locusts are light units, right? The, the, the units that kill Hydras for the most part are kind of the units that kill Locusts as well. So I, I don't know if that really makes a lot of sense. I feel like if your opponent's expecting Hydra Ling, you hit him with a Road Trapager timing. Like that, that's kind of the, the one versus the other type of setup. Going for the Swarmos Nidus thing, I, I think you're... You're doing something different, so maybe there are mind games there, but the response is pretty similar, right? Yeah, that's that's a tough one because I know that like actually, Star I I don't dislike, for example, Stargate opening and stuff when there is the Swarmhost Nidus play, like a normal Swarmhost Nidus play, just because you kind of saw even a little bit of how having the Void Ray or unfortunately the Oracles died actually quite early on to that whole Nidus Swarms of. Uh, like play but if you have the oracles there to also spot things out not only can they help whittle away at nidus when they're getting built but you just can spread out those uh air like sky toss units to shut down the nidus Storms nice and early on if the nidus Storms have a hard time getting up then after like two or three get shut down the protoss just player just has way too much stuff and you kind of steamroll over everything so yeah. i think in that sense i i don't hate the stargate opening there versus a nidus Storm play whereas I think sometimes it can maybe struggle a little bit versus the like Hydra Ling play, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's just a tough one. I, I wonder how much of that really was just me Micah saying I really like I'm playing into the whole idea that people think of me as making a lot of Hydras, or if he was just trying something kind of different out there. But either way, I I will say I kind of don't want to see that build again for me Micah. <laughs> no, and it's kind of funny to look at things as well. Uh, me Micah kind of ran into similar issues um, yesterday playing in Asia as well, where he went and like game one, like he looked okay. He had a standard build where he had a build that he was happy with. Um, maybe I'm thinking of someone else. Anyway, uh, no, I think I'm, I'm thinking of someone else. There was a build that I saw yesterday. That was like game one was what you expect. And then game two was just very freestyled and didn't make a lot of sense. That was, we cast 12 best of threes yesterday with someone else. That being said, Cyan is now up one zero 
in this matchup, trying to move on to the playoffs. Again, Cyan is a former champion of the region. Cyan is very much the favorite as we expect here, but Mia Micah, I mean, post use the big map. Curious how uh, Hydras are going to work out, but for now, it's game two. And they have a right in the red. He's down a game in this series, but who knows? Maybe the Hydras will win out in game number two. It's Mio Mica. And down here on the bottom left-hand side of the map, we have our blue Protoss player. He is Cyan. And I, I do want to actually say, like, I know Mio Mica is memed about for, like, Hydras and stuff. But I will say, he is a man of culture. He is a man of many different all-ins, including Ling Bane all-ins, proxy hatches, all sorts of stuff. So I would, uh, I think that he definitely can do like a lot of those Hydra all-ins and he's strong with them. But man, Mio Mike can bust out some much weirder stuff than Hydra all-ins, I think. I, I do appreciate, by the way, Ravi, that the man who at times has had the clan tag of something to do with DTs, I'm forgetting exactly what it was, uh, who the man who, you know, builds bots to cannon rush, considers uh mio mica a man of culture um ravi personally if i'm a member of the starcraft community uh that is not a culture i choose to engage with so uh <laughs> you're all on your own here bud <laughs> oh man you're missing out if you haven't seen some of mio mica's like truly truly out there weird stuff then i feel like you're you're missing out on some beautiful starcraft i mean it's not the kind of starcraft that you know uh a Serral or a Rainer or something would look at it and be like, man, what a beautiful Mona Lisa. It's kind of like Picasso during his time where nobody really appreciates it when he's there and alive at the time. Like people look at it and are disgusted. It's like, why? What is this like surrealist form of art that is making absolutely no sense? But later on, later on, you look back on it and you're like, you know what? That was actually a pretty beautiful build. It was beautiful how nonsensical some of that stuff was, but actually, it still worked. Ravi, you want to you know some deep lore about, or just, I guess, if chat wants to know some deep lore about, about you and I, we played a we played a big brain bout, best of five, like a year ago at this point. And I reached out to Mio Mike and I said, hey, Mio, give me your Hydra all-ins. I want to smash Ravi with it. And I <laughs> didn't get, and I practiced all the builds and I, you know, got really familiar with it. And then you never let me play it because your proxies hit faster. So, you know, maybe that's why I'm, maybe that's why I'm bitter and upset. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had the yeah. plans, Ravi. Uh, much like Cyan Ooh. has a Glaive Adept plans in this game number two against, this is, by the way, this is the classic Neo build, right? Things gonna be, speed's gonna be about done. Very quick layer. This is again, kind of looking at the Hydra build, but you never know until the Hydra den drops. Yeah, gold base also coming up because this is post youth and adept is going to move forward. It's going to see the timing of this lair, which is very, very nice because seeing a lair this early on is a pretty, pretty substantial scout. Uh, two, three drones maybe going down. No, it doesn't get the third drone. Nice little save there with the second support crawler. Does want to cancel those at some point. I'm a little concerned that he's letting those finish because it's not just the loss of the drone. It's oh. All right, we have one spore finish. Can we have two? Is oh okay. You know what? I guess Mio Mica just doesn't necessarily know if this is gonna be a Stargate. Has he not? Hmm. He had so he had vision of the Cybercore, but I don't know if he saw. He when... saw the Twilight Council. Like he he had vision of the Twilight Council. Oh, so he did. Yeah, I don't know. really interesting decision. To, maybe he thinks that this is going to be DTs. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's like, okay, this this might be DT. There might be a DT follow up to this. Yeah, I would be a little early getting spores. Generally, a counter DT spores go down to like four minutes, not three thirty. But like, it's close enough, and I've already built the spore. So instead of canceling, wasting some money going back, I'm just going to go and make it happen. Now, a lot of adepts here are scary, but links are going to find their way out of the other side, and this third base is going to force a warp in back at home, maybe get a cancel, kill off some probes. And despite there being an adept warping in, I mean, who cares? It's a single adept. The lings are going to get this round right there. That being said, adepts on top of hydras are beautiful for the adepts here. With no roach warren, they're going to knock down every single one of these hydras. And as this is a, I mean, can we call this a two base all in? He has the third base. He's got the gold. So this is, there's more money here than you might otherwise expect for a Mio Mica all in. Even still, that's a lot of dead hydras. But Ravi, actually, I guess it's only four. 
that's a lot of dead probes too. Ten probes going down here. Mm -hmm. No, he absolutely needed to get this damage done as well because losing a bunch of the hydras and stuff, yes, like that obviously is going to hurt because he was going for this kind of aggressive attack. But Mio Micah, in a weird way, like he also just didn't really have too strong of a transition. Like he really was just going for this kind of big attack. And well, he, he needs to get something done with this. He needed to. He's only at even workers right now. He's still looking for some more damage. Sentry is going to be available over here for Guardian Shield eventually, but it doesn't quite have the energy for it. He helps out so much versus some of these Hydra attacks. But is there just an overwhelming number of forces over here? Shield battery is not really in the main base, so this is going to be a little bit scary, especially if he wants to try and defend that third base eventually. Man, this is a beautiful pile on a knockdown as well. Yes, only two. It's going to depower two of the gateways. Yeah, there's a third one that has a pile on right there, but much less production. That means this third base probably should go down. And it's wild how effective. I don't know if this is going to work out now or not. I mean, it's still a lot of charge, lots of entries as well. But actually, you know, the Zealots, they got to run around the weird sides. A bit of an awkward micro situation there. And the four sentries, uh... unfortunately for Cyan, Hydras don't have shields. The sentries don't really do all that much damage. And. It's wild because this is a counter build from Cyan. Glaive Adepts into charge plus one charge slot. That is designed to deal with this early timing. And despite that, because you have effectively a, a base and a half worth of gold minerals with the natural and the other base that Mia Micah has taken, despite everything that Cyan's done to try to counter this, Cyan, Mia Micah is still looking great in this game. Yeah, remember that I wanted to say, remember that even if they have even worker counts, the gold base can change the math on this, but there's only one drum Never mind. Mind for this gold base. So Miyamaka has just been flooding out units. I think that Cyan maybe has a little bit of mystery thinking that maybe you're teching out, maybe you're getting up drones and stuff. No, Miyamaka has just been making non-stop additional lings and hydras. He has had no intention of droning up behind any of this. He's going to be knocking on the cyber course, so no more adept warpins in a moment's time. It's going to be just this charge lots, but uh, even with all the zealots gone, these hydras just pack way too much of a wallop right now. Yeah, you know, we talked about Mio Micah maybe being Picasso, but, uh, you know, in this game, I don't know, he's going, he's Van Gogh because he's certainly not stopping. Not with the hydras. <laughs> not in this game. And yeah, ties it up. Yeah, kind of an interesting opening there also from Cyan because he went for that sort of three or four gate adept opening. He put on that pressure. He was still finding some good damage with it in terms of how many hydras and stuff he killed he killed a couple of drones as well but Mio Micah was able to get a lot of worker damage on down on the other side of the map if the lings are at home I'll also note that that number of lings could have also very very quickly cleaned up all of those uh like adepts and Cyan I think would have also still been in a lot of trouble in that regard so I think Cyan it seemed like he just maybe didn't totally registered that he was going to be up against one of those hydra all ins despite like the layer timing and everything i mean you say so, that that's kind of interesting but glaive adepts into plus one charge lots like that feels like a counter uh, i mean getting colossus or something would be fantastic but if you're worried about the the upgrade list version which is what mio micah did this game charge lots gladeps plus one all are really solid answers to lings and hydras and all all, all of that I think it's just more that he lost out on two gateway production for a while. He is his first adept hit. It caught four hydras. I actually thought it was going to get more than that, but mm -hmm. he lost like six adepts for four hydras. Not really all that cost effective there. Yeah. And then it's also that Mio Micah, that forward base, I thought it was for the gold base mining. No, it's just for forward creep, right? It's for forward production. So the hydras, I'm not sure quite how he hot keyed things together, but if he's the majority of the hydras, I'm assuming were being built from that third base which means that your reinforcement lines, despite how long post-youth map post-youth is, because it's a long map, we're hitting maybe a little bit faster than they otherwise would. And all that together means to a, it leads to a very well set up two and a half base, two base all in with a third hatch. That Cyan, if you start to bleed units away, there's you're not going to hold it. I think that's exactly what I'm talking about, though, is if you know that there is going to be a big two base all or like a, two base with no actual saturation at the gold base all in coming your way would you try to trade out your adepts like that that early on i think like wouldn't you if you if you thought that that was going to be the case and you're still trying to defend a third base wouldn't you instead try to keep your adepts all alive so that you can like power up with a shield battery or something and or I will also say, like, just the fact that you're trying to defend the third base at all. If there's a two base all in, 
trying to defend that third uh, third base and fighting like away from your high ground, not having a shield batteries or anything up on the high ground as well, like a shield battery overcharge or something up there. If you know that you're just up against 36 workers on a Hydra all in, I feel like there's a lot of other decisions that Cyan could have made to make that a lot easier for him to defend, right? Yeah, I think it's also one of those things where there's a lot of logic to, I'm going to run in with six gla Glaive Adepts and I'm going to kill mm -hmm. off all the Hydras and that gives yeah. me 30 seconds. I'm going to slow your attack down. So maybe there's some logic there, but with how committed Mio Mike was that you know, sit on, what's it, 36 drones, 32 drones, something like that. Mm -hmm. That is by far the most committed version of this attack. And that means that you got to play it a little bit differently than the... Uh, we, we also see a double Evo 1-1 one, one version out of this from Mio sometimes. So he does have different ways to play. And, and maybe it's worth it to slow it down if you're going for the slightly more economic opening. But for now... We can talk all we want about that last game, game number one even, but uh, game three, one game. It's a best of one to determine who moves on to the playoffs and who has to be watching from the sidelines. In the upper right, he got seven drones in game number one, warded away all the weird attacks coming out of his opponent. Now tied up, it's Cyan. And down over here in the bottom left-hand side of the map, going for a pool first. He is our Red Zerg player. He is Mio Mica. Pool first. Uh, this is not going to be like a 12 or 13 pool or anything. This is like a 16 or 17 pool, it look like. So it's going to look to try and get something done, but no gas geysers being taken just yet or anything. He's circumventing the probe that was uh, scouting around so he's gonna try and still go for the hatchery a little bit later on without getting blocked so this is uh yeah Cyan's gonna have full scouting information of this though so he can try and get his proper wall this is just like a nice way to sort of minorly get in your opponent's head to sort of minorly kind of throw them off their normal game man i love this actually we saw me and micah do this against max Ed yesterday as well the whole yeah, you're going to block my natural, but I can just scoot around the edge of the base and I'm going to get my natural down roughly when I want it. I'm not going to have to go take the third base, which, <laughs> you know, on Crimson Court, that's that actually matters quite a bit. Your third base is very far away from your natural. And by the way, not only is it very far away, there's only one viable third base. So this is something that I'm actually a little surprised we don't see more committed uh, attempts to just block both bases from Protoss players because like, this is on other maps there are two viable third bases you can kind of put a drone each way and enforce the fact that you're not going to be able to go and you're not going to be able to block it not really on crimson i mean are you going to take the the rich gas base as your natural on crimson court that is so far away that it's so exposed but for now i mean lings are going to show up despite this being a full wall lings are going to get into the main base it's a full scout coming out of mia micah he knows this is going to be a twilight opener again you look at the stargate or the warp gate timing it's well timed so now Mio Micah knows that, yeah, there's only one gas. He knows that there's an adept, which actually doesn't really tell him all that much, but he knows it's single gas. He knows that it's a warp gate first. And this is pretty much everything he's got to know to know how to handle what Cyan is looking to throw at him in the early game. Yeah, another gateway being added on there for Cyan. And Mio Micah is just going to be adding on a couple more lings that he ended up losing there because, of course, he has zero lings out on the map right now. Overlord is going to make its way up to the little peeper cliff and does get to safety over there. So not going to be dealt with anytime soon. There's no sentries or anything that's uh, making their way on the map. Do you move out with the first two adepts here as a, a Cyan? Do you try and get some scouting information here? I think at this point, it's a little too late, right? Speed's going to be done in 20 seconds yeah. or so. Like there is a world where Mio, I, I don't know if Cyan, did Cyan see the gas timing from Mio? Yeah, he did. Okay, so you know you know what you know when speed's gonna okay. be roughly ready. Uh I was gonna say there's a world where with a quick pool like this, you go for like a four minute speed just because hey, that's that's kinda how that works. Sometimes you delay the gas. But as three thirty is generally when speed is done. You don't want to have a depth out on the map in, in small numbers before then because links will surround. This is not small numbers of adepts. This is six adepts on the map right now, shading across very quickly. And remember, Crimson Court's a pretty short map, so they're going to run across very quickly. But me and Micah, he saw it happening. Mm. So 14 links on the way. That should be enough to defend it. He's still going for the, these spore crawlers just in case something happens. That's already economic damage done. And these, these adepts, they find their way in before the links are ready. So this is actually primed. I don't know if it's going to really complete, but it's primed to get a decent amount of damage. It's going to get a queen. 
yeah killing off the queen is definitely nice it ends up losing i think it was two of the adepts there and the third one very very low on hit points but a queen two drones the lings are looking for these depths oh man if they had found them i think that two additional adepts would have gone down before that shade finish maybe a third but ends up canceling the shade adepts do get found over here lings looking for a dive in shields some of them have regenerated but not all of them and one of the adepts goes down a second adept goes down a third adept goes down the fourth adept makes its way back home but this is kind of a weird situation now for cyan because He's going for that gold base, but he's lost a lot of his adepts now. So in theory, these this link count could maybe be a bit annoying and threaten that, uh, that kind of like third base location. But even beyond that, we also just have this situation where the gateway flood and stuff is going to be coming up over here for Cyan. He's going for a very, very big committed attack soon. And, uh, well, I mean, like his economy isn't exactly big right now, Bale. Well, if he... He's making Hydras. He's getting ready to just make a lot, a lot of Hydras. Yeah, my name is Mia Micah and I make Hydras. This is, is what I'm being, is what I'm finding out right now. Is that, man, the fact this Overlord was allowed to survive on like 10% HP, that's actually kind of unacceptable. But anyways, this is what Cyan was trying. Actually, this is even just like a little bit quicker of a version of what Cyan was trying last game. It's it's eight gate charge lot plus one, technically against Zealots and or against Lings and against Hydras. Charge lots are fantastic. The problem is right now, Charge isn't done for another 10 seconds. There's a lot of Lings, a lot of Hydras, and Hydras do a ton of damage. So if you have enough Lings just mm -hmm. there to buffer and the Zealots can't get on top of things, you can still make this work. But again, Mio Micah, we, we talk about this every single game that he plays. He is on a bit of a timer here. Eventually, 8K Charge Slot is going to give you a ton of units that explicitly do very well against everything here. So for now, we're going to see the Steel Battery go down, and you really want to win the first fight. You want to snowball one way or the other. The Lings are all dead. Probes are actually pulled into this because, well, Cyan knows. He wins this fight right now. There's no way Mio Micah snowballs, and he's going to get on top of the Hydras. At this point, the Lings, they need a buffer. They're not really doing a good job, and the counter build in game two didn't really work all that well for Cyan. This game, though, is not working at all. Cyan takes the 2-1. Yeah, I mean, beautiful, beautiful transition there from Cyan. Once you get up the gateway flood and charge, I mean, just the idea of Cyan saying, I'm going to get up a couple of those gateways, do the adept pressure, and he got a really nice scout out. So he did actually end up seeing the lair timing. He did end up just kind of delaying going into much, much further tech or anything. He grabbed the third base there, but he just got up his big gateway flood. Me and Micah took a long time to actually knock down those rocks and to actually open up that pathway and everything. So... It kind of just gave time for charge and plus one weapons and everything else to finish up there. Really, really nicely done. And man, Cyan really earned himself that victory there with that uh, extremely, extremely one-sided defense. Yeah, no, it's one of those things where I, I think that was the idea in game two, but post-youth is, A, a you get three gold mineral patches. That's pretty solid. Also, the third base is pretty exposed. Also, he commits with five <laughs> adepts, loses them all. Doesn't, I mean, I guess he didn't get a lot with, no, no, he did. He got the queen, right? So that's a lot more powerful attack in uh from what we saw cyan get in this game so also he didn't pit stop right he got a glaive adepts in game two that slows down your charge it wasn't there for the initial defense plus one a little bit slower as well so this was just a little bit sharper of a timing from cyan and it's kind of cool as we talk about this these builds are pretty well optimized for the hydra player and cyan is clearly looking for a response and, and looking to figure out exactly how that's going to happen and it's kind of cool how very small differences in your build order lead to very significant different, significantly different results. Yeah, I, I really wouldn't have mind. I mean, it's kind of tough there because I think Mio Micah didn't necessarily see how many zealots and things like that were going to be at that third base. Or maybe just like it's a very hard decision to make because it almost looked like maybe you could make something happen there. Diving in on top of the shield battery and stuff first. But I wouldn't have minded if he had been able to exploit the fact that the gold minerals are like a very narrow pathway there. And if he had been able to go to the third base, kind of like threaten the aggression there, but then just move back over to the natural, the rocks that he had knocked down were actually a much wider area. And I feel like he could have like navigated his army back and forth between the two sides of like the natural and the third a lot faster and a lot more easily than that ch like charge lot sentry army could have like slowly made its way through like a single unit kind of gap between those gold mineral patches. I don't know if there was like something there, but either way, I, I think that it was going to be a, a tough match there. As Cyan really, really just came prepared for that kind of all in. Yeah, you know, you, you, you workshop it eventually works out. But uh, yeah, you're talking about it, though. You're right here. Well, at the end of the day, we have three series done. Our final three players. 
moving on into the playoffs. And for the most part, mm -hmm. it's as we expected. Oliveira, Firefly, making very quick work of their opponents in the first two series of the day. And then Cyan, this stumbles a little bit. Glaive Adepts didn't really work, but at the end of the day, it was able to solve the problem of Mia Micah and Cyan, our final player. So if you're keeping track, that is six Protoss players in the round of eight of the Asia region. Two Terran players, Coffee and Oliveira, looking to carry the standard of the Terran race. And unfortunately, Zerg, well, the bugs have been squished. They're not going to be in the playoffs. Not this time. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Zerg has always been a, a little bit of a uh, endangered species in the kind of like Asia region. As I mean, even if you look at the number of players that were in the group stage that were Zerg, I think for Asia, it was basically three. <laughs> it was yeah, Mio, Micah, yeah. Silky, and uh, Misaki. So it was going to be a little bit lower on that Zerg count, but in fact, it's going to be zero instead. And yeah, lots of Protoss. That's that's where all the Protoss are, it feels like. You know, once upon a time, Ravi, we had Sen. We had a strong Zerg player. That's true. Or San? San. There were two Sen, of them. Sen, yeah. The okay. best third place finisher of all time. <laughs> Poor man. Uh, I mean, look, it, what is it with Zerg players and having been the best, like, second place finisher of all time, the best third place finisher of all time? Um, also, the best first place finisher of all time. So they just got all, every position is on lock, right? You got San, you got Sue, you got Sarah. S names being the best one, two, three at all time. I don't know what that means. Uh, I do know, though, that it's going to be a bit of a longer break before we get back into Europe because uh, Europe starts in about 23 minutes. We're going to start. Uh, actually, let's take a look. Let me take a look at my schedule here. To give you the proper thing. We're going to start with Wayne and DNS for Europe. Then it's going to be Shadone. And actually, here we can pull up the schedule. Look at this. Fancy production things. Mm -hmm. um, Lambo Night Phoenix, excuse me. Then Wayne DNS. Shadone Mana. Young Yakov Bly in a wild ZBZ. Gung Fu Band Acheron and Skillless and Strange. So six best of threes in Europe. That means six players move on into the playoffs. Ravi, the day's only just getting started. It really is. We're only a. Uh... Not, e I mean, not even 33%. We're like 25% of the way through today. <laughs> there we go. The math works out. You are correct. It is, in fact, 25%. But, again, longer break. And when we're back, Europe's going to get started. We're going to go over, over all of that six best of threes in Americas. If you're waiting for that one, that's later on. So, friends, it's going to be about 22 minutes. And we'll be back. You love it. You wear it. Wear it. Wear your passion. Share your passion. Wherever. Whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everyone. We've had three series thus far today. It was Europe. Or excuse me, it was Asia. Now we're in Europe. It was Asia. We saw Oliveira move through. We saw Firefly move through. And then we saw Cyan solve the problem of the Hydras and find his way through as well. So Asia has been determined. All eight of them moving on to the playoffs. But Ravi... There are six more series that we're looking forward to in Europe as we round out that final part of our bracket, moving on to the much larger playoffs. But, you know, before we talk about this Lambo Night Phoenix right now, they're they're sitting in the lobby or sitting in the channel talking about maybe they play chess instead of playing the series. Uh, before we talk about that, we do have to talk about our sponsors who are fantastic. It's Blizzard. It's Monster Energy. It's the U.S. Air Force. It's ESL Shop. And they're enabling us to... Not only put on awesome StarCraft thus far, StarCraft today, StarCraft in the future, but also put on an offline event in Dallas, May 31st through June 2nd. And guess what, Revy? Using promo code StarCraft, you can get 15% off. It's fantastic, man. It's good savings for a good event. Definitely worthwhile to attend. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we keep talking about the barbecue as uh, my significant other lives in Dallas. And I can tell you that while it's not Austin, which is where you know, the Austinites would say, we have the best barbecue. Uh, it's pretty good in Dallas. So definitely <laughs> worth attending. And as Ruffy was saying, I think at the start of Asia, the for whatever reason, the, the American fans, the NA fans are just in these events are so good. It's a great thing to, uh, to attend. So you should go do it. I'll be there. Uh, it'll be a good time. And now, uh, before we start talking about this Lambo Night Phoenix thing, which is coming up pretty quickly, we got six series. It's Lambo Night Phoenix, Wayne DNS, looking at today. I know Young Yakov and Bly, I, I don't think any game goes beyond about five minutes. I think we're going to see a lot of Ling Bling, shen Ling Bling shenanigans stuff. Anything uh, standing out to you, Ravi, as we take a look at the, the games here today? I think there are two series that I'm actually kind of looking forward to as being like low key, potentially really cool series. Um, Shadon Mana, mm -hmm. I think like low key may end up being like a really fun series. Uh, I think Young Yakov Bly was the other one that I was also looking at. I, I could also see, you know, I think Skills is pretty favored coming in versus Strange, but PvP is kind of a weird beast and I could definitely see that going into a, like a kind of interesting place, potentially. So my, I would say if I had to pick one series, it'd probably be Shadow and Mana for me, actually. I think that, that potentially could end up being like a really fun series. Yeah, you know, that's valid. I, I'm actually also really excited about Gung Fu Banda Acheron. Acheron has been this up-and-comer. He's been looking good, right? He went 2-1. and one. So he put himself in a qualifying match, and unfortunately, unfortunately, if you're an Acheron fan, he did lose round four. But Gung Fu Banda is one of these players that, like, he seems to beat Clem a lot. in Back when we had round-robin group stages, he would beat Clem quite a bit and lose to other players. So he's a little up and down. It's kind of interesting to see where exactly he's going to go. But as we get ready here and we start with Group A, move on to Group B, we should talk about the journey that these players... Oh, sorry, I guess we start with Group B, actually. But we talk about the journey that these players are taking a look at. So, you know, I showed you the Group A graphic. That's not what matters. Group B graphic, group B graphic here. Lambo and Night Phoenix to start. Lambo losing to Christiana, which I think was a bit of a surprise to a lot of people to end up find himself in round five. Yeah, it's just sort of strange to see Lambo here in round five, like you were kind of uh, talking about. Just the loss of Christianer, the loss to Harstam a little bit more, like maybe understandable, just because Harstam, you know, it's always a year of Harstam and all that good, all the good memory and stuff that we do around that. But it is kind of strange. Lambo is definitely one of those players that you look at and you kind of say, well, yeah, there's like a Serral, like a Max Pax and stuff like that, or a Rainer, but just below like the very, very top, you kind of look at a player like Lambo and you sort of expect to see him there. So it's a little bit crazy to think that it's not necessarily something I'm going to come in saying his first round or his next round opponent, Night Phoenix, is going to be favored against him by any stretch of the imagination. Lambo's pretty heavily favored here. But still, uh, there is technically still a chance that Lambo doesn't go to the playoffs. That's really wild. That's a very strange thing to say. Yeah, and you know, you talk about, yes, European, the European regional in the round of 32, 17 Protoss in the round of 32. Like, there are a lot of players that qualify generally and then don't necessarily make the playoffs. But in Group B, as we take a look at this, Rainer topped his group, which actually I think was a mm -hmm. bit of a surprise considering he's been playing from Korea. But he tops his group, and the other five players that have already qualified, they're all Protoss. 
Like this is this is a trend across <laughs> all regions right now. We're seeing a lot of player Protoss players make their way into the playoffs. And um And one of them, the the one that isn't Protoss, sometimes has played Protoss, Rainer. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean yeah. they were Night Joking Phoenix way. and Lambo were, were talking in chat about how Lambo's uh, Protoss is actually really good. So it's not going to happen this time. <laughs> we're not going to see a PvP here. In fact, our matchup is... Actually, I need to go find Neil's camera first. Um, our matchup's ready. And we're going to get into game one. And the upper left in the blue. He's, well, he's the Protoss player. It's Night Phoenix. And down here in the bottom right-hand side of the map, we have the red Zerg player from Shopify Rebellion. It is Lambo. Alrighty, alrighty. So we got a uh, PVZ, which I will say again, Lambo should be coming into this feeling confident as like a, a pretty heavy favorite. But that being said, Lambo, like you said, already lost one of his EVPs to someone that I think he also should have been favored against of, in the form of Christianer. Night Phoenix already kind of throwing out a little bit of shenaniganry by trying to fake a bit of a cannon rush over here, which, frankly, when you're facing off against someone that theoretically should be favored against you, I think as the favored player, like, I would definitely consider, yes, there's a very solid chance that my opponent would do something cheeky like a cannon rush to try and sneak in a win. So Lambo shows a little bit of respect for it, pulls two drones, doesn't overreact, so... Really, really nice job from Lambo, but I, I think that this is going to be a match where I expect Night Phoenix to try and throw some kind of curveball at Lambo. Yeah, and I do like that, by the way. You talked about this is a match where Lambo is extremely favored. Uh, Linky Lock says it's a 98% win chance for Lambo in this series. Now, we've had a lot of upsets <laughs> in the regionals thus far. Again, Oliveira finding his way all the, round, all the way to round five when we talk about Asia. But this is very much one. I Look, Night Phoenix already, I think it's kind of a coup that night phoenix has already made it to round five there are a lot of players that have been knocked out of five you know we talked about five players advancing that means five players also removed from this group and night phoenix he's always been kind of this this guy that's looking to punch up uh you know he's um previously known as sly crab right he's always got that kind of animal <laughs> two-part name behind it but he's been an up-and-comer for a while and even they'll still to get to round five is already a pretty decent result now of course he'd love to go further than that and for now, he's doing everything he can to be annoying, right? We saw the fake cannon rush that didn't turn into anything, delays the third base by just a little bit of time. But on the flip side, right, Lambo gets his natural down where he wants, so there's not going to be any mining time lost there from drones being sent over to the third base. The Adept isn't going to have this punishing ability to try to dive between the natural at the third base location and the main. But yeah, Lambo's being annoyed by what Night Phoenix wants to do, but not to the same level. Like, really nothing he's not getting enough out well not getting enough out it's not really fair but as night as annoying as night phoenix is trying to be he's not really getting anything out of it yeah not yet the the two adepts may end up trying to find some damage over here but i think it's gonna be pretty difficult to let those shades finish up and try and find too much more damage so moves forward is gonna try and get into a nice spot in the mineral line where these adepts won't just get picked off they do get into an okay spot find two drones which i guess is something for that uh one adept it's not like the best in the world, but it's also like not too terrible. So I think Night Phoenix will be okay with that. But having to use the recall as well is, uh, that's a little bit less ideal, I think, for Night Phoenix. I mean, you know, he goes, he gets two drones, he kills, or he forces two more cancels. So that's like effectively a third drone in terms of how much you have to spend. He only loses one adept for it. Yeah, that, that's chrono energy that you might otherwise want to use. You know, I, I'm kind of okay with it, right? It just yeah it, it's damage it's more damage than you would expect to otherwise get and yeah so for now he's gonna have his third base on the way the question though is where does he go from this right the standard play would say yeah okay it's oracles you get a twilight you move into blink behind that you get aggressive on the map you get plus one blink maybe you get a robo because generally we're seeing a little bit more of that but right now night phoenix there's no further okay there's the twilight i was gonna say there's no further tech on the way at the moment but the other thing we've been looking at, right, as we look at how PVZ has been developing a little bit, Revy, is this idea of these kind of these Colossus time or these Colossus macro builds. Because, you know, Colossus Link Stalker timings have been a thing for a long time. But more and more, we're seeing Protoss players going for like three or four Colossus and they're doing it with a fourth base. They're doing it off of 80 probes and they're playing the macro play just on this idea that, yeah, we can blink forward and snipe Vipers. You know, we just keep our Colossus back until the Vipers show themselves and that's going to be fine. So 
Night Phoenix has options. Question is, what options does he take? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that he has options, and that is definitely one of them, is he could go into that kind of style, but we do have a lot to go before we actually get into that kind of stage, so... Uh, really nice job already with keep killing off four of those workers and still actually keeping all the oracles alive. One of the oracles did get low on hit points. These adepts are not really finding as much damage. And Lambo having a really, really nice drone pull and also the surround with the links preventing those adepts from getting in range of the drone. So that was very nicely done. And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't hate it. I don't hate the kind of little bits of damage that Night Phoenix is trying to find here and there. It is going to be a little bit more about the follow-up and just the fact that he has been able to keep four oracles alive. And is adding on a fifth. So this is this is definitely getting into sort of like weirder territory when you start getting up to a fifth oracle. This is pretty cool. We, this is actually something you saw Hero do against Rainer, I think it was, back in the Masters Coliseum we had at the start of the year. Where you get a ton of oracles. We're moving on moving on to six oracles right now. You get charge lots on top of it. Notice, by the way, Zealous aren't being warped in on the map. They're being warped in the main base. He's hiding this as long as possible. And you just swarm six oracles do a ton of damage queens don't last against them not really uh not many units really can sustain against that so you hide the oracles you hide these zealots and you run across the map and site delta you know it's a reasonably sized map but it's not all that big lambo has had no idea about what's happening until right now he's got queens on the way he's got a bailing nest on the way and night phoenix behind this i mean you want to talk about how you knock an opponent down charge lot of oracle into carriers into tempest into something like that i mean you play off meta that's exactly what night phoenix is doing lambo is doing a really nice job though of putting himself in really good position these zealots they want to be in the open field they want to be able to fight and get big surrounds on top of things lambo is pulling back into his mineral lines but what this means is six thrones have gone down the fourth base is going to go down here and this is already i i don't know that it's enough i mean night phoenix is on three bases i'd say hey He's getting damage done. This is looking pretty good for a young Protoss player. Yeah, I, especially if he can continue to find some damage. Remember, there's no Warp Prism over here, so the reinforcing Zealots have to walk all the way across the map, and I think that is a good reason to not engage too, too heavily, especially against all of the Queens and the Roaches. Uh, take the defensive fight, not rather uh, than taking the fight on Creek with all the Queens and everything else over there. But I'm totally with you. I, I feel like if you have the Fleet Beacon, you've knocked out the third base. You prevented Lambo from getting up to, you know, past like 70 drones for quite a bit of time as well. I don't hate the idea of Night Phoenix just making that transition into a big Sky Toss army. Like this is a pretty decent start for him so far. Dude, there's a mothership on the way too. Yeah. We got a carry. I assume a second carrier eventually. I mean, those are expensive units, but plus one air attack on the way, two carriers on the way out. There's double Stargate. There's a mothership here. Lambo's going into care into into hydras and plus zero or I guess plus one but zero armor hydras against plus one carriers do not fight well and I, you need to have an overwhelming number of hydras to beat a smaller number of carriers this is looking so good for Night Phoenix right now his transitions I, I love the attack right it's very counter to the meta it has a very specific response if you don't have it you lose a base luckily for Lambo he didn't lose the game because that can happen to him and then he's this follow-up is just not something as, Oh, that's a great stasis this follow-up is something that realistically lambo's not prepared for if you're gonna go okay i that's a great goop. but actually what it does i say it's a great goop what this means now is the one carrier was much faster than the second carrier so instead hey revy now all the carriers are gonna pop at the same time so it actually syncs things up a little bit okay that's a little bit of coping but anyways point being here <laughs> is lamb like when you're going against carriers like this you want armor the hydras they don't fight very well otherwise but I guess if you slow the carriers down and you walk across the map with a bunch of queens, maybe, maybe this is enough for Lambo. I mean, Night Phoenix's supply is massive. He's got yeah, I, he, he's got invis he's got a mothership here. He, I don't think this attack works. I think it's going to be very very tough to make work. And actually, I think it is really scary the fact that the mothership is out and that there is going to be carrier number three and number four on the way that's going to pop out possibly during the middle of this fight, getting up to four carriers. And also just having the mothership there to act as like the, the invisibility cloaking here. If you take out those overseers, which I think were maybe getting focused far down for a little bit. He does eventually back off a little, uh, though. I, that is going to be very strong, but shield battery overcharge is going to be on the very, very front line. It is going to be in a more vulnerable location, but funny enough, the cloaking field is actually helping keep that alive for quite a bit of time. It's just the problem is there aren't actually that many units on the ground. The Queens, the Hydras are dealing a little bit too much DPS now, and you're starting to see the Night Phoenix 
didn't really get up to the massive swell of units he was looking for and the stasis traps have not quite been good enough so far i mean i think you give the third base up at this point just recall away because look at what night phoenix is doing on the other yeah. side he's killed the fourth base he's gonna kill the third base i think as well you can lose the you can lose two bases as night phoenix right now the natural is going to be a lot e okay i kill the base please uh, yes there are drones but this base has to go down and i, I guess it's, oh, he didn't target it down so okay he's only going to get one base damage on another but if you just kite away you kite away from the creep the scariest thing Can't right now that? queen transfuses okay i think uh, i was gonna say i think you're probably okay but the lack of interceptors is is kind of a problem make no mistake about it though lambo is all in and he does have to get this damage done but losing the interceptors i, I don't think he lost the carrier no the carriers are still there so again there's a world where critical mass happens night phoenix comes back from this but you need the natural to be a lot more defendable than it is right now there's no wall nothing really stops this army from just running right up the gullet yeah i mean there's not even like a shield battery inside the natural expansion right this is really really doom and gloom mode here for night phoenix i know that the counter damage looked really flashy and cool but there is still a massive army that frankly night phoenix cannot kill he cannot prevent his main base and his natural from just getting absolutely ransacked time warp is kind of nice and that's going to make it very difficult to move up the ramp if he kills off enough of the hydras there's kind of like this weird world where maybe just maybe the queens and the hydras can't actually push up the ramp but it's gonna still put night phoenix on one base it's a one basing protoss player against even if even if there wasn't a fourth base being rebuilt there for lambo a two or three base zerg player should still feel very comfortable in that position I agree with you, and maybe I'm just on a little bit of, again, Protoss hope here because I think the build, is, the idea is pretty cool that we saw Night Phoenix go for. You know, there's a world where if you wipe this army, and again, it's, I don't think you're going to be able to trade it cost effectively enough, but like if you kill all the Hydras, you run across the map. Lambo's economy, he's redrawned up a little bit, but his economy wasn't great. That fourth base going down, you can kind of hit this point where the Zerg player just can't produce fast enough to deal with all the interceptors, but as Night Phoenix. Like he's mining 500 minerals a minute he can barely afford to just to replace all the interceptors that are popping out so even as we talk about this plus one here if, if he'd been able to get plus two out maybe this is another story as well you know plus two carriers are terrifying but as it stands the sky toss idea from night phoenix he's just slowly getting whittled down the main base is just about mined out as well so you know what i want to believe but i don't yeah, it's I, I'm with you in the sense that I really like the idea there from Night Phoenix. It was a really, really nice setup. The whole Oracle charge lot opening was really scary. Got quite a bit of damage done and it seemed really promising. But man, Lambo's counterattack really, really just was able to storm through on Night Phoenix's side of the map. I think there's maybe some small things I can think of that Night Phoenix maybe could have uh, like done to help defend a little bit better. Obviously, the counterattack was really nice, but it does kind of make you wonder like if all of those zealots are also at home or if there's additional like you know eight or nine additional gateway units warped in that are benefiting from that shield battery overcharge that did last for quite a bit of time there's all the extra dps from that that's also buffering for the the carriers and everything else i wonder if that makes a difference or if the counter damage was really what made that worth it and if because I, I feel like even if he had just defended there without the counter damage if he defends there, I actually feel like Night Phoenix is in a good spot. Oh yeah, if he so, if, if he defends there, yeah. he wins the game. I think like with the counter damage, mm -hmm. right? He, the tech was not. Lambo had no hive on. He had no infestation pit. He was very all in on that timing. Unfortunately for Night <laughs> Phoenix, the all in worked. <laughs> like, it was it was almost there. Yeah, it it really did feel like he was very very close. I wonder if just like the extra couple of carriers being at the very beginning, it's like all these small little things that mm -hmm. I can think of and maybe could have gone a bit better. But Lambo hit a very very nice crisp like counterattack timing there, where it was before a lot of those things kind of fired up. You were pointing out the uh, the slowdown on the carrier production thanks to the overseer ability, the corruption ability, really really nicely done with like all those little things that allow him to make the most of that attack and. Make it look a lot more one-sided with just how that fight went at that third. Yeah, I almost wonder whether it would have made a little bit more sense to try to chrono out a bunch of Tempest. Like, get get up to five Tempest pretty quickly instead of going up to the... Because Tempest build a lot quicker, right? Um, mm. So you go up to that, five Tempest, one shot a Queen. You have this kiting potential. You have the Mothership here that you've already spent 300, 300 on. It yeah. might have made sense to say, like, ground Tempest for a little bit and then move into Carriers. Uh, on the like plus two timing, I I don't know. It, there's a it's, lot to figure it's out. It's yeah. really hard because I th I think that Tempest damage and the output is just too slow. Like I feel like you eventually kill the army and you get of like more Tempest, sure, but 
I think you just lose your base like before you actually kill very many units at all. Yeah, that's fair. But look, if the counter damage, if he'd killed two hatcheries, which he almost did, losing your base is not the end of the world so long as you keep your natural alive. That being said, it's a new day. It's a new game. It's a new map. We're on Crimson Court in the bottom left. He's actually up one, not down one. There we go. In the bottom left for the Rebellion, it's Lambo. And over here in the top right-hand side of the map, we have the blue Protoss player. He is Night Phoenix. And we got a good old forward hatchery from Lambo sitting up 1-0, grabbing that high yield gas base and uh, potentially setting up for some fun because I do love when Zerg players, especially like a Zerg player who's very good at preparation like Lambo, takes one of those more forward hatcheries because it i feel like it really does set up quite well for that aggression and also it's important to point out that this is a that this forward hatch is a rich best being geyser on top of it so you get two for the price yeah. of one and generally if you're going to see a zerg player lean into that that's because they want to do some sort of roach ravager timing right you just get two gas you just get a lot of gas you mine it out a lot quicker but ravagers cost 100 gas they're expensive you can go and take advantage of that forward position and the extra gas to hit some really crisp timings. Is that what Lambo wants for? Or is it just, hey, I'm going to be forward and I'm going to have creep a little bit further forward? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there is technically this chance that he was looking at this and saying, well, the, the probe is just blocking my hatchery because he went for the fast scout anyways. So I won't be able to take my natural very easily. I have to take my third base location. And I guess the high yield gas is also just... It's a little bit more forward, sure, but it's also not exactly that much further from the natural. So the drone transfer time isn't going to be that different. Maybe that's sort of his train of thought, but I, I think if you're taking this forward base, you're getting ready to deal with all sorts of a very, very annoying, like adept pressures and all kinds of annoying stuff. It's, especially, I feel like, from the low ground. Can, I don't think adepts can attack the mineral line from the low ground, but I know that that can still be a very annoying spot for, let's say, a blink stalker attack or if Oracle's diving around. It's just like not the location you really want to be dealing with. Yeah, I'm with you. Although, uh, imagine if adepts had the range of siege tanks. Imagine what a world that would be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that that certainly would be a world. That, that's, you know what? I think this is the change for us players need. Uh, that being said, though, Night Phoenix also again he's playing very counter to the meta here we saw that really cool was it six seven oracle charge lot timing that killed the fourth base i think you would have liked to get more anyways really cool timing this time this game is going to be disruptor drops i think he's got a warp prism on the way of robo bay halfway done and against this exposed position if you're if you think your opponent is going to be going roach ravager which is that rich gas based telegraphs although as i say that lambo mm. hasn't actually taken the rich gas that makes a lot of sense Roach weren't on the way now, yep. but again, Lambo hasn't taken the rich gas, so this idea that he's telegraphing is not really coming to fruition yet. Okay, it is going to be disruptive. I had like this very crazy thought here, which I'm like, you know, on no other map and no other situation will I ever think about this. I was like, what if instead of a disruptor drop, you did a Colossus drop? Just because Lambo took that forward base and because that area behind the mineral line we were talking about the Colossus could actually be so annoying harassing back there with a Warp Prism. You might that... need extended Thermal Lance to properly hit it. Mm, yeah, you may be right on that. And I think it would probably take too long for that to pop out to truly be effective. So, yeah, it, it was like a, it was a fun thought. It's not even going to be the case. We're still just going to see a Destructor drop, which I still also do not hate, especially on a, a map like Crimson Court, where I do feel like a lot of the time we see these armies kind of trying to circumvent or it's not necessarily that it's a very choked up map but i feel like there's so many bends and corners and stuff that a lot of the time the armies end up in like this kind of weird limbo line and then when they start to arrive they all start to kind of clump up and congregate i, mean, I feel like this is just a weird map where i looked at it at first and i'm like no i mean I think it's a good map you can spread out your units and everything and then every single time i see disruptors on them this map the disruptor hits are actually incredible I want to take a second here before this disruptor lands. There's a second yeah. warp prism on the way. This is double robo. This is double warp prism Ooh. disruptor drops. Queens are going to get assassinated at the start here. This is super. I, I know I've been saying this is super cool from Night Phoenix. There's no third base on the way. He's adding in additional gateways. This is a. We saw. Okay, so we saw Estrella do something similar back in Katowice last year, two years ago. Double robo, double warp prism, double colossus all in. Right? Or I guess in this case, he's only getting single colossus and four disruptors, but. 
this is so tech heavy but mm -hmm. if you're defending it with road Ravager, again disruptors are really good with this question now is, is lambo gonna be able to we saw it once i forget what the map I, I can picture the map in my head but i can never remember the name we've seen it work once australia won that game a year at like last Ketavita, two mm. Ketavitas ago is this something that lambo has in the back of his head yeah, it's a good question. This is definitely going to be a weird one. And I mean, Lambo is trying to give this some due respect. He's doing his big Overlord flood while staying only on 50 workers so that he can, I thought, make more roaches, but not actually adding on any more roaches. His lair tech is finally going to be finishing up, but this timing is going to end up getting really weird because you still don't need, like, lair only finishing up now means that these roaches don't even have roach speed just yet. And he's still not starting it up. Oh, I have just seven drones going down for the drop as well. So Night Phoenix really now starting to get his pound of flesh in this game and uh, the one question i was gonna ask is like is he gonna go to four colossus answers no he's moving out right now it's two colossus four disruptors two warp prisms how many gateways six gateways here this is a powerful timing coming out of night phoenix it is still relying on the disruptors like let's be clear here colossus are a lot of damage but you won the first man the queen's going down here at the start that is so much anti-air that is so much just healthful that you can add into this army losing them so quickly is a bit of a problem and even that sniping a single warp prism isn't enough here you gotta get both of them down there's this micro ability both colossus they can be picked up they can be saved yes this is a game that lambo can absolutely hold but this is a very technical hold he's gonna have to deal with it look at these disruptor shots to start they're getting pretty solid shots yeah, but this is getting really, really weird. The warp in is going to be very important because one of the warp prisms goes down. Disruptors are still staying alive for the most part. The Colossus are finally getting in on top of that mineral line. This hatchery is getting a lot lower. Night Phoenix is definitely doing quite a bit of damage here. Even just knocking out that base is absolutely massive. There's still exactly one fear I have, which is when Roach Speed kicks in. Lemon was taking all of those fights and looking decent with it without Roach Speed. Can he overpower this army with Roach Speed? War Prism getting taken out while the Warpin was still happening. Disruptors on the front lines are getting taken out, and Lambo is overrunning the army of Night Phoenix. Lambo lost the base, but that's just a little bit too much. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Lambo cleans up, man. Dude, I was looking at that, and I was just thinking Lambo feels like he's in so much trouble and I know again he lost the base but the trades he was taking and the like lack of incredible disruptor hits for an army that was so roach heavy but didn't have roach speed and was also fighting at a choke point and there was also double war prism and like this is a big two base all in I was actually I was just like stunned that Lambo had not lost more of his army during all that yeah, I mean, the shots were good. They weren't great. But again, as long as you keep them alive, they can continue to find that value. It's kind of funny. You look at that army like, okay, it's all about the Colossus, all about the Disruptors. They're what's important. No, it's about the Double War Prism. You lose those and the, the attack's over. Just straight up, you, you lose the game. You cannot reinforce. The attack's over. And I got to say, I, Night Phoenix, I love the build. It's super cool. We saw Maples actually qualified around five with a pretty similar idea. Less, less mm -hmm. Robos, less War Prisms, but... He did like the single robo version of that against eggs last night. And the idea is pretty cool. But if you lose the warp prisms, and again, Night Phoenix was so far forward with his warp ins with the warp prisms in phase mode that they got sniped down very quickly. You gotta be really careful. Like, it's so much maneuverability. You can keep your Colossus alive. You can save disruptors. And with two warp prisms as part of that army, you know, there's no excuse for losing both of them. You really should be able to keep those alive yeah he had the i mean even the first one was set up in a very aggressive position like it was very far forward and it was kind of funny because i think he was just trying to buy space with both the disruptors and the colossus and you kind of saw that being the case where lambo was able to get off like one or two corrosive vials on it at a time but it wasn't the big flurry of five corrosive vials all coming down on the war prism as you oftentimes see and then the war prism just getting one shot it was the war prism gradually getting picked off so it was a uh, it was a kind of tough spot and i definitely agree there's different ways like micro wise maybe things could have worked out better there for night phoenix but man lambda did a really nice job of uh making the two zero happen regardless and that is going to give him that spot in the playoffs so big congratulations to lambo i think we expect to see him there and he got a little bit dicey toward the end in terms of like going all the way to round five but he definitely still managed to clean up with a two zero yeah, that he did. And again, I, I love the builds from Night Phoenix game one and game two. Me both. Too. I think a lot of Zerg players are going to be very unhappy on the ladder for the next week. <laughs> but uh, really cool builds. 
what is also cool though is the break because after the break we get another pvz this time it's gonna be wayne dns i think it's the zerg one the zerg player that might be a little bit more aggressive this time we have four minutes between us now and uh finding out so see y'all very soon you love it you wear it wear it wear your passion <laughs> share your passion Wherever, whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everyone. We've had our first match of Europe. We saw some very cool builds that unfortunately did not work out for our Protoss player, but the builds were super cool. And now we're moving on even further. It's Wayne, it's DNS, Ravi. I, I think we, to we, we thought Lambo was going to 2-0 in that first series. I, Light Phoenix made it very interesting, and I think there's a world where he can actually, off those builds, 2-0 Lambo. Unfortunately, just didn't quite <laughs> work. Um, but now we're looking at Wayne and DNS, and these are players that are arguably maybe a little bit more standard uh, maybe not Wayne he's pretty aggressive but how are you feeling about this series oh I mean this is definitely a kind of interesting one I feel like you know Wayne was this player that a lot of people looked at maybe a few years ago and was like man formerly known as Vanya and stuff he was like really on the up and up Roddy was hyping him up a ton and it looked super promising and I feel like Lately, his results have been a little bit more middle of the road from kind of where his hype was back then. So I feel like there's this latent ability or like this latent version of Wayne that I think I still have in the back of my mind thinking, man, he really can be like a top performer in Europe or be one of those players, is maybe like a top eight finisher or something, if he's really able to pull out his absolute best or something. But we just haven't seen that as uh, much lately. And I think that's, gonna make things a little bit more complicated to me because normally i feel like that just that background gives me this gut favoring a little bit for wayne coming into this but i think that he's struggled a little bit where he lost a battle b he lost a shadow who are definitely not bad players or anything by any stretch of the imagination but i feel like they're also similar level players to say like a dns so i think that this is going to be a i mean it is do or die here so it's going to be an important match of course but i think this is going to be a potentially pretty close series yeah i think uh you know variety calls do or die sunday and that's a really hmm. solid way to talk about it you win you move on you lose you go home it's interesting looking at wayne as well because yeah you know losing to battle b i don't think that's not in my expectation of what wayne's going to do two seasons ago wayne should have two zero to Cyril to advance three zero out of the swiss stage he didn't he kind of threw a game away and Cyril came back but Wayne has these highs that are so good. And the question again is, you know, as we talk about, yeah, he lost to Battleby, sure. Can Wayne reclaim some of that form? Can he make a deep run in the playoffs? Because at his highs, he is that good. But at his lows, he is down pretty far. So question now, Ravi, as we get into game one, is he that guy? Is Wayne gonna show that form? Because in the upper left for Starlight Twinkle in the red, it's Wayne. And down here in the bottom right-hand side of the map, the blue Protoss player, it is DNS. I believe from Berserker Esports, according to Liquipedia, but I'm seeing a different logo on the ground in yours, I think. Yeah, uh, your my logo's Wikipedia. mods is Platinum Heroes, so I'm assuming that he's for Platinum Heroes. Uh, you know what? Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that then. I'm just going to assume that... I know he was on Platinum Heroes, but I think he left... According to Liquipedia, he left in January. <laughs> is on berserker esports i don't know i'm sure i'm gonna get a dm from from one of the admins in a second like hey your logo is mod wrong or something so for now we're, <laughs> we trust liquid Pia. he's on berserker esports yeah. it's just um a bird is a berserker diving through the air it's um it's it's avant-garde it's a uh, <laughs> modern art there we go <laughs> yeah either way though this is going to be a uh, i think a potentially fun match and Again, I feel like Wayne has that strong potential, but I, we talked, like, kind of hyped up Wayne a lot. I feel like DNS has been, there's, like, low-key, I won't say he's, like, the most consistent player ever, but I feel like he has been around and been a kind of, like, middle-of-the-pack, like, contender for Europe, which, again, I don't mean as an insult. Middle-of-the-pack in Europe is actually really high level. That's is quite high level. You have to be a very, very solid player to be able to get into like the middle of the pack of Europe, much less, you know, the top of the pack or something. So DNS being able to be at the middle of the pack of Europe for so many years, I think is already impressive in its own right. DNS truly is one of those players. I think if you are not in good form, he has a very, very strong chance against you. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And it's kind of funny. You know, we had a long time where for whatever reason, DNS and Shadone, countrymen, would be fighting for like the last slot into the playoffs in mm -hmm. uh, in, 
in Masters Europe, we had kind of the same thing with Lambo, excuse me, with Harstam and Mana, where they would go make that happen. But I guess they've been desynced a little bit. But you're right, DNS is one of these players that you kind of expect him to make a playoff like every other season. And I look at the pedigree of the players that they've run into, the players that they beat, and the players that they've lost to, kind of getting in here to the rest of round five. And this season, at the very least, DNS has that more impressive run. I would argue, uh, Wayne, he took down Schmatz, right? He took down, it was up and comer, super cool, nothing against him, but he took down four Jumi and Schmatz. He lost to Shadon, he lost to Battleby. And when you talk about the pedigree of those players, DNS's run, taking down Gerald, taking down, uh, taking down Milky Cow, to me, that's a slightly stronger marker of form. Yeah. I, yeah, I kind of feel like they're both in a relatively similar place. And well, whatever form they show up in today is definitely going to matter quite a bit. We do have a, a good old couple of depths opening on up in this game. We have a couple of oracles being made. So DNS is not doing anything super duper crazy or out there. I think that Wayne has that potential every so often to throw out a kind of weird or funky build. So maybe there's like a little bit of onus that he will do something a bit crazy, but so far it's all looking pretty standard normal and four drones already being pecked off while keeping both oracles alive. is not the worst start in the world here at all for DNS. No, certainly not. Yeah, the first oracle, four drones, three lings, you lose the adepts and that does mean you're a little vulnerable to some counterattack on your third base, but that's why you move the second oracle to defend that one. What's really interesting though to me, it has been, it's funny, Two or three years ago, the, the story was, ah, one Oracle, you don't have to get a lot of damage done. You want to get something. It's, you know, it's, for, it's for vision. Two Oracles, you want to get some damage done. Three Oracles, you better get some damage done because otherwise you're going to lose the game. You committed so much to it. But for now, like pretty much since Hero changed the changed the meta coming back from the military, it's like, yeah, I'm going to build three Oracles and I'm going to go into Blink behind it. I'm going to get plus one. And that's how you play a PVZ. And DNS stopping it too here. This means his blink is faster. His plus one is faster. He's going to commit into his tech just a little bit earlier at the expense of only getting four drones instead of seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's interesting to see, I guess, the deviation, the, the difference in play, given how specific PVZ has gotten. Yeah, and I think part of that also is like, he's not necessarily going to be going into the plus one or like plus two blink stalker aggression, that kind of like hero style that he popularized. He's going to be adding on charge. He's adding on Templar archives. He's going to like that charge lot archon style. So if you're going for the blink style, you really want those oracles not only keep an eye on things a little bit ahead of your stalkers. You want to have that for high ground vision, but really, really big is you just want to be able to have some extra firepower to help deal with like the lings, the lings themselves can really, really deal damage to the stalkers. But if you're going for charge lot Archon, then yeah, the Oracles are a nice little opening. They're gonna be able to get some additional scouting information and stuff, but he is looking to just get aggressive with units that don't really need additional help dealing with Lings. Yeah, the problem is plus one, plus one range is on the way, right? Roaches are being made here. Lings, pretty rough against charge lot Archon. <laughs> uh, Lings, in, well, Lings are pretty rough against charge lots. We saw that in the uh, in the Miyamika series, right? Game three. Roaches, though, you get enough of them. They, they they handle this army pretty well. And unfortunately for DNS, Wayne's getting ready for his own re big roach play. We're not going to see this plus one melee link thing. It's, that's a nice run by not a lot of links for three probes. And now I, plus one makes, you know, some level of a difference. We're going to see Archon drops here. Try to get something as the attack gets ready. We're looking at 12 roaches. We're looking at Ravagers on the way. I. I, I, Lambo should have, or yeah, not Lambo, excuse me, Wayne should have enough to defend against this one. Queen gets caught in the front, so a queen getting, I actually, <laughs> Zealot's coming in from the bottom side as well. That's two queens dead. And I talked about how this should be enough, right? The Roach is here, the Ravager's here, the Queen's here. But DNS is actually getting a pretty nice trade, all things considered. Yeah, I mean, th three workers over at the third or the fourth phase, that's something. He did kill, yes, a couple of the queens. He killed some of the roaches, but this was, in my mind, like a pretty decent investment. Yes, having the Temple Archives is nice, but remember, it's not like he has Storm or anything, which Storm is not even like, amazing versus roaches. Like, it can be okay sometimes, especially if you start having like higher or something and being added on behind it. But this is an attack that i think dns was looking to get a lot more done with i don't think that dns was happy about how the attack went ravi you say storm's not good against roaches i clearly you haven't seen my games <laughs> we bathe i think if you great. have enough storms they can be okay <laughs> 
<laughs> Anyways, I do like these Archon drops, though. Getting three drones. And more importantly, at this stage of the game, you're denying gas a little bit. And yeah, you know, one might argue, ah, you know, you're playing Roach Ravager. Do you, you're playing Mass Roach. Do you really need gas? Yeah, you do for the Ravagers. They're expensive. Each Ravager costs as much as the Muto when you do all the math of it out. So denying gas, denying uh, more drones here or there. Actually, he's going to force a recall because, well, Wayne's getting ready to move on to the other side of the map. He's got 175 supply. And here's the problem. Immortals, there are three of them on the map right now. It looks like a fourth just finished. Plus two's not ready yet. Blink's not ready yet. Stalker, Blink Stalker is really good against this composition. But for right now, Wayne's looking to go hit with his really powerful mm. army down on the low ground. I do love the Oracles just sitting here. Ravagers are on a timing. Ravager on the high ground gets caught out as well. And if DNS can just... That's another Ravager misrallied. The Ravagers are the key part of this army, and it's so expensive to lose them. This looks easy for DNS. With all the misrallies from Wayne, the initial hold is just... I mean, at this point, we're starting to see some Archons go down, but this army... The Roach Ravager composition is just not strong enough. And I'm sorry, with all the Ravagers dead, the Roach composition is just not strong enough. Yeah, I, I mean, I was genuinely concerned there for DNS, but you're right. He did make that look kind of easy with the defense. The Archons and everything all being out on the front line as a buffer and none of them really dying. Actually, I'm not even sure. Did more than a single Archon die in that fight? We had like an Archon, a couple of Zealots and like maybe a few probes or something. But he managed to kill so much in exchange for that. A, a little roach run by, or a pretty substantial roach run by, attempted over there, but does not manage to find the mark. Hive has started up behind all this for Wayne, so maybe his transition point is going to be where he finds some kind of advantage, but that was a very, very costly investment of an attack that didn't actually end up shutting down anything. I mean, not even the fourth base. Oh, and now we're looking at this situation that, yeah, Wayne's transitioning. He's got a hive halfway done, lurker in on the way, adding in these hydras, that additional damage on the backside of the roaches and maybe the ravagers as well. Lurkers, of course, going to be pretty good. But if I'm Wayne, I got plus three done soon. I don't even know that I wait for that, right? I'm going to get a 175 supplier or so. And given what I've been able to do, I, I think you just run across the map. Your army is so much better right now. Now we got to talk about this. Wayne's... Okay, well, first of all, that warp is not actually going to block the uh, block the gap out. But Wayne's creep spread is really good. He's all the way across the map. He's got this highway going forward, and that means these run by these counterattacks of roaches diving into the natural in the main base are going to force the entire army back, and that should buy enough time to get lurkers out. Not with upgrade, not just yet. That's a little bit longer, but he's forced the entire army of DNS back home. But Ravi, as we look at this and how much damage is being done, it's ten probes. That's a lot of roaches that have just died. That is a lot of lings that have just died. Yes, you force them back home, but if we look at the resources trade, does that justify it? Yeah, that is going to be a really, really weird one because it bought a lot of time. Wayne is going to have those lurkers, like you said. He's going to be such a, setting up a pretty nice angle. And DNS, he's got like seven Immortals, seven Archons. It's a scary looking army. I feel like where the fight is going to take place is going to matter so, so much. Those Lurker upgrades getting very, very close to finishing. And all well, the Protoss army is on creep now. This is going to be the do or die moment. That it will be. But for now, <laughs> there's a gap Ooh. in the wall once again. Vanya, excuse me, Wayne looking to run right in. Now this army with plus three can run through these Lurkers, but they're set up. There's no flank. You do not want to attack through a single angle. He's going to force a recall as well. Going to depower two gateways. Going to depower depowering the cyber. It doesn't really matter. But at this point, Wayne is doing such a good job of forcing DNS back that <laughs> DNS has these timings. They're really good. And he's just not allowed to take advantage of them. And look at the lurker count now. It's 11 lurkers. This is a powerful army. You can take the fight as DNS. And why are the roaches hmm. still here? <laughs> why are they still allowed to exist in this natural Vanya, Wayne is doing such a good job of not allowing DNS to play the game he wants to play. Oh, that's so annoying. The reinforcing warp in gets canceled there. All of these things get depowered. You can see them. DNS is starting to get a little bit flustered here. He had two fleet beacons that were actually made. Fleet beacons are not cheap, by the way. It's 300, 200. It's a lot of extra gas that's invested in all of that. 13 probes going down. Lurker's trying to find an angle. And I mean, that is the one kind of big saving grace here for DNS is his army is still so beefy so scary so filled with power units but it's not easy to find a fight versus that many lurkers i mean eight more ten more lurkers being added on i think going up to 18 lurkers this is the kind of stuff of protoss nightmares because it, you can feel like you're taking the sickest fight in the world 
but 18 lurkers just take so long to die and do so much splash damage and sometimes even a good looking fight or an okay looking fight just suddenly turns around and looks absolutely terrible oh and by the way Revy, you, you said that there were two fleet beacons on the way no there's there's two fleet beacons completed they're right next to each other so yeah. uh, we can make double mothership is, is what i'm hearing that being said dns he's got this tech he's maxed out and lurkers are gonna dive on top of this army so there's a room now you can build more stargate units the problem is you got to be able to defend lurkers in the natural hydras in the maybe they're gonna target the stargate down which is so nice because at this point yes you can win the game on a ground toss army but you have to have a really good surround you want to have disruptors maybe additional slash not just this charge lot arc on immortal thing and wild dns have put himself in some really nice positions at the start of this game in the mid game wayne bought so much time with the roaches that at this point dns has no answer the lurkers are just there there are far too many of them the fourth base is going to go down the main base is still sieged up by our lurker in there I, I, it looks like it's been actually cleaned up now and these high templars they're there actually i think they're taking a lot of damage as well high templar the storms i mean the lurkers are very clumped together storms can kill them i don't know that this run by in the main base this warp in yeah no it's dead i 11 drones are nice revy but the damage that wayne just got done far outstrips that it absolutely does. Uh, Wayne is in a phenomenal position now in this game. Spine crawler defense also going to help deal with those charge lots that were trying to do a little bit of run by damage. Very, very nice storms there. And I mean, I think Wayne, he's going to have a hard time pushing into that many storms because just he doesn't actually have that large of an army at the front lines. But once his reinforcements arrive and they are starting to rally across the map, He's gonna have a much, much stronger army. There are their reinforcements. And if he takes care of those Archons, the Immortals are finally gonna be on the front line and start getting target fired down. Storm plus Mothership plus Time Warp. I mean, that is a very, very potent combination. But again, it is about the economies. It's a three basing Protoss player versus a now, what is that? Six base, six base Zerg player with double Spires on the way. We have Vipers on the way. This is gonna be a feel, like a nigh impossible kind of Zerg army to just stop because it's just gonna be constantly reinforced. Even with the best trades, truly DNS has to just win with a push. I mean, again, if you say that, I think he can. And maybe again, I'm just try cheering for Protoss players too much. Army supply is not that different. He's got a mothership. He's got slow zones. He's got invisibility. If he wants, he's got a ton of storms. It's a 70 or 60, 70 supply lead, but the army supplies are very close. It's all about the income. If, if you get on top of Zerg production, Wayne right now, he might want something more. And actually the Vipers are really key right now. So abducting the mothership, but it's in dead airspace. And now Hydras are going to target that down, but the slow zones are really nice here. They're going to allow more storms to land. Is there a detection? Looks like there is for now. Oracle's dropping everything down. Here comes DNS trying to get on top, trying to win right now. But the splits from the Hydra are good enough. The blinding cloud seems to be good enough here. And while I did believe that there was a world where you punch through with this, there's just not enough. The Spellcasters are far too strong for the Zerg right now. And Wayne makes it look a little interesting. But he takes game one. He does. Uh, it was a it was a cool start there from DNS in a lot of ways. Like that really did look like it was maybe getting situated to turn around into something really cool. Obviously, the very beginning of the game, we were saying like, oh man, or at least I know I was feeling like, man, Wayne seems like he's in a really really decent spot here at the very beginning, but. DNS turned things around really well with a really cool defense. I loved the what you were pointing out also on the the oracles just massacring all of the ravagers in the air as there was absolutely no answer for that while also miss rallied ravagers were getting picked off and everything with that big attack that dns had done earlier so i mean i feel like wayne was doing a uh, or sorry dns was doing a lot of really nice stuff with that kind of mid game but as the game went on man just as soon as wayne got up to that massive lurker count it really did feel like that plus the run buys dns couldn't do anything about it like dns just got kind of overwhelmed once the run by started happening and Wayne was able to get into like his ideal like game composition. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. When you look at Zerg players, or sorry, I guess top Protoss players, kind of the difference between the good and the great in a large part is you take a look at this fact, it's their vision control, right? So Wayne, when he was in a really rough spot, he was just on roaches against this charge lot arc on a mortal, highly upgraded army. He just didn't have vision on the right side of the map. So Roaches were able to dive in again and again and again. Uh, and at that point, you know, 
if the Roaches buy that much time, you suddenly start to make the Protoss player transition. Because yes, you can win against... You, you can win with a ground Protoss army against Lurkers, but you need more than just Immortal, Charizard, Archon. You need, like, Disruptors and maybe Colossus and, and other things. You'd hire a tech. And a lot of Protoss players, they'd rather just go and they go into Sky Toss. So you transition into Sky Toss. Well, suddenly that's a timing window that Wayne can take advantage of, and he did a great job of taking advantage of it. And at the end of the day, Revy, that means that Wayne is a one map away from qualifying into the playoffs after a pretty rough run. But for now, because I got to find Neil here. There we go. For now, he's got another map. We're going to move into game two. It's on Ghost River. And the upper left playing for Berserker Esports. He's down a map. It's DNS. And over here in the top right hand side, we have the red Zerg player from Starlight Twinkle. He is Wayne. Sitting up 1 0. One game away from moving on to the playoffs. And we got a very, very fast drone making its way across the map into the natural to build a good old hatchery. This is what I was talking about. Wayne is definitely one of those players where I was saying this in like the beginning of the last game. He's not afraid to get a little bit cheeky sometimes. He doesn't do it every game. He's not like a Mio Micah or something. He's not a Bly, but he will absolutely throw out a little bit of cheesiness or a little bit of cheekiness to throw his opponent off sometimes. Yeah, and again, Wayne comes from this school of, of Eastern European Zergs that Bly is kind of established. <laughs> And when Wayne was first on the come up, you know, we saw him go and he beat TY on a map when like TY was the best in the world, kind of putting people on, no or one of the best Terran players in the world and, you know, putting people on notice. In general, what, like this is how Wayne came up. I don't know if we can call this cheesy, but more aggressive options, weirder stuff from the Zerg players. And it turns out his macro is also really good as well. So up one on a short map. Yeah, go make the Protoss player's life a little bit more unfortunate. Five probes were pulled instead of four, so the hatch is going to go down before it really finishes. And that does mean the little bit, you know, we're going to see the natural. TNS is going to get that done a little quicker. The other question, though, is he, is he going to go try to block gas? And for now, it looks like the answer is no. Again, he's just trying to block the natural as, as, <laughs> as long as possible. Not quite going to get there. So DNS, he gets his natural down. And the game goes on. But, you know, we were talking, I was talking about this with Loco yesterday. Protoss, Protoss in general is so build order dependent as there we go. Skill check. Gas is not going to get stolen, but Protoss is so build order dependent that anything you can do to mess with them, it's a lot more comfortable for the Zerg than it is the Protoss. No, absolutely. I think this is the reason why players like Bly and stuff often have see a lot of success when they do these kind of proxy hatches almost every single game. It's even when you know the proxy hatch or something that block is going to happen, it's still hard to deal with just because like you were saying, Protoss players have their build orders also mapped out, but they're not mapped out around a hatch block that often. It's not really as defined for that. And a lot of those crisp timings become a little bit, or like even sometimes a lot less crisp when you don't have all that. So I love the decision from Wayne to just kind of get in DNS's head a little bit. DNS is of course gonna still be able to bounce back. Like you said, this isn't a super all in proxy hatch cheese that failed. It's nothing like that. It is just something to throw your opponent off a little bit. And so far, I think it's absolutely been able to accomplish that. It's just annoying. You're like, oh, okay, well, I, I can't. My timings are just a little bit off. And it does slow the Zerg player down, too. You drop 300 minerals on a hatch, and you get 250 of them back when you cancel. But that's a drone. So you're just sitting here like, it's a little... It slows the Zerg player down. But if I'm the player that wants to go in, is... I'm the player making the decision to go and make this happen, right? I'm the one that's going to go and I've committed from the start of this game to go and do something weird and slow myself down to try to slow you down more. Theoretically, the person that's making the decision is going to be in a slightly better spot than the person who is having to react to the, de the decision. Just again, because you're kind of mentally prepped for it. In this game, we're going to have to see. And for now, well, there's an Oracle that's going to show up. And mm. that's very nice from Wayne there. Denying the third base for just a little bit longer. Getting the probe. He's going to get on top of the Adept. Mm. One of these is very low. So he's going to get two of the Adepts here. Mm. He's always going to get in. Okay. Well, that's... I said it was very nice. And I stand by that statement. It's fantastic for Wayne. Yeah. The, I mean, Wayne be able to get into the main base now. And... It's not really so much that like he's scouting out a ton over here, but it's just annoying. You're having to pull your pros while you're also trying to micromanage your Oracle on the other side of the map to pick off drones. And he has managed to kill off 
two drones total i think with just the oracle it did try and dive in on the spore crawler drones or the drones that were only protected by a single spore he can dive back in as that or those oracles are both still pretty healthy so could find additional damage i think is going to be important but like you were saying before third base was delayed earlier on by the lings being able to pick off that probe that's trying to build it's just like all these little things that wayne is managing to accomplish they're just throwing dns off his game it's just it makes everything a lot more painful it makes everything about the game feel less smooth which i absolutely love for wayne yeah oh well this is dead queen oracles you know it's easy to underestimate how much damage. oh yeah he's gonna get no he has dead queen not enough energy it's easy to un underestimate how much damage oracles do because you know, generally they're not gonna <laughs> want to attack into a bunch of queens because they are glass cannons but you leave one on it's lonesome that queen is gonna get assassinated it's gonna go down now you talk about that run by by the way just the other nice thing about this about the run by outside of the scout and killing off the adepts and a little delaying the third base is the fact that Wayne forced a bunch more adepts to get warped in that's money that you would rather be spending on infrastructure spending on probes and yeah DNS is gonna try to make something happen he's got six adepts he's got these uh he's actually got three oracles right now this is a lot of damage potential actually and with no roaches just slings you have to be pretty careful but it looks like for now Wayne's gonna have his queens well positioned the oracles aren't gonna find a position so DNS is threatening, but for the moment, these adepts are not going to get a lot done. Yeah, I, I'm with you in the sense that these adepts can absolutely, if they find an, a nice mineral line opportunity or something, they can get into a good spot, pick off a lot of drones and stuff, but it is going to be a little bit tough for them to get into that position with so many of these queens positioned at the front lines. And now the Ling's actually trying to go for us around. Kind of an interesting commitment there for Wayne. He does trigger the oracles to activate their pulsar beam and they are actually now out of energy so that does make things a little bit nicer because you don't have to deal with that for a little bit that means that the adepts can now get dove upon there's no oracle energy to help out and the shade is gonna have to finish up to actually allow those adepts to escape back to their safety of the shield battery how do you feel about this brother we don't have it well actually do we have a twilight no yeah we don't have a twilight at all it's just very quick robo bait double robo Coming out of DNS against what is a melee focus style. Yes, there's a Roach Warren done, and we're probably going to see more Roaches get made. But for right now, this is a Ling Bane focus style out of Wayne. And we're going to see double Colossus popping out. We're going to see double Disruptor popping out, depending on exactly where he wants to go. I was going to say that, but we actually have nothing coming out of the double Robo right now. So, uh... Probably Immortals, right? I, I mean... Oh. Well, he got the Robo. Okay, there, sorry. Right? There's so, a Colossus. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. against this Mash Ling style, I mean, that Immortal is not going to go down. Nice job there, there DNS. This is Mass Ling against double Colossus, probably gonna go up to four Colossus, delayed blink, maybe get a quick charge it again because that's just a faster upgrade. It feels like DNS is just doing a really good job despite having this uncomfortable setup where Ling run buys get in and your third base gets delayed and your natural gets delayed and all, all of these things. It seems like DNS is doing a really good job of beating the game that Wayne wants to play and kind of leapfrogging him in, in the game stage. Yeah, it definitely feels that way. Now, we do have Temple Archives now being scouted out as well as it gets dropped down. So Wayne is going to have a good read on kind of where the tech is. I think he's seen like the, the rows and everything else as well, right? Because he did. Yeah, he saw the robotics space, saw that it's researching as well, which is a nice kind of showcase. And like, okay, Colossus are coming out in good numbers. Is Wayne actually going to commit to something over here? He's moving out onto the map aggressively with an army that frankly doesn't look that large if he's able to like jump in and snipe off the fourth base or cancel it that's kind of nice but yeah if you if you overcommit, the oracles can actually start just picking off all those roaches in the middle of the map yeah i mean he's getting himself set up for it right we see in the creep highway with the overlords pooping creep down the middle of the map and there is that and wayne's gonna go for it all bailings on the way bailing speed is done plus two is gonna be done soon enough and i have seen wayne go and beat colossus link stalker sentry with just ling bane He's done it before. He mm. may do it again. But for right now, these triple oracles are so obnoxious. You morph in Ravagers and you immediately lose one. Second one takes a lot of damage. It means you got to pull Queens with a push. Otherwise, all the tech in this army is going to get knocked down. So DNS is doing a really nice job of getting himself all ready for this, defending against this. But Wayne doing the Wayne thing. Ooh. It's not about the attack on the fourth base. That's what he's getting set up for. But instead, it's this attack in the natural. Lings and Banes and Roaches on into the natural, onto the main base, powering one of the Robos second one looks like it's gonna stay alive for the time being and when he's just trying to swarm he's playing the purest iteration of zerg i'm going to attack into every angle i'm going to get as much damage done as possible and you just have to get yourself situated unfortunately for dns he's not doing that big surrounds everywhere 30 dead probes all of a sudden 
tech going down the robo now depowered so nothing's coming out of that tech the mortal probably not going to show up and dns is all of a sudden all in he's like he's taking so much damage here but he's all in defensively I, wade is doing such a good job of attacking ever like how do you move out on the map the multi prong aggression there was unbelievably clutched there for wayne because i think if that army had just tried to take a direct fight over at that fourth base location or something or the third base i really don't know that i liked wayne's chances all that much but being able to spread out his army so much like you were saying be able to hit the main and the natural and the third and the fourth all at once really really pulled dns apart and now the bailers come rolling on in the colossus on the front lines not the archon the colossus dying to the banelings and th this is already off the back of the fact that dns's economy has been absolutely ravaged you can't really replace those units very easily his robos had already been killed off so he definitely can't replace those there's not even like a counter-attack all-in potential anymore for dns wayne has absolutely killed it this game he really has and i, I like so I like at this point DNS is just kind of given up on the robot. Jeez, these Ling run buys. Uh, I love that he's given up on the Robo Dream, or I, I guess I don't love it, but I think it's interesting. He's on eight gateways. He's going up to eleven. So this is just I have the Robo Tech that I have. I can get more Archons. I'm gonna go charge a lot Archon. Maybe I'm gonna. I gotta go. I gotta do something. And I'm I'm not gonna. I don't have time to get the Robos up. It's just not a thing. Unfortunately, twenty six more drones are dead. The fourth base is dead. The main base is taking more damage. I, I guess shout out to DNS. He's lost 72 probes and is still somehow, up until right now, is still somehow north of 40. So <laughs> he's got that one going for him. But the other way to look at this, Ravi, 73 dead probes. Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, he was getting doubled in supply by 100. <laughs> it was, it was going to be time pretty soon. But man, what a fantastic job there by Wayne. I, I truly think that there are a lot of ways that that same attack, in like not necessarily terribly well executed ways just literally attacks at the front line from like one or two angles i think that wayne actually ends up losing some of those fights and i won't say they loses the game or anything from there but there's a very real possibility that dns could have swatted that away with four colossus out on the field with five or six also coming on out more gateways finishing on up he had a lot of archons and everything it really felt like dns had the tools he needed to make a defense happen but Wayne just hitting from the like so many different angles, it really just spread DNS apart. Even the actual fight itself that happened, because there was the run by stuff that did a ton of damage. But the run buys happening first pulled Wayne or a DNS's army back as he was trying to move over to the natural with his army. It spread it out into a line so that when D, uh, Wayne came in with his main army to the fourth and the third base. It suddenly was not the kind of clumped up Protoss death ball that you really want to that easily gets a nice little concave and walls itself with the stalkers of the Archons protecting the Colossus. It was like this weird limbo line of a Protoss army that just got surrounded and picked off by Lings. So Wayne lost that fight technically, but he took better trades than he would have, even with the main army fight because of the run buys. Just honestly, it was a really, really well executed attack there for Wayne. It was. It also shows kind of why Ghost River can be a little hard for Protoss players sometimes. There are, there's a really quick rally from the natural to natural, but you're kind of expanding bottom side. So it's one of those setups where, especially if you're going for this death ball, a double robo type of composition, it's splitting your army can be really hard. And there's a bunch of wide open attack angles. That being said, at the end of the day, they chose the maps, right? They chose to play the styles they chose to play. And well, Wayne, I don't think anyone's surprised to see him in the playoffs. But that means that we are done with our spate of PVZs for the time being. I think we might get some more later. But for now, we got to go to a break because after that, it's going to be mana gonna be let me i had it up uh it's gonna be mana. it's gonna be someone else it's gonna be a pvp shadow and mana there we go the the mashup that fear dragon circled on his little uh on the schedule we'll be back in four minutes you love it you wear it wear it wear your passion <laughs> share your passion wherever whenever gaming is a lifestyle get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Oh, a poet once said, whoa, whoa, we're halfway there. Whoa, we're living on a prayer. Uh, I'm doing this, by the way, so I don't actually sing and then ruin everyone's eardrums. We're about halfway through the day or just about. We're moving on <laughs> to that midpoint mashup. It's going to be a PvP as well, finally. No, we had, we had a PvP in Asia, never mind. But we got a different one here. Shadon, Mana, Ravi, when you're taking, taking a look at Europe, you said, yeah, I think this is going to be a pretty cool matchup. Why is Shadon and Mana such a cool matchup? I think to me, it has to do with one, I'm also just a Mana fan. So like anything that has Mana, I'm always just a little bit happier. So I'm going to just put my bias out there nice and early on so I can uh, caveat everything I'm saying. But also, I actually think that both Shadon and Mana, assuming that Mana isn't in just like absolute peak form, which I think he's in pretty decent form, but maybe not like peak, peak Mana form where he's just taking out incredible players or something like beating Showtime and like Serral or something like managed to take him to like game five. I think Mana is in like decent form. And I think that Shadon is also kind of in like a goodish form. And I feel like it's not so much that I think both of these players are in a hot, hot streak or anything. It's just, I think both these players are in a pretty similar space in terms of their form right now. Shadon is doing pretty well in the form, fact that he's been able to like beat Wayne, he beat DNS. So I feel like he's in pretty good shape and I feel like Mana is in like okay shape. So I think that we could have a close series, which is what I'm excited for. Yeah, maybe our second 2-0 of the day, or excuse me, second 2-1 of the day is a, uh... Been a lot of two zeros thus far in this round five, this do or die Sunday. And well, one thing we got to do is get into game one. In the upper left, playing for Platinum Heroes. This time it's for real. <laughs> it's Shadon. And down here in the bottom right hand side of the map, we have the blue Protoss player. He is Mana. Representing Team Liquid proudly for many, many years now. My favorite part is, uh, again, he's been on Team Liquid for 10 years now, I think, is was, was just announced. Uh, they've, of course, promoted him. He's not just a player. He's a manager. Or, as I like to say it, he's the monitor. Yeah, I did I did enjoy when he made that tweet as well. <laughs> he got, when he got the final move that happened, saying that he was a monitor now. I think they actually have it set up like that, like on his on his profile on, on the Team Liquid website. They have him listed mm -hmm. as the, they capitalized the second in and monitor just to really make it happen. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah, it's been really cool. Mana has been one of those people who has, I wouldn't, you know, if you asked me five years ago, do I think that Mana would be one of those TLO-esque players who is competing as a player but also doing all these other things like acting as a team manager and then also doing things like content creation and stuff. Like I actually really would not have guessed Mana to be the person to do all that stuff, but he's really made it happen. His YouTube has been picking up steam over the like past couple of years. He's been, as said before, like acting as a team manager. And I think what's most impressive to me is he's still keeping up a lot of those results. Now, can he keep it up as he is going to be going up against Shadon who Again, I think he's doing like pretty decently for himself right now. He also is missing a second pile on his main base and Mana should be very aware of that right now and should be aware of the chance that there is going to be a proxy. It's always interesting. It's like, okay, is this, even if there's a pilot on the map, right? Is this an actual, uh, is this an actual proxy? Is this just something you're, you're faking? Because like in PVP, mm -hmm. we go through epochs where it's there pretty often. You'll see the fake Ooh. pilot on the map. Very often great scout there for Mana. So now he knows what's up. And we'll go through these timings where actually that doesn't happen. And the pylons always go on the main base unless there's a proxy. And it feels like right now we're in this timings. Oh, he's going to get two adepts for one. Like Mana is just all over this in game number one. Now, granted, he's not going to be able to kill it because the adept shade completes. But Mana knows where everything is. He's doing a good job of it. But to put a pin in that thought is, uh, oh, well, um, I guess, yeah, you know what? Actually, two sentries kill this adept. <laughs> the change is fine. You're not worried about the damage anymore. Put a pin in that one. Right now, we're in a situation where it feels like that is a little bit more common, where we see the fake pylons on the map a little bit more. So seeing the lack of a pylon doesn't telegraph as much as it would have been, you know, maybe a year ago when we saw less of it. For now, though, three sentries here. I mean, look at that. The, the shields go down immediately. This gets 
nothing done. And by the way, these adepts on the other side, they force the Oracle to stay home. They get a decent amount of damage on the shield battery. And Mana, good scout, keeps one of the adepts alive, kills his other opponent's adept, and look at this. Yeah, Proxy Stargate's great. We got a Proxy Gateway on the map, and that one might have a little bit more power. Yeah, especially since, you know, with a, just a single Oracle that was actually made from that Proxy, it means, okay, the second Oracle is now on out, so it could actually get a little bit more damage, especially with Mana having done the move out. But is Shadon actually going to have enough back at home to defend that natural expansion? This is going to get a little bit dangerous for both of these players, I feel like. There is a very real possibility, Force Field. No, it can't lock out the pros. There was a really cool chance for Mana potentially to just trap in all those pros, but he's just actually going to go for the juggler. He depowers both the gateways. Oh my god. Shadon may have just lost the game. Like, that actually may just be it. No, he has lost the game. He has no production here. Probes are going to have to get pulled. Yeah. And, I, like, sentries, yeah, they're they're still not as beefy, but I mean, they actually do a really nice job against these, against Protoss units. All right, that's the big change. And when you proxy on the map, you have less pylons on the main base, which means there's a higher likelihood that there's going to be an Artosis pylon. As we see right now, Guardian Shield means the Stalkers don't get as much damage done. Oracles are going to try to run to the backside, but the problem is, if Mana loses everything right now, which I don't, I'm not even sure he he does, it's 10 workers, right? There's, there's no money for Shadon. Mana takes game one. That was such a cool reaction there from Mana because there was a few things that happened there. So Mana, when he scouted around, so first of all, you, you scout mm -hmm. with your probe. Like This is pretty normal. Like As you were saying, this is a very common thing in PvP. You hide your second pylon. Sometimes it's a fake proxy. Sometimes it's proxy Stargate. Sometimes it's proxy Robo. Mana just taking a stab at it and saying, okay, if it was like, let's say it was Proxy Stargate, where would I go scout first? Goes to the first location where it could have been, or like that it ends up being, gets it right immediately. Scouts of the probe, and also the vision radius for buildings that are still being constructed is like a little bit smaller than just normal units. And Mana kept it kind of like at the edge of vision. I think it maybe would have like possibly dipped into vision of that building for a split second, but he kind of pulled it back very quickly. So kind of revealing or hiding the fact that he had seen the Stargate. Mm -hmm. So then when he gets up the shield battery and stuff back at home, yeah, there's that one adept that tries to move around. It ends up completing its shade. And you were talking about how it ends up taking all the damage. It actually gets picked off very quickly over there. It's because... Shadon didn't even necessarily know. Like, he sees the sentries there, sure. Maybe it was a mistake that he let that shade finish, but maybe he was also just thinking, like, okay, well, maybe I can at least kill one or two probes here because there shouldn't be a shield battery or anything. There's no shield battery. The Oracle moving back home for Shadon, I actually think it was, like, a really cool decision. But, man, that uh, that counterattack, that setup there was such a great decision there for Mana. He executed that counter really, really well. Yeah, I also think it's super cool that getting a couple centuries is actually anti-Oracle tech now because they don't get popped <laughs> by Oracles and they shred all the shields. So half the damage goes away. And, you know, Oracles, they got a decent amount of shields. They don't have a lot of, they don't actually have a lot of hull. It's, it's pretty cool to see this matchup evolving in real time. But for now, an opportunity to watch the match evolve continues because game two is on site Delta. We're ready to go. And in the upper left, in the blue, he's up one off a really cool rip stay from whenever Shadon wanted to go for for the proxy Stargate. For Team Liquid, it's Mana. And down here in the bottom right-hand side of the map, we have the red Protoss player. He is Shadon. Platinum Heroes. All right, uh, cool game number one start. And game number two, we get to move on to Site Delta, which is a fun map for PvP because we oftentimes get to see the differences and how players decide to approach it. If they're gonna go for that good old low ground gateway wall off, if they're gonna gateway wall off with two gateways, if they're gonna go for a fast nexus, if they're gonna start off a zealot. I always love the start of these kind of uh, PvPs on this kind of map where you have that high ground. There's actually some interesting decisions to make. I love, by the way, uh, Mana with the probe trying to be annoying, delay the cyber core going down a little bit. Just didn't quite pull it off. There's just so many spots that you can drop the cyber core. It's not like there's, you know, when you're trying to put a base, there's one spot you put a base in. So it's not really able to deny it, but it slows it down for a second. And it's cheeky, right? It's fun. I do think it's interesting that we're seeing Shadone go two gate openers. So what this tells us, because 
well mana is going single gate expand on the low ground what this tells us is Shadon is probably going to drop a robo or a gateway go for stargate something if your opponent goes single gate expand and you go two gate on the high ground you are behind by default you are behind if you do not go kill your opponent it just it's how it is so question mm. now is how does Shadon look to respond it's going to be a stargate response hmm interesting yeah stargate and it's kind of funny because Shadon also on the way out scouts out and sees that mana is also going for that stargate as a part of the wall in oh did he did he make it his way far was that far enough up the ramp to confirm if there was no nexus yet i mean, I, mean hmm. Hmm. I i don't think it was but i also don't know if it's going to matter too too much i mean only real difference there is that mana maybe invested in like an extra stock or something before the the nexus or something along those lines i don't think it's going to matter too too much the funny thing is is oh, okay paired oracles here the the funny thing is as we look at this the naturals are not that different the stargate timing is not that different mana is actually down two workers because he you know committed to more on the ground a little bit earlier just or he saved up money to get that nexus and it really wasn't all that much faster so if if not for this adept finding his way on the other side where there's no defense it's gonna get like four probes if not for that i'd say you know shadon's actually not in that bad of a spot but he forces the oracle to spend energy at home actually oracle still got the full this oracle might run out of it no it's gonna kill the adept but it does run out run out of all the other energy so four probes go down the oracle totally depletes itself and at least for shadon he's got a phoenix behind this so he does have an answer to the oracle of mana mana he's gonna dive in he's gonna see what's up and he's actually not going to opt into the ground base play or the, the Stargate play. He's going to just go and build a second Oracle and he's going to have to recall the first one, of course. And this value that Mana got is kind of awkward right now. Oracle on the other side. Now, luckily, it has no energy, so the shield battery not being done is fine. But this is... It's good for Mana, but it feels like it could have been better. Yeah, I, I'm still really liking this position for Mana just because he still is going to have like this opportunity where he's going to dive in with two oracles and there's just a phoenix out right now which frankly is just not actually that much I, remember like there's not even a, there's no gateway units there's finally getting warped in but these two oracles can actually do quite a bit of damage especially if they go over to the main base shield battery is not going to be enough and four workers five workers six workers seven eight nine workers i mean this is already kind of game ending damage here bill <laughs> yeah if you go up 12 workers and you're i guess his natural is like not all that much faster but if you go up 12 workers in this game in a pvp when you have access to the exact same stuff that your opponent does it's gonna take a lot of effort to go in and win the game and somehow there's an adept in the main base too because why not eventually <laughs> <laughs> eventually it chunks through the shield battery but not all that quickly and hey mana you lost an oracle right there is that there is that but in general he has done so much here his blink's gonna be done at the same time and Shadon what's he gonna do when behind Ravi I, I I know you more than most people know know the, the response is when you're behind as a Protoss player it's the Dark Shrine yeah that is kind of the saving hope here I think for uh Shadon very understandably and you know the kind of nice thing and I'm gonna caveat this with there's a robo going up already but I was gonna say the kind of nice thing is that if your opponent goes for one of these target openings then besides the oracle they don't necessarily always rush up to getting up the observers so if you do manage to warp in like two or three dts and spread them out well maybe their oracle is already using their energy on some of the harassment or the revelations on just your army and stuff but oh uh, double kill over there both of the phoenix end up falling so that is kind of nice and like in theory hey he's killed off the oracle there with the phoenix so there's less detection in theory but the problem is the robotic facility is already finishing up at the same time as the dark shrine there's no proxy pylons either for shadow so unless mana played really really fast and loose and just went for like a mortal and a warp prism mana will have an observer in time and that dt shrine is gonna have a much harder time getting anything done i mean if the dark shrine was a little bit faster mana was supply block so we could build an or build an observer and you get a bunch <laughs> of dts in you snipe the robo and all of a sudden it's a win not gonna happen not this game and now the stalkers i mana's got blink so too to shadon but it's a significant supply lead across everything yeah the workers have balanced out but the army lead there the number of stalkers is pretty <laughs> significant and yeah dt's actually do a lot of damage but battery with the shield battery overcharge here they're just not gonna know if enough hey it's an ortosis pile on that's gonna be gateway to powered and shadon is dead mana reigns from heaven
moves on to the playoffs. 2-0 yet again from uh, another player as Mana, like you said, moving on to the playoffs, knocking Shadow now. Shadow and wishing him good luck and GG. A little bit unfortunate there for uh, for Shadow, I would say, in that series because game number one, Mana getting the hyper fast scat out on that Stargate just allowed him to get such a sick response also on the follow up attack that Shadow just was not prepared for. And then game number two, again, like it felt like Mana just had a really, really nice start there. The, I mean, the Oracle's being able to dive back in over there and getting that many worker kills, but even like the earlier damage that Mana got was pretty significant. So kind of an unfortunate way for Shadow to get out, go out, but that's just, I feel like that just was a series demonstrating the brutal nature of PvP. Yeah, some days that's the, the way the cookie crumbles, although Protoss don't have mouths, so I don't know why they would be eating cookies. Uh, anyways. I guess Mon is the one eating the cookies that are crumbling it apart. We got, we had a PvP. It was pretty quick. Uh, Ravi, before we go to a break, I have a very important question. Because we yeah. are going to be moving. If we take a look at moving into our second half of Europe now, it's going to be Young Yakov and Bly. Now, this last series we had was a grand total of a... Mm. Okay, let's see. Let's do them. It was seven minutes. Grand total of 12 minutes for that PvP. Young Yakov and Bly. Over under seven, or over under 12 minutes. Oh, Over. Because if, okay, if Bly just like stomped over young Yakov, then I think that maybe the series could be under 12 minutes. But if young Yakov is winning, I think Bly will stick around long enough, even if he's dead. You know, that's actually <laughs> a really good point. <laughs> so, you know. All right. Well, four minutes until a match that may or may not last longer than 12 minutes. I don't know, but it's up for us to find out. So. See y'all in four. You love it, you wear it, wear it. Wear your passion. <laughs> Share your passion. Wherever. Whenever. Yes. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Ravi has said that this next matchup, this ZVZ between Bly and Young Yakov, is going to last longer than 12 minutes, which is the total game time that Mana needed to go take down Shadon. You know, Ravi, before we get into this game, I know you made a really good point about how Bly just doesn't leave games, but, but, I'm going to give you one more opportunity. Is it... Okay, so it's not going to be less than 12 minutes. Is it going to be less than 20 minutes? Okay, 20 minutes is a lot more reasonable because I, I just think six minutes for a game is unusually short. Even for a Bly game, I think that is like on the shorter end. So I think 20 minutes... It's like if it ends up being a 2 0, 10 minutes per game, like that's very, very reasonable. I think I would, I wouldn't say I'm like confident about that, but that's like a, that's like a, a wager I would take. Gotcha. Okay. Well, you know, I guess that's the important thing. We got a channel point prediction going on. A lot of people seem to think that, ooh, I didn't look at it. I just saw that there was, it was 772,000 points, 261,000. And I'm like, okay, people are, Cheering for people think Bly's going to do it, right? Because Bly's the more established name, you know? He's had good runs. He's looking pretty decent here in in the regional. No. 75% of people think that Young Yakov wins this series, which I, I don't hate. I think Young Yakov is pretty good, but that was mm -hmm. not my expected result before I clicked on the thing. I, I really could have seen him going either way because I feel like even though Young Yakov maybe gets slept on, I think that Bly is a player that it's kind of like a Haas in a lot of ways, right? Where some people really believe in his power and some people are just like the biggest doubters ever. They see some Bly series and they're like, man, that looked really, really silly and sad. And then they just don't believe in him when he's going to absolutely somehow demolish like some kind of turnaround against an established player. That's the fun about Bly, man. That's the fun. That is pretty fun, but his protege. The mini Bly, as it were, in the upper left for the Platinum Heroes is Young Yakov. And down here in the bottom right-hand side of the map, we have the Blue Zerg player. He is the OG Bly. All and right. funny enough, it is already uh, Young Yakov that is going to start off with that pool first and everything, whereas Bly is going for the hatch gas pool. Yeah, it's actually 15-15 here coming out of, of Young Yakov. It keeps you safe from a lot of stuff. We talk about this, you know, mm -hmm. we, we talked about this a lot when Eric played yesterday, uh, because this is the Eric opener, right? 15 hatch, 15 pool, you gas cancel twice. You do lose a little bit of money. Um, actually, I think you only gas canceled once here this time. Um, but what this does, first of all, it keeps you really safe against a lot of different potential aggressive options. But what it also does is it looks for the most part like a standard hatch gas pool. It's a little bit faster, which you got to do as the scouting Zerg players. You look at where the creep is and you compare your creep to their creep. And if it's a little bit further developed, you can see, okay, well, this was clearly was a quicker hatch. But again, not only does it go and keep you safe against stuff, it unlocks early aggression. Here's the thing to, put, to pay attention to, though. Young Yakov getting his <laughs> gas just now. These lings are going to run across the map. Mm. They're going to put some pressure on. But Young mm. Yakov is not committing to this. This is a feint. It, it might get some damage done but he still has designs on a mid game. Again, the gas is so very late. And final thought here, plus one melee before speed coming out of Bly. Trying to, he does not want to get this get scouted. He's going to block the ramp for now. And it looks like he's going to be able to make sure that happens. So young Yakov, he runs across. Oh, he gets in. Is he going to be able to see the Evo here? This is actually, this is almost the game right now. If you see the Evo, he does. He knows it's researching. <laughs> Here's the question though, Ruby. If you're young Yakov and you scout what's happening, do you think that this is plus one melee? Do you think this is plus one carapace? Because they're very different builds. I don't know, man. Like, trying to predict anything with Bly is so difficult because Bly is also the kind of player that would, like, cancel them and throw down a third and then go for, like, a three base all in um... or something. Like, so he. Bly is just so out there sometimes. I feel like it's very difficult to call and predict. I, yeah. Your dragon, I think you just have to play a little bit safe though. If you're dragon, it's plus one melee. First hunter gas. Layer, second hunter gas. There's still no speed on the way. And it's plus one melee. 
thought it was a very fun thing to point out. I'm really curious if this is going to go into like a Nidus or something. I got it. Right? Quick like Lair. Like a slowling Nidus. Quick Lair, quick plus one. It's for quick. He's rushing up to Ultras, Revy. This is the oft see. This is the never seen before. Two base ultra timing. Where is this drone going? What is happening? Fly. Okay, there. He starts link speed and then cancels it. And the layer's finishing is the overseer. I'm like, wait, I'm, I'm staring so hard at that production pad, guys. <laughs> I'm just sitting here waiting for the other shoe to drop because, like, we talk about blind and we talk about how he is. Okay, he's going. Muta makes a lot of sense. Plus one melee mutas is a pretty good way to play. But you do kind of need speed. There is speed on the way. I, okay. I cannot believe we're sitting in this game where plus one melee is done before speed starts. And you so, spend... okay, here's here's my thought. I don't know if this is the case. Obviously, you'd have to just ask Bly afterwards. Is that Bly was intending to go for the big link middle. He gets fully scouted and he reconsiders and says, okay, well, what if I don't go into that? But I'll still get a plus one melee because I'll still be able to make use of it. And then he's kind of like still considering going for something. But then he starts up his layers like, no, I'll go for a spire. Then you saw him like starting up Zergling speed, but then reconsidering and like canceling it and saying, no, I want to save this gas for the spire. So I think that Bly is sort of making some decisions on the fly. And that's why it looks a little bit strange right now. And here's the question as well. You look at this. Young Akov got an, got an Overseer in the main base. You see that the spawning pool is still wiggling. So I guess that's your scout. Like, what are you... Young Yakov gets a full scout of the main base, and what are you reading into this, right? There's no tech there. You just know there's an Evo. I think this might be one of those situations where this Roach is running across the map. Just kind of kills Bly. He's got some spines. He's got a wall in the natural. This third base, there's no way this stays alive. And because Bly, I mean, he doesn't... Oh, okay, where did he spend... It? When did he get his third and fourth gas? I think that's a pretty important question. Because he doesn't have a lot of mutas on the way right now. He's got eight on the way. Actually, he's got eight on the way right now. Eight mutas hmm. can deal with these roaches. Roaches are going to try to dive right in. But there are... Hey, look. There are spines here. They do a lot of damage to the roaches. Plus one lings are going to handle these plus one roaches pretty nicely. And I said, I think Bly loses the third base because it's just a lot of roaches and not a lot of mutas. Bly's built enough time that even if this third base goes down, he's going to kill off all these roaches. Lings speeding onto the other side of the map to try to get a rejoinder. And you know yeah. what? I think he's fine. Well, I just... Uh... I think that he's in an okay spot if he can get this third base. And I mean, remember, even if the Lings don't kill the third base and it looks like they're just going to go for run by times, if they soften up the third base, the Mutas can finish it off because the Queens aren't even over there. Nidus Worm is going to get spotted and Bly is plus one melee. So the armor on the Nidus Worm is not going to help that much. He kills that off before it can finish. Bly... Okay, here is the really weird thing. Bale, I'm going to propose something. I think if young Yakov had just killed the third base and didn't knock down the wall, I actually think that he'd be ahead right now. Yeah. I think if he just killed the third, the Muta's damage by themselves would not have been enough with like the fact that the Muta's are still popping after the Roaches uh, arrived. I think the Roaches actually could have killed the third base to free. The Wallen would have delayed Bly himself from escaping from his own natural, so the Lings couldn't have helped. I actually think young Yakov would be ahead if he had just killed the third, but he didn't. He, he didn't know that all this is happening, so. No, I, I don't hate Young Yakov's position. It, it's awkward, right? Because, you know, you're only on 51 drones. But he did... I One thing I want to point out here, and actually really important when we talk about anti-muta play, he didn't get plus two attack. He got plus one Carapace, and technically that Ooh. means the Hydra's fight a lot better against these mutas than normal, but six workers go down, Ling's in the main base and the natural, getting so much damage, sniping down queens. Four crawlers not allowed to complete for the most part. Ling's getting on top of the spores, which is how you win a muta game, by the way, against this ground style. He killed the spores. Queens are okay in small numbers. Sure, against small numbers of mutas. But once you get high enough, once you get that high enough number, they just, they snipe them down. There's not a whole lot that they can do. So if you can knock the spores down, if you can make that happen, all of a sudden, everything's dead on the ground. And Bly is getting a good start. In fact, I mean, what are we at? It, it's six queens is good. Hydras are going to get started soon. We're kind of, we're almost at critical mass where are, the are mutas they can go kill the spores. Soon? Bale, there's, he's still just droning. Bale, young Yakov <laughs> is still just droning through the damage he took. There's 19 mutas out. There's four more all the way. He's going to 23 mutas and there's only six queens. 
tell me I'm confused on the math here. How how do six queens ever kill this number of mutas? They don't, in fact. And by the way, spending a transfuse to keep that overseer alive actually is just it's already there's no way the queens stay alive, but it's actually just even worse because you just they don't last as long. And by the way, there's a hydra then done. There's not a single yeah, hydra on the map. Making anything. There's no anti-air. <laughs> I just uh, that was the CVZ. I'm I think. What was that? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna chalk this up to the Bly effect, where not only is there the intimidation factor of you're playing against Bly, but then all of the weird mind games and stuff, it's not necessarily <laughs> like that. Like, here's the thing. I think that Bly, Mio Micah, Haas, like all these kind of very out there weird players, they're good at making their opponents not look good like you we can look at this game from outside the perspective of young yakov and you know where we're not actually playing in his shoes and say like you had a hydra den there are 19 mutas and all you have is six like queens and you see that the muta count is growing why didn't you make hydras why were you still making drones i know you were losing drones but like why didn't you just make more drones you're clearly about to just like literally lose to a counterattack. but i think Bly just gets so in your head. He confuses you. He makes you feel like so out there and weird. Young Yakov may have just forgotten or not realized that he had made even the Hydra Den because he was dealing all these Ling run buys and everything. I really think that that was something that I chalk up to. Bly forced out the mistakes there from Young Yakov. Bly caused Young Yakov's brain to stop working for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, just the answer is Bly, blah, 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 But it's kind of funny you look at this as well and i i love um a guy in the chat like two minutes in the past when when the muta started when the spire went down he's like i think bly just needs to cancel everything and go two base muta and i am glad that there is at least one person in the world that can get themselves mentally locked in on bly's la wavelength to figure it out because you know i don't know who it is but going melee into lair without ling speed and getting like a five minute ling speed timing somehow that means mutas to people I want into their head, Ravi, because <laughs> sure, okay. Yeah, I I mean it was definitely it ended up being like a pretty nice decision, but I would go back to a lot of different things and say, I think if many different like little decisions had been changed by young Yakov, and again, nice job by Bly to like kind of predict all that stuff and like still make it work out. Young Yakov definitely could have, I feel like, edged out leads in there. If things, if you just made like slightly different decisions, so it's, it's a weird one, Beowulf. It's a weird one. Yeah, no, it's fun. But for now, we got another fun one in the bottom right, going for a twelve pool. His name is Bly. And up here on the top left hand side of the map, we have the Red Zerg player. He goes by the name of Young Yakov. Ravi, quickly, I'm before saying. this game gets started, <laughs> does Bly pull the drones? This 12-pull drone pull, is this something else? That's a good question. Um, I'm just going to guess no, without not actually knowing. And we have a drone just making its way down to the natural, so it looks like that is going to be correct, I think. I'm like, I think, on like this weird chance that he's expecting, for some reason, young Yakov would go for like, a scout early on and then like does this mind game where he has a hatchery building as before he does a drone pull <laughs> like i don't even know what blind man yeah all right so he's going to 12 link which is kind of when you look at a 12 pool because this is a 12 pool is kind of a macro opener it's a high pressure but it is a macro opener and there's kind of a range you, you spend the first four larvae you get eight lings you spend the first six larvae you get 12 lings uh, it looks like Bly is going to be a little bit more on that side. Hey, he's going to get across the map. But unfortunately, because Golden Ore is a pretty big map, he gets very little damage done on the hatch before it gets that plus one armor, before it is complete. So, Gurns are going to have to get pulled down here. Bly getting aggressive. And it's weird because we don't see this a lot in high level ZVZ. This is something that happens all the time on the ladder. So, young Yakov should be well prepared how to deal with this. He's just going to wait for his lings to pop out for now. Drilling really nicely. Hasn't lost a single drone at the moment. But look at that. Look what Bly did. He surrounded the larva. So, he gets some lings very quickly. Getting decent trades, all things considered. But at the end of the day, he is going to get forced back. And at the end of when you talk about it, he gets two drones. He gets a lot of mining time loss. That really is the big deal right there. He's going to try to get a third. 
not going to get the fourth low one. Nice drilling out of Young Yakov. So at the end of the day, four, he gets three links. He gets some, uh, or four drone. Ah, math is hard. Three drones gets a couple links and the game goes on. Yeah, I, honestly, I think I really like that defense for Young Yakov, though, because yeah. remember, not only is it like going to be that he was maybe up for like one worker or something for a little bit, whatever, the drone counts are going to go back and forth. It's the gas. It's That's the big thing that's very, very different in my mind here is they're both going to have queens and all that good stuff. They're both going to have like those injects. They both don't have Zergling speed, but there is just 168 extra gas there for Young Yakov that he can start up Zergling speed or he could start up a lair. He could do all that other stuff is going to be way, way further ahead in terms of whatever tech he decides to invest into. Dude, Dragon, hear me out. What if he did? What if he just sits on the gas? Like what a if college he puts fund. Three drones in his gas. It just goes up to 200 gas and doesn't do anything with it. What if? I think. Yeah, I mean, obviously there is a chance that he just completely ends up squandering the opportunity, but like there is going to be the investment in the lair. That extra gas mined earlier on is still going to have some value of like whatever he ends up investing in the lair. Like if he decides to throw it into roaches, if he decides to throw it into a fast spire or what have you, like I think there's still going to be value with that gas mined. Well, it is going to be a quick spire here as we take a look. Young Yak of saturating the world, building the rest of his gases, bailing nest on the way just to keep yourself safe, but... So young Yakov, game one, he gets killed by mutas in a very weird game. Game two, he's going mutas. Bly, much more standard, right? Evo Chamber, Roach Warren, we should see plus one getting started likely. And when you go mutas, oh, I was gonna, never mind. I was gonna say, probably gonna get plus one and go for Roach, and go for a Roach timing. No, it's plus one melee. And generally, if you're going plus one melee, it does turn into mutas. We were, of course, very confused in game one because there are plus one melee speedling all-ins, things like that. And you talk about the game state. Bly's, he's got plus one melee, sure. His, his spire is going to be a solid minute later. He doesn't have a third base. His speed is slower. So when you talk about muta wars, there are a couple key breakpoints, right? First of all, who's quicker to six gas? Who can mine more gas over the course of this fight? Also... Who gets muta, who gets flyer carapace faster because plus one plus one attacks great right it does sure fine it, but every, but the damage gets reduced every time it bounces plus one carapace applies every single time it is such a big deal in muta wars and the fact that young yakov is going to have his fire done faster technically he's going to be able to go and get that plus one carapace a little bit faster because the scout out properly well what this all means is young yakov is going to have massive advantages in this muta war Oh, absolutely. And that's not even going just how much more gas he's going to have oh, with yeah. that Spire finishing up. I mean, he is truly going to be a lot more uh, well set up because of the extra investments that Bly has in, like the like you said, plus one melee and the uh, the Roach speed upgrade. All of that stuff is going to be a bit problematic. But, you know, there is still something nice about Bly investing in that. It's, it's not great when it goes into just straight up Muta versus Muta fights as third hatchery getting canceled is extremely painful there for bly oh man he is truly just not catching a break this game i was gonna say if he can find something some kind of big damage or like the roaches or just the fact that he has double the number of zerglings that his opponent does there's still opportunity where young yakov's out of position with some of his mutas he loses a bunch of drones at the third base or something but lose i mean bly losing the third really does make that bar very very high for what he has to accomplish well, for now, he's going to try to... And plus one melee links against plus zero are a significant advantage for the for the plus one melee play here, player here. So, Bly in this case. But, you know, Fear Dragon, I got to say, I'm just really excited. I mean, look at the difference that is. But I'm just... I, I'm excited. It's been a long time since we've seen a Muto Ling War, at least on a broadcast. And then we get to talk <laughs> about how, you know, the tech of... Put, you want to put your Lings under your Mutas so they absorb Glaive bounces and Bane Ling timing. It's... There's a lot of intricacies in this matchup, and you know a lot of people don't like it because it, it turns into who has more mutas at the end of the day, and you, you the headbutt and it's weird. But no, you're you're right, Beowulf. I I've been dying for this muta versus muta fight for all of my life. I I've been like, missing this so much. I, I actually th okay, it's it's like Mass Phoenix, right? I don't want to see a Phoenix fight all the time, <laughs> but you give it to me like once in every 20 PVPs. Like we can talk about how cool it is and the intricacies That's of the micro fair. and the macro and how you develop into the game. Yakov getting supply block means that Bly is going to be able to maybe come back and then you to count a little bit. He's got plus one melee. His carapace is far behind. 
there are ways he has to play the more he has to play the sides of the map a little bit more he has to play for the run buys and fight wherever his opponent's mutas are not and the other thing you got to look at is we get are getting ourselves set up here no one's committed to spores that actually is a big deal if you find your way into a mineral line you can evaporate it you can knock it down you can knock the gases down quite a bit this is very much reliant on the two players saying i'm gonna be on the map yeah By being on I, I the think... map i'm not gonna <laughs> let you go on my side so it's a lot of bluff double bluff blind double blind type of stuff i think you're right and there's definitely a lot of potential for that i'm not gonna say that this game is 100 over because young yakov is not committing but i feel like as soon as young yakov realizes he can just take a fight because his carapace upgrade is done and he has what is this uh nine more mutas than bly i think he can just kill him I, like i think young yakov is still just realizing and figuring out how many mutas bly has but if he realizes it, I think he can just kill him right now. Well, I, if you have the queens underneath it, you can transfuse the queens or anti-air, but unfortunately, it's not really there. And Bly, you got to put the links under the mutas here. Absorb some of the glaive bounces. It's a big deal. And Bly actually isn't going to die. Not for the moment. He loses his gas thrones, which is actually super important, but he does have his fourth base up. And that's your comeback potential, right? You have this fourth base so much faster than young Yakov does. You have defender's advantage. So even as we're looking at it, 21 mute, 24. Okay, this is a little bit of copium right now. It's 25 yeah. minutes to 13. I was going to say, it's like, ah, it's like you know, plus 10. It's I'm like going to plus... credit you, Bailmo. Yeah. I'm going to uh, say, like, there is a little Ling run by over here that's very nice. The Bailings will deal with that. I'm going to credit you and say something that the players don't see that we do is the Muta skin that Bly has on right now makes those Mutas, that Muta flock of 10, look like it's 15 or 20. All right. Mm. I'm not, I'm actually going to side with you in this and say those Mutas look like a lot more than they actually are because of the skin. And I'll say the players don't see this. The players are going to be a lot better than this. But man, you look at that Muta flock for Blind, you're like, he doesn't lose that badly, right? And then you see the fight and you look at the numbers, you're like, oh, that's 30 Mutas to 10 right now. Never mind. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things as well. So run by the other side. Ah, he's a bailing and doesn't really get as much done. If you're the defensive player, your fourth base is faster. And Bly is actually getting a lot done here. Uh, if you're the defensive player, oh, well, I guess not a lot done, but he's occupying, denying a lot of mining time. If you're the defensive player, gas is what matters in this matchup, right? It's not minerals. Look at what he's doing. He's adding corruptors in this. I don't know that it's going to matter, but it is kind of cool. I think you just go get fours. Yeah, you know, you're spending drones that you may not want to spend. But if, if Blood took that fight with two spores and queens underneath, he actually has a shot because spores annihilate mutas. As it stands, he doesn't get the spores, the mutas. Third base is faster. Plus one melee or plus one carapace is faster. The mutas are faster. Everything is faster for young Yakov outside of that fourth base. So he wins the game. But I, I truly don't think that that was quite as one-sided as, as the game was. Who knows? Maybe I'm just, I like Bly and it's whatever. But there were there were small things that Bly could have done that, given how young Yakov was playing the game, that do allow you to go in and make that comeback happen. Yeah, I... I do agree, like, there are games where you see a Zerg player, as much as we talk about, like, how Muta versus Muta War, it's all just about, like, the numbers of the Mutas and stuff. You're absolutely right that we have seen ZVZs that have proven that wrong, right? Like, there are ZVZs where the Lings and the Banlings do manage to get that big run by. You get a substantial amount of damage done. Bly was actually even doing something at the very end of that where, like, adding on those Corruptors can buy time. Like, that... You can kind of take like different fights. We've seen players transition out and get up into infestors and things like that. When the numbers get high enough, you manage to survive and somehow your opponent doesn't end up attacking you. But I really like the young Yakov didn't like he I, as soon as he finally realized like how many mutas Bly actually had. He was like, I'm not going to like dilly dally around with this. I have enough mutas. I can just end the game. The more time I give you is the more time I'm going to give you to allow one of those like comeback potentials that you were talking about to happen like a, a ling run by that just kills off a base or you know manages to find a bunch of drones or an infester pops out and changes the tide of things so i really like that young yakov just went for the kill <laughs> yeah and i really do think if again it's gas that matters in this matchup minerals you're always going to have a surplus for the most part i think if he puts a couple spores around the third base where young yakov's attacking and he, or even just has them kind of off to the side, unburrowed, so he can burrow them underneath the fight, which would be super next level. With queens and spores and the muted timing actually having their upgrades finished at the same time, yeah, it's like plus seven, plus ten mutas, I think, when that fight happens. Two spores and five queens actually do make that difference there. Uh, I don't know if it's enough to fully make mm -hmm. it happen, but anyways, bygones be bygones. We have a third game, one map to determine who moves on to the playoffs, who 
Gonna have to be watching from the sidelines. Two very similar players. It's Elcyone. It's game three. The bottom left in the blue, winning game one, falling down to his opponent's mutas in the second game. It's Bly. And up here in the top right-hand side of the map, we have the red Zerg player. He is Young Yakov. Representing Platinum Heroes. Ooh. All right. Are we going to get uh, a little bit spicy? No, okay, hold on. I, you know what? My mind just took like a little bit too long to process things because I feel like we I feel like we got through the intros later than some of the other games and I just saw the spotting pool and the gas guys and I'm like, ah, it's an early, it's like it's a gas pool. And then I'm like, oh no, there's hatcheries down. No, oh, no, no, this is spicy, Ruby. This is, uh, maybe I'm getting the timing wrong, but uh, this is looking to me like the build Scarlet used to kill Rogue in the GSL like three years ago, right? Maybe even longer. This is 14, 13, 12. All right, this is, you get a, you get okay. a hatch. You get a pool, you get a gas. It it does a really good job of making it look like it's a standard opening if you're not really sure what you're looking for, but you get a very quick speed. You have, you're only going to get one queen off of this. You get it in the main base. That actually is another, or you're sorry, you get it in the natural. And that's actually super important because one of the ways that you can tell that this is happening versus this being a macro play is if the natural hatchery is not wiggling. So young Yakov, yeah, his queen is going to be a little bit slower, which means his injects are going to be a little bit slower. But he's really pantomiming what's going to happen here. Notice there are no drones on the way. He's got a drone in the natural. But again, that's a mm -hmm. fake. That's hiding. He's like, look, I'm droning in the natural. It's fine. <laughs> he's actively microing drones over from the main base to hide what's happening here. And it's just a link flood. This is it's it's caveman Zerg. It's exactly what it is and if you don't know what's happening as Bly you just die you need a Bailey nest or you need a wall off you need queens on the wall you need to identify what's happening very quickly or again you just die I'm glad you're catching all of that because that definitely looks like it's going to be the case and Bly does have two lanes that are making their way across the map young Yakov gets his basic scat off and is going to have a big smile on his face but what are those two lanes from Bly going to be able to see when are they going to be able to see it because they see drones at the natural, a full wall. Oh, he gets up into the main. He sees that extra links are being hidden there. He sees so many of the extra links as link speed is about to finish. But is this actually enough time to get up a wall up now? I, he's going to get the wall up. He cancels it. That's really important. He cancels the, the layer, but you need multiple lines. And in fact, honestly, I don't think you wall the natural. There is so much surface area. Evo chambers are not going to build a ton. The queens are right there. You wall the ramp. That's how you hold on to this. But for now, young Yakov, he's going to try to worry his way, his way through. Bly is going to try to hold on to this as long as he can. And who knows? Now now the first Evo's up, so he can transfuse that. That's a little bit more space. But in fact, the Broodlays are actually a pretty big deal there. They had a little bit more damage. And because the one Queen is here, because the one Evo Chamber goes down, there's actually not a lot of service area. Bly, he's got links being done. A Rose Warren's done here. You can start to build those. And, you know, I didn't really like it. I, I think you hold the, the natural, but Bly, he's got a better read than I do. He, he sees it in time. He gets the natural wall down. He's got a roach horn on the way. Well, done now. And he's dropping the lair immediately. Plus one melee on the way. He's built his lead. He's mined more gas. Muta's on the way in like three minutes time. And young Yakov, this build is so all in. It's easy to say, ah, he's droning behind this. He's got a natural, clearly. Clearly he's got a, no, no. You're on 14 <laughs> drones for so long. Actually, maybe even, he actually droned up a little bit more than the traditional build does. Generally, you just kind of sit at 12. But yeah, your your economy is so shot, your tech is so behind that Yakov, I, if he comes back into this game, it's gonna be a long slog. It really is. Uh, Bly is gonna be in such a phenomenal position now. The eight worker advantage. I don't even know like what kind of risk can young Yakov even take at this point. I think if he knew that it, what the follow up exactly was from Bly, and I like that he's gonna have some links moving across the map to get some information, so he sees. Evo Chamber and Roach Warren, which is going to be that kind of misleading. It's possible that Bly is actually making use of the Roach Warren, but the fact that it's like <laughs> no. Lair would only have just now finished up, like Roach Speed, like the, the Roach Warren isn't going to be wiggling and jiggling to indicate Roach Speed, and actually it does. So it looks like it is. Dude, hmm. this is a disaster. I mean, it's already a bad, it's already a horrible game for young Yakov. Don't get me wrong, but he's also dropping triple gas. He's also going to a quick Lair. This is also a Muta play from young Yakov. Well, I, 
I don't think Bly's going for Muta's, is he? I, okay, I you know I, I looked at the plus one melee. I looked at the fact that he's on four gas. I'm like, yeah, clearly this is a Muta play. But he's letting Ro he's building Rosas. He's letting the Roche Warren continue to wiggle. We don't see a fire on the way. And I was gonna say, hey, this is a this is a disaster for Young Yakov. He's gonna be so late <laughs> to the Muta fight. And there's finally the fire on the way. But you know what? It's not mm. that far off now. Yeah, it's not. But I think what's kind of interesting is, I, I guess like maybe Bly is just getting into like seventh level mind games there where he's maybe hoping young Yakov would look at the last game, say, all right, last game you went plus one melee and had the Roach Horn at the front, but then went for the fast mutas. This game, I'm going to go for the plus one melee, but also reveal roaches and roach speed and also like some banelings to make you think that i'm not just going and teching straight into mutas and then eating dump some of my gas into banelings but then i'll still go for mutas behind it like is this like some like mind game in the mind game of the mind game and then young yak i was like i'm gonna make a spire because i look feel like i'm almost dead <laughs> i i it's fair i mean he built he's building he built a lot of banelings this is like two or three mutas worth of banes and when you talk about two base setup, it's important, although Ooh. Fly may also just win the game right now. The times are on the way. They got first down. Yeah. Well, that's 16 dead drones, so everything we're talking about doesn't really matter. Young Yakov, we talked about it. You go for the 14, 13, 12. You don't kill your opponent. There's not a lot, despite the fact that the Spire timings <laughs> were the same, there, there's really not a lot that you can do. Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly what you were saying. Like, the, he was already so far behind from that. It was kind of interesting because I was wondering, you know, Okay, spine crawlers finish up or something. Maybe some like reinforcing lings pop out. Is there a way that you can hold? Maybe take some losses, but then you're muted. Like at least the spires finish up around the same time. And you could start some production. No, it's still not enough. But uh, a very very wild game number three. But Bale, I'm just happy we got a game three. I, is that the first game three we've had today? No, we had uh we had Mio Micah and Cyan went to game number three. Ah, that's true. That's true. Yes. Okay. I'm grateful that we've had two, two ones then, because I feel like we've had a very one-sided day of StarCraft. We have, but I, I man, you know what? I know I'm weird. I know most people are going to say, ah, ZVC sucks. I hate it. I actually really love the matchup. I think it's super cool. And the builds we saw in game number one, uh, you know, I, I got to see, we got to see a Muta fight, which I know people don't like. And in general, it's like a Phoenix war, you know, you, a couple spice of life, but <laughs> we got to see the whole Gamuta things. I had a lot of fun. Um, and now... Hey, we get to move away from it. We got our ZVZ. I think it's our only one for the day. And we get to move into PVT after the break. Akron, Gung Fu, Banda, which I think is pretty reasonable. I think that's a pretty even mm -hmm. matchup. So, Ravi, chat, see y'all in about four minutes. You love it, you wear it, wear it. Wear your passion. <laughs> Share your passion. Wherever, whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, friends. We got two more series in Europe, five more coming in in America later on, and we had our Spade of Mirrors, we had a PvP, we had a ZVZ, and now, Ruby, we get to look at Gung Fu Banda playing on against Acheron in a PvT. And again, I, I think some of these are, are easier to take a look at than others in terms of, like, who's favored. I think Bly Young Yakov was, was pretty similar, and I wouldn't have been surprised to see anyone win. I'm kind of the same way here. Acheron, he's been an up-and-comer for a while. Gung Fu has super high highs. He's beaten Clem. <laughs> but also, he's kind of inconsistent. So, I don't really have a good idea about who I think is really favored here. Yeah, I think both of these are kind of players. The way I would put it is... Making it to the playoffs for either one of these players, I think, is like a good accomplishment as well. It's not necessarily that it's outside of their range of expectations that they couldn't make the playoffs. It's not like they're so up and comer or anything like that, or it's nothing close to that. But what I would say is them making to the playoffs is not necessarily just like a given. If you look at these groups and stuff and you say, all right, who are the players who I, I know are going to make it to the playoffs? Who are the players who have a good chance and who are the players who can make it to the playoffs? These are players that I think are both can make it to the playoffs. So making it here to their final round, one of them is going to have like a nice happy day about it. One of them is going to be a little bit sad. It's obviously a little unfortunate. That's the nature of competition, I guess. But I think that both of these players, like you said, it's going to be like a relatively even match. I'm super curious to see how this is actually going to end up going. And I feel like Aquaron already had like a one TVP that was a little bit unfair because it's like you face off versus Showtime. How much do you really get to show your best games versus Showtime? It's really, really tough. But versus Gung Fu Banda, I hope that we get to see like, you know, the, the peak Aquaron as right now we're seeing the players both saying that they're ready, but it's currently matching you versus the referee. So. Uh, I think I am a very good StarCraft. I, I think I'm a very good Terran player. And I think I can beat down a referee. And I think that's actually what... The, I think that's what the people are here for. They don't want to see Acheron and... Okay. No, that'd be too high quality. We're here to get down <laughs> stuck in the mud. You know? And actually, we did get stuck in the mud for... You know, for the Night Phoenix series and also for the Bly series. We got all the weird stuff. But yeah, no, it's going to be interesting. Gung Fu Banda, of course, falling down to Harstim, but taking down Bly. You know, Bly's already in the playoffs, so that means that Gung Fu Banda, if he can beat off playoff bounds player, technically, technically, he's going to be in the playoffs. And also, that's just a really good comparison because Bly, he beat Acheron. Gung Fu Banda beat Bly. Process of elimination here. Gung Fu Banda is going to beat Acheron. Got it. We'll see, man. Sometimes things work out like a like a pokemon triangle of who beats who my my favorite my pokemon starter triangle is one of my favorites in starcraft with players well when players do things like in the bottom right for the platinum heroes in the red his name is acheron and over here in the top left we have the blue protoss player he is Gung Fu Banda. Getting representing at Team Berserker Esports. That's funny, uh, Fear Dragon. You talk about, you know, the, the, the counter triangle in Pokemon, the starter, whatever it is. Um, because I, I'm not a Pokemon guy. I, I, I know this is Cardinal Sin. I'm sorry. I wasn't allowed it growing up. It's my mistake. Um, but it, that's a lot more positive than what you see in traditional sports. Because generally, when you're like, player A beats player B, beats player C, beats player A, or you know, D, D, E, F, whatever it is, and you get that circle going. They don't call it the Pokemon starter triangle. They generally call it just the circle of suck. And that is, <laughs> I appreciate that you're being much more positive in this game. And, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe more respectful to the players than what you see in the kind of traditional sports fans. Now, here's the problem though. Acheron is not being respectful for Gunku Banda in this game. He's going for the eBay block very early. And that's just been the story today. Whatever these players can do to make their, their opponents uncomfortable, they're going for it. Yeah, it's actually a good point today. Really has been filled with a lot of ways that players can make sure that you your normal standard build order is thrown off. Even if it's not in the most extreme ways every single time, it's always in some kind of subtle way. They're trying to do something to throw your opponent off. And engineering bays blocks have certainly been one of the most annoying things for Protoss players to deal with. Gung Fu Banda is not pulling probes. Instead, it just went for that first Zealot. Is gonna rally that down to the natural. 
and is going to have to play things out to the kind of uh, the other Protoss way, which is grab both your gas geysers, just deal with the fact that you're going to be getting up additional tech and other things a little bit faster than you otherwise would have. Of course, for Acheron, this does slow down his command center quite a bit. He's going to have to build that on the high ground because the Zealots and Adepts can run across and that can be a bit annoying. But okay, so this STV here, is this just for a rescout? Or does he want to proxy something? Is this going to be like a proxy starport? Hmm. Good question. I mean, we have a, like first Hellion coming out alongside the Cyclone. So, I mean, it's nothing too, too crazy, but it is an interesting idea is if there is a proxy starport there. Cause yeah, exactly. Like you go for this and then you load <laughs> up a couple of Hellions, go for the Hellion drop. I haven't seen this for a while, but it looks like we won't see it today either. Cause SCV is going to get found. What an incredible scout there from Gung Fu Band. Okay, hold on. What did Gung Fu Banda see that made him send a stalker out like that? He saw the SCV. He had, he had a probe just watching the uh, SCV idle back and forth. And it's worth checking. It's like, yeah, is he going to proxy? I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit more likely because, again, this was eBay. So you're going to be a little bit more aggressive. And there's less likely to be a wall of the natural because, you you know, just because there's maybe less pylons and it's a little awkward. So you can be a little bit more uncomfortable. So it's just worth checking. What's weird to me, though, as we take a look at what's happening in this game, Acheron, I mean, look, at he, he's built three Hellions in a Cyclone. He was building out of the reactor, building a Cyclone and a Hellion first out of this. So it slows down the four Hellions, which is, again, you want four Hellions. They load up into a medevac, three Hellions, one shot of probe. So you just, again, it's all about this. You have one buffer, but it's all about getting the one shot potential. And it's just, a, it slows it down just a little bit, granted. Starport had to be re remade back at home. That is another problem. And he's going to go for it anyways, right? He's got a medevac just about done. The Hellions are on the map. And this hallucinated Oracle. I wonder what this does to Acheron's brain. Does it twist it enough? Hmm. I mean, I feel like you're going to see just the lack of other units. Like, you don't see a siege tank. You are going to see, like, maybe just the one, like, the, the one Cyclone. You're going to be wondering, okay, what... Well, what has that factory been up to this whole time? So I think it's something you still kind of try to prepare for a little bit, but he also has the wall up at the front. So he knows that unlikely to see the medevac coming in or say the Hellions just running into the natural. You just prepare for that a little bit with a wall of the units. And then yeah, three stalkers to push back the medevac. So Gung Fu Banda doing a really, really nice job of the defense so far. It's funny. This has been, oh, okay, well, he's going to find his way. Hellions are going to try to dive in and, and three Hellions, they do one shot probes. They get really good if they get good lineups it's a lot of dead workers and generally we'd say that this hellion drop is really good against a bunch against a blink opener as well it's dead uh but generally it's really good against blink openers right because stalkers without blink are just kind of slow but acheron i mean everything's going wrong here for him in game number one he doesn't get his proxy off he loses the medevac i, I don't even think he got a single probe yeah gunky no. banda's playing a perfect game ravi not a single worker's got not a single unit's died Unfortunate for Aquaron because Gung Fu Banda, like you said, now has Blink, which is one of the best abilities in the game for not losing units and just continuing a perfect game. He's going to find an opportunity to blink up into the main base where there are no siege tanks right now. Okay, sorry. There's a siege tank. It's a siege tank that rallied out to the natural. Stim might get canceled here. I mean, good news, if you want to talk about it like that, is the fact that Stim only just got started, so it's not like a 75% yeah. done Stim that really screws your timing up. So there is that as, oh, Gunkabanda, you lost a stalker, bud. We lost, we lost the storyline. <laughs> no longer a perfect game, just a near perfect game. Oh, so unfortunate. Gung Fu Banda clearly hating himself right now. No, I think. Gung Fu Band is going to be absolutely thrilled with how this game has been going so far now. Banshee over here behind the mineral line. This could be a bit annoying. There's no shield bat or anything back over here. It's just a lot of gateways being constructed, but a couple stalkers warping in. That should be more than enough to push this uh, Banshee back, but even a recall coming on out is kind of surprising. Yeah, no, he... Oh, Observer. Yeah. Mm. And the interest... There's no, there's no cloak. There's Banshees. No. There's cloakless Banshees, and... Acheron's going to turn this into a push behind it. Yeah, Stim is very far delayed. I I mean, very far. It was canceled like, what, 1% complete, but it is delayed. This is still a powerful army. You bring the Banshees together, it's four tanks. That's a lot. The problem is, 
Gunk Fabanda knows that there's going to be some follow-up here because he's so far ahead. So he didn't go straight into Robo. No, he got charged very quickly. He had it on his yeah. gateways before adding in the Robo Bay. And a bunch of charge lots against an unstimmed army against tanks like this. I, this is just not going to work. <laughs> the tanks are going to die too quickly. You got to run away. But even running away against this army is a blink and charge. The Marines don't have stim. There's no way out of here. He just... Acheron is kind of dead. It, not kind of. He is very dead in this game, number one. Nothing's working. Yeah, love the focus fire, by the way, with the forward blinks. The Zealots were going after the Marines because they were the closest units, but the Stalkers were blinking and target firing down the Siege Tanks because they know if I kill those Siege Tanks, then everything else is going to fall. It's not just going to be me getting a lead. I get to actually end the game and move into game number two with a 1-0 lead, and that's exactly what he's going to get to do. Really, really well done there by Gongfu Banda, just swatting down everything Acheron was trying. Sometimes, you know, a little bit unlucky there with the uh, the scouting and stuff on that proxy starport, but also just the actual followed up attempt with the medevac drop, getting completely swatted away, the Banshee drop, or sorry, not the Banshee drop, just the Banshees getting completely swatted away, the timing of charge and everything coming in just in time for that push. Kung Fu Bandit had all of his ducks in a row. Man, imagine a world where you could drop Banshees. I'm That's a mad. little bit concerning to me because the <laughs> idea of a Banshee not even needing to research Hyperflight Rotors, but it truly just grabs a Banshee and then boosts away. Like, that is terrifying to me. I think I think this should be... I think Medivac should be able to load up other Medivacs. And you just have one, like, a Russian doll Russian doll Medivac that has, all, <laughs> that has your entire supply in it. It's like, you can do drop the main base or you just lose your entire army. I think that is a great idea. I think that is... um. We need to go for that uh, fear dragon. I think that is that is the balance change the StarCraft needs. That that is truly what we need because nothing would be better than a Terran player who loses track of their medevac having loaded up another medevac that had a medevac of Marines inside. I'd love it actually, like the the image of a Terran player who's evacuating their big dune drop of like four or five medevacs in the main base. And they're just frantically clicking all the Marines in the medevacs. But then the medevacs are also loading the other medevacs. And then the stalkers blink four. They just kill one medevac. Kill all four of the medevacs and every single Marine with one blink. Yeah. You know what? I'm on board with that. I'm, I'm okay with this change. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, you might lose your main base to 170 supply that, or 150 supply that somehow is in one medevac. Or you just win the game. I Look, some of the best moments. Is, like, I think back to Pulp Bomber catching the medevacs on the side of the map and winning the game off of it. We've had some great times where medevacs get sniped, and this is just giving. It's important when you talk about an esport to have the flashy moment, and we're just enabling the flashy moments. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, man, but not today, apparently. Well, not today. We're not going to have to worry about that, and neither will Acheron as he head in a game or two on uh, Oceanborn. And the upper left, he's down a game. Unfortunately, every single thing that he wanted to go for got scouted, got countered, got dealt with. But it's another day, it's another game, it's another map. In the upper left, it's Acheron. And over in the bottom right-hand side of the map, we have the blue Protoss player. Currently setting up 1-0. He is Gung Fu Banda. Berserker Esports. Hey. Hey, Wolf. Yeah. Do you think that Gung Fu Banda is Kung Fu Panda in German? I've never thought about it. Did, did you hear Ben DeMuslim saying that the other day? No, I didn't. I was uh, probably in a, on a plane. <laughs> oh my God. I was losing it when he said that. I was, <laughs> I was watching Roddy's co-stream too for that. <laughs> he was, Roddy just went off on him. Oh my God. I, I you know, I'm, I'm a little excited, I guess, to look back. Uh, to get, like pull up the VOD of, of Roddy's co-stream today and see what his thoughts are on loading up all the medevacs into one medevac. I think he's going to have oh, some God. really good insight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, always a good time as uh, there are those wonderful coasters. I think even Up a Tree was uh, co-streaming like North America yesterday and stuff. So definitely worth checking out if you guys are ever interested in getting some extra takes and whatnot on these uh, wonderful ESL days. So big shout out to them. You can find them, most of them in like the StarCraft category and whatnot on Twitch. But with all of that being said, Balemulf, that first game, that was 
Acheron had just like a really rough start. All right. So I'm, I'm hoping the game number two, Acheron doesn't have that kind of start and we get a slightly closer game because that last game was a little bit of a, a bopping in. Yeah, but it's one of those things as well where like, I don't think we can really hold this against Acheron. You know, he goes, he's, he gets the eBay block off, sure, but Proxy Starport mm -hmm. gets scouted. His stim gets canceled. Everything goes wrong. It's just, it was a comedy of, it's hard to even say errors, but just, just the sequence of, unfor a series of unfortunate events. Well, books worth actually. And it's like at a certain point, the game's over. You're just trying desperately to stem this tide of, of snowballing and it's just not going to happen. It's a new day. It's a new game as the probe is just trying to, I mean, it's cute. There's nothing that's trying to go in afterwards, but maybe you can hide it. And <laughs> this bit of mine it doesn't really want to burrow because you don't want to kill the probe here. You want to deal with maybe uh, an adept that's going to run across. So Kung Fu Banda just delaying that burrow for the time being. Now, Acheron... It's pretty much what he did in game number one. Now, he's not trying to proxy, but it's still Barracks, Double Gas, Factory, then into a Command Center. The Gunk Banda, this looks like a blink opener for now, but it's just a more stable setup, right? You know, Archeron, he's still going for a drop, but he's not already had to deal with two problems before the four minute mark. No, that is definitely very true. And I think that is exactly what I'm very hopeful for about this next game is Moving into game number two, Akron doesn't have a terrible start. He has a normal start. And this really is just like the brutal thing about StarCraft is it is sometimes a game of snowballs. You get an advantage and that advantage makes it easier to find more advantages. And then that garners more advantages, which makes it easier to find even more advantages. So sometimes you can look a little bit silly because things go wrong early on in the game. And if you started off on even footing, you wouldn't really look nearly as silly. Now, Seeing this drop coming across the map is a nice little scout out there for Gunfu Banda. And he gets out alive with the Adept, can heal that up with a shield battery. That's going to help out a little bit with uh, defending this little third base pylon. Yeah, I do like this pressure, right? It, it's mm -hmm. probably not going to do a ton, generally, if the Protoss player is paying on top of things. But yeah, if you're, you catch a Stalker off, you can go kill a Stalker, you can go snipe a pro, but Cyclones do a lot of damage. But Acheron is still committing to this slightly off normal setup. You know, game one of his Hellion drops that just went awful. <laughs> we were listing the, the series of unfortunate events and, and totally forgot the fact that four Hellions died in the medevac and we got nothing done. Game two, he's going for Banshees this time though. It is gonna have Cloak. You think this gets what it wants. Blink's gonna be done and Robo's gonna be done. So there should be an observer that can handle this. I don't feel like I see these these Cloaked Banshee plays often getting something done. Yeah, it's it's okay. I have two minds about it. One is that in the it's like there's two mind games or meta games going on. There's one which is if you are a Terran player and you are looking to try and win a series, I actually am kind of like with you. I feel like I rarely end up seeing these uh, like Cloak Banshee plays actually doing very much, almost ever. But in the grander scheme of like the Terran armada of players across the world, trying to make things happen against Protoss players, I like that they do it every so often because it keeps Protoss players honest a little bit. It like puts it in the back of their mind every so often, like this is possible. Some Terran players are so crazy, they'll go for these Cloak Banshee openings. And it's just, it's like important in the grander scheme, even if it doesn't win very often and, so I'm, I mean, I'm with you but i'm i don't know how i feel about it on a game two either yeah when your tournament life's on the line also acheron is very concerned he's got the banshees on the map he's dropping missile turrets he is he doesn't know what he's worried about but he's trying to cross his eyes dot all of his teasers make sure he does not die to a counterattack that uh, dts don't run in and do something and as he runs across the map theoretically these dts that don't exist uh, you can scan for them, right? So he's making sure he's, he's, I guess he's okay with that. But for now, he's got a bunch of tanks. He's got the Banshees going in. This is pretty much what he tried to do in game number one, except without a fail drop, without these pit stops to make mm -hmm. something else happen. And, and he's got a bunch of workers here. The drop, the push through the middle, a Colossus is going to be on the way, but it's not there yet. And these three tanks, they one shot Colossus. It's a big, powerful army that he's got. And at this point, okay, Immortals are going to get on top of the tanks. So he's not target firing their Colossus down. Since trying to get the Stalkers, if you dive with the Banshees on top of the Colossus there or the shield battery or something, I think you kill the army. Instead, he's just, okay, fine, you know, the push didn't really work, but I'm going to kill 10, 11, 12 probes. My Banshees Where's are still alive. Turn? I guess that's the calculus. 
But if you add the Banshees to that army, I think Acheron is able to win that fight. Yeah, it maybe I, I can maybe see that. I feel like it's still going to be really tough because the Banshees are just going to get killed very, very fast by those Stalkers, right? Because they are, they're going to be not in melee range or anything, but Banshees don't exactly have a crazy, crazy range. So I don't I don't actually dislike at all how uh, Acheron played that out. And he's even finding a sentry over here, finds an extra couple of gateway units that are on the retreat back. The Banshees are still alive in the bottom right as well. You know what? Bale, the, the first Banshee little like movement, I was thinking, man, this is not looking like it's going to get a whole lot done. He's changed my mind on this. Acheron is truly, I feel like, found a lot of value with his Banshees. He's in a very, I think, solid position right now. Yeah, his third base timing. It's, it's going to be done 8-15. That's the grand scheme of things. And the talk about how a Terran's going to get aggressive or not, that, that's actually not all that late. A, a lot of Terran builds tend to get it. You start at 7-30 on a timing. And one thing I didn't notice, but I think it's pretty cool. Generally, as a Terran player, you're going to get two Banshees. They one-shot probes that are just powerful, whatever. Acheron got three, so he was able to put two Banshees behind a mineral line, getting damage done, still also using that third Banshee to snipe a sentry to get a little bit more damage. And I love that stalker position. He's aware that, okay, there's maybe a drop here. He's going to try to chase that down. Acheron, he's on top of it, getting himself over some dead airspace. Stalkers won't kill this. But this is important to point out. Yeah, the, the, we didn't see the Colossus go down. That would have been nice uh, if you're an Acheron fan. Extended Thermal Lance is only about halfway done. It is pretty delayed. It was pretty delayed by Gunku Banda to make sure he had his defense possible. And now, Acheron has a little bit more of a timing before the Colossus get really scary where he can get aggressive if he wants, or even less than that, he can macro up. He can get himself on this third base and not have to worry about like a three Colossus timing immediately that has this extended thermal ants. And he just don't have enough anti-air just yet because he did spend a lot of starport production time on Medivac, sure, but also on the tech lab, <laughs> on those three Banshees. And that does slow your Vikings down. Yeah, that that is going to be something we'll have to keep an eye on. And just, I don't think that either one of these players really has to attack the other right now. I, I'm kind of with you in the sense that I feel like both of them can just sort of macker up a little bit. And that seems to be the game plan. I also will just say, like, Gung Fu Banner has been doing a great job in general with, like, a lot of the defenses and stuff. Obviously, the Banshees managed to find some damage earlier and even finding a probe that was trying to build the fourth. I do not like the Templar Archives positioning of Gunku Banda. It's at the third base, if Nyal wants to show it right now, but like, it's the third? Oh, yeah. It's like, this to me is like one of the scariest Templar Archives positioning, positionings you could have. That is just exactly where I feel like a push would just show up at. And I mean, I guess you gotta put, if you're losing that, you're also probably have lost the fourth base, which means you're in a pretty rough spot anyways, given the game yeah. state. But that pylon is, super sus right it's a forge it's a robo it's a templar archives <laughs> i mean what a value pile in the snipe of your rocker on <laughs> like my goodness yeah that's just a scary spot man <laughs> if, there, if there's ever a push that makes its way that far in i think you're right he's already in a lot of trouble at that point but those are a lot of value buildings to lose so maybe that's the that's the idea behind it is well don't let it get to that point in the first place but war prison making its way behind this mineral line. it looks like the vikings have spotted it and oh that recall is already too late it's gonna end up dying yeah did it even try to recall i no i didn't i sorry it was too late to try and recall i should say you're you're correct to to call me out on that phrasing i was a little i'm like wait a minute am i just yeah, blind yeah. do i have a weird client bug is something i missed but i do like this as so disruptors are on the way but we got warp prism speed getting started here pretty quickly for gung fu bandas to identify that acheron for whatever reason really wants to play defensively he's a goddess He's just sitting back at home. He's got missile turrets. Acheron's got some PTSD about, about DTs, man. I don't know what it is, but he had that early missile turret. He's got more on the high ground. He is just... He wants to make sure that there's no way. No DTs find their way on in any way, shape, or form, I guess. But he's playing pretty defensively, and that has given Gung Fu Banda the opportunity not only to get a fourth base, but to get a fifth base. And Aimpy's good. He's going to have to run away. Disruptors is decent. I don't think you run up that ramp. That is into three Colossus like that with disruptors. It feels pretty scary. Yeah, no, I'm 100% with you. You do not want to go through that kind of, even though it's not a, a small choke point, it's still a bit of a choke point to try and run through <laughs> the disruptors with that. Ah, uh, sus pylon. A little questionable. But I guess just trying to get some like extra scouting and maybe a warp in for a depth or something or like a zealot run by later on. Not going to end up happening, but 
I mean, Gunfu Band is doing a great job of just kind of seizing a bit of the map control. I love the fact that he's throwing up these pylons and the gateways and stuff around the map to get those run by warp ins ready and set up so that if there is some kind of fight, he not only has a close proxy pylon, but he also has the ability to just force a counterattack and man, just really, really nice disruptor control over here. He's getting so many big connections. Acheron taking some big, big hits and I think that he's going to be able to find the Colossus. That is a very, very nice snag, but I'm really, really liking the way the Gunfu Band is playing this game right now. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's weird. Like, one thing I we didn't talk about until right now, Acheron's eBay's are so delayed. His plus one, it, we are 13 yeah. minutes in this game. There is no plus one armor. He is two upgrades down behind the Protoss player at this point. So talk about, he's got a good supply. He's getting himself into Liberator tech. He Vikings were on time. He kills some Colossus. I sure. Bio is better than gateway units when you have reasonable upgrades. Plus one attack versus two Ooh. one. I, it, no, it's, it's just not good whatsoever. So for now, we're going to see all the classes go down. The follow-up splits are a lot better than the first ones. But look at this. The Zalots are killing all the reinforcements because two one is far, far superior than one, than just the plus one attack that Akron has at this point. I'm, did he just go single eBay for a long time and it just takes that long? I, yeah, I, I, this is a good call out. I'm actually not sure I missed if he was just like very late on getting those upgrades or what. But I will say Acheron in the actual army fights, outside of like I think the, one, one of the previous ones where he ended up taking some big disruptor hits, I feel like he's been taking okay trades, but just the run buys, the fact that Gungfu Banda, oh God, these disruptor hits this game have actually been really brutal. It's like the one caveat on what I'm about to say is I feel like Acheron is taking okay fights, but Gung Fu Banda is just truly taking the entire map. He's doing all the run by attempts. He's getting the harassment damage done. Zeld's running all the way into the main base. The depot didn't lift in time. So it draws the army out of position. So now this base is dead. And Acheron has already been on such a low economy. He's going to be on an even worse economy. Is he even, uh, he's mining off of just the natural at this point. Is he mining from his main anymore? I uh, kind of, technically yeah. he's got three mineral patches. <laughs> And it, yeah, he's four in the natural. <laughs> it's kind of fun as we look at this as well. It's not often that you're able to look at a matchup and say, hey, upgrades are the reason this is happening, right? Generally, it's like, ah, you know, he's, that's a little bit better, but it is so obvious right now that the reason that Acheron put himself, got into such an awkward position is that he was two upgrades down and the Zealots, he couldn't fight him. He had to have an overwhelming supply advantage to be able to fight the, the Zealots right there, which meant he had to pull a lot of his army back, which meant that this orbital, which is, now dead by the way uh had to get mm. had to get killed had to run away like he he couldn't have a force multiplier generally a terran army is very supply efficient especially with the mps especially with medivacs and stim but when you're this far down on upgrade two one versus three two it just makes a big deal and yeah he's gonna try to get on top of this army EMP's blanket everything quite frankly even if this fight goes a little bit better than you might have expected but if he kills a lot of the disruptors it doesn't matter the upgrades are just too strong and Gun to Abanda gets to move on to the playoffs. Acheron, not quite there. Yeah, big congratulations to Gung Fu Banda. That is a very, very nicely earned W just because that 2-0, he was looking strong in it. I know game number one, there's a little bit of unfortunate luck there with the, the starport and everything being scouted so early on in game one. Kind of threw off a lot of Acheron's build, but Game two, Gung Fu Banner really just did have a handle on things. He did a great job for the most part. The Banshee Harassment was a really nice move from Akron. It looked like he was setting himself up into a, a pretty decent spot, but Gung Fu Banner just kind of took the map and just took a big e economic lead that just got into his disruptors. He kind of just controlled his Lake army a little bit better. So definitely earned himself that 2-0. Uh, there's no disputing that 2-0. <laughs> I think it did look a little bit better for Acheron in, in game mm -hmm. two, right? He got damaged with the Banshees. His, his timing looked okay. He was developing himself. But again, you do you try to fight plus one, one zero as a bio player against three, two when supplies are, you know, not maxed and you're mm -hmm. eating those. I think one of those disruptor shots killed about 30 supply. It was massive. It was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so you have very, very slim margins if you're going to fight down on upgrades like that. And then the disruptors as well. Yeah. Um, it did happen, but that means that we have one more series remaining in Europe. It's going to be another PvP. It's going to be skillless and strange. It's going to be pretty fun. Four minutes. We'll be right back. You love it, you wear it, wear it. Wear your passion. 
share your passion. Wherever. Whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everyone. We got one more series left in Europe. It's strange. It's skillless. It's some PvP. We had a pretty interesting one early on. Ravi, I think it's pretty obvious here that skillless is probably our favorite. But uh, you got anything? Uh, anything in the defense of strange? I do, actually. I, okay. I have two things I will say. One is that even though skillless, to me, is one of the top Protoss players in Europe, he is an incredibly, incredibly good Protoss player. It's worth mentioning, and again, I, I think this is defensible for sure, but Skillis is at the round five match. He's clearly not playing in like the absolute, absolute top-notch skill that I think he, we've sometimes seen him where he can compete with some of the best players. He did end up losing to both Spirit and Goblin. So I'll say actually one of those was a PvP. He lost 0-2 to Goblin, which is in the fourth round. So there's already like a little bit of shakiness there from Skillis. And funny enough, if you look at the Oligulac history, I think this is not the most telling thing ever. But Strange actually has a winning record against Skillis. I think a lot of that is from games that happened before Skillis kind of ascended and became a much, much better player than he is right now. Or, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, he became a much better player is than he was back then. But it's still worth mentioning that Strange still does well. And in fact, even their most recent match was just like as long as a year ago now. It was a while ago. Like, Strange won the last time they played. And I feel like Skills was also still pretty good last year. So I think that this is still a match I approach saying Skills is favored. But it's a match that I don't say Skills is favored at like 90-10 or like 80-20. It's, it's like 65-35. There is a solid chance for Strange to still some, make something happen. All right. 65-35. Strange two zeros. Got it. We're going to get into game one. <laughs> And they have a right. He's playing for Team Liquid. Your Dragon says he's going to get 2 0 here. It's Skillet. And over here in the top left hand side, we have the red Protoss player. He is Strange. I'm saying Team Mystery Gaming, which uh, to me, Mystery Gaming, picking up a player named Strange, that was just perfect. That was just great marketing. Oh, it works out well. It's funny, by the way, talking about mystery gaming. So I, I, I've been asking, apparently just been coming up, asking people like, you know, there was that meme right about, you know, man, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? And it turns out Locos Roman Empire, the thing he just occupies too much of his brain, is, well, ancient Egypt, not ancient Rome. And, well, mystery gaming, they got the Eye of Horus right there. So this is just a shout out to Loco, I guess. Mm. Uh, I why haven't they signed Loco yet? If he is that, <laughs> it fits right in with the branding, right? I guess it's like, you know, I never would have known that about Loco mm -hmm. if he didn't say it. So I think that's that's the funny part of that, that to me. Uh, you know, I will also say as we have the proxy pylon being thrown down in the bottom left, but it is just the like hidden pylon, not the actual proxy pylon. I just want to say, I'm a little bit sad that we don't see the Proxy Dark Shrine that often anymore. I feel like they used to be a little bit more common in PvP, and there'd be like the corner Dark Shrines where you'd see the pile on the bottom left, and you'd be like, ah, oh, I think that's going to turn into a Proxy Dark Shrine. It's like, no. Now, if I just see a pile on that far out, I'm like, okay, he's not proxying anything. Yeah, I, I think it is in part that the build orders, certainly since Legacy of the Void, have gotten a little bit more safe. You can get into, you can open Twilight, and still probably have a robo by the time that the Dark Shrine is done. So these, I'm going to proxy Dark Shrine and you're not going to see it. And there's not going to be a robo in time. And you're just dead. Because that was what happened quite a bit just yeah. earlier on. That's just less likely. So, you know, there's that. By the way, I want to point this out. I've been talking about it all broad or pretty much every day I've been on broadcast. But we're seeing double century openings here. Like the fact that. We knew it was going to change PvP. We knew it was probably going to stabilize PvP, but the bonus damage to shields, the fact that we're seeing it just so consistently now and it's having such a positive impact in how the matchup goes, I think it's pretty cool. Now, where the matchup goes in a month, in a week, who knows? But, Ooh. I mean, these Adepts, they are not they should not complete their shades, not into two Adepts and two Sentries. They're just dead. And again, it, it's pretty cool to see the Sentries as an actually impactful fighting unit. Yeah, it's definitely been a fun change to see to kind of shake up. It shook up the uh, PvP metal a lot for sure. And 
we're gonna see a couple extra sentries being made but I, I think the real power just being able to continuously get that scouting information because of those sentry openings Ooh, finishing up that shade is an interesting decision there and <laughs> wow the projectile in the air we see the double kill it's just one adept left to witness the battle that just ensued mutually assured destruction right they both go in like ah last shot we're gonna I don't know why why do adepts explode that's actually a really important question it's uh it's not all adepts explode it's specifically the purifier ones so skillis ah. has the purifier skin on and the purifier ones are basically like robots right they're like all of the units are ai versions of protoss units nice oh, a little bit of an awkward force field but it looks like it's gonna work out both the depths should there we go nice target fire nice splits so two adepts go down for the price of one nice job there skillis uh but we're up on the 99 percent useless fat fax fear dragon where does the purifier skins explode but other protoss skins don't where's that slot in there well i'll tell you i have like a i have actually i can check well i, I won't bother <laughs> checking right now because we're in the middle casting game but i have somewhere between like 50 to 100 useless facts i just never made videos about <laughs> and this was number 69 out of those got it really clearly important. yes exactly somewhere between 50 and 100 but it was number 69. it was actually really it's, funny yesterday I, we... I may have i may have had like 53 facts but then i labeled the mm -hmm. that one as 69 you're right it was actually really funny yesterday so on april 20th Ooh. with all that entails we had two players both get supply blocked at 69 supply and I'm just like, hmm. I'm not going to comment on it, but it is pretty fun. What is also fun is this Warp Prism showing its way into the natural two adepts here. We saw how powerful that was. Force Field's actually do a decent job of zoning, but with only one adept here, it's not going to get a ton, right? So we see the explosion, but three workers go down. Meanwhile, I mean, Immortal drops on the other side. Far more powerful here, you would think. Doesn't really get a lot. Yeah, just uh, the little, like, heads up display thing on the the mini map was just the phoenix hallucinate phoenix i should say harassing that war prism and not actually finding an opportunity to unload as there's two immortals and a couple of sentries over here for skillis they're easily able to just kind of push things back that prism already getting quite low on hit points with the shields so it doesn't want to stick around or try to make too much happen right there it's just gonna end up backing off and i don't I don't hate that too much as a decision for Strange, but it does suck considering that the Prism on his side of the map has already been able to find a couple of workers and is still alive being annoying. You know what's pretty cool, actually? We talk about these sentry changes. It is something... <laughs> so your, your units are under attack. It's not taking any damage, but you'll be distracted for the next minute while the hallucinations are here. What's well, actually kind of cool, mm. as we talk about, certainly these early game immortal drops, the sentry change actually makes them really good against immortals right with hardened shields with all the, the shield right there you generally uh, when you're doing an immortal drop you let them land up until the point where they're no longer have shields and you pick them back up again and having this mass sentry mm -hmm. play actually does a significant job of decreasing the amount of time that that, ex that you're able to do that which is not yeah. something i really thought about when that change happened but it is kind of cool okay so okay this is very important the hallucinate phoenix comes in and sees not a whole lot exactly like the thing is skills has been taking he's had this third for a while he's going on this kind of big blink stalker immortal army with a couple of centuries or like a lot of centuries in the mix that he's who saint phoenix with because strange is not expanding at all he's going for a big charge lot immortal archon all in this is very much so an all in for strange he has plus one weapons finished up as well but it is really just can he make all the damage happen with this attack and now the hallucinate phoenix is going to see these archons he sees the warp prism positioning so he's going to have a very very clear idea of what's going on the prism for skillis went back in and the adept actually unloaded it and was able to get some good damage off that's actually really really sick and really annoying for strange Jeff to deal with at this stage yeah i don't think this works uh first of all there are a lot of centuries and i know we're talking about it because it's the new thing and it's kind of cool that's a bunch of units that have a lot of shields and not a lot of holes specifically the archons you target the you start yeah. you target the sentries on the archons and they kind of pop so this attack attacking two bases to three skillis has another has one more gateway than strange does skillis has the high ground he's got four shield batteries there was no world where that was really gonna work skillis has done such a good job of not only are the sentries really nice because hey they they trip shields away very quickly and for archons and for immortals that actually matters quite a bit but also, he's had a, he's had hallucinations all over his opponent's base for the last five minutes or so. There has been 
Strange has not pulled any wool over Skillis' eyes. Strange has not been able to hide anything whatsoever. Now, one advantage, you plus two's halfway done. Maybe you can hit a timing off that one. But otherwise, Skillis, because he has so many centuries, he just has it's almost map hacks. He has perfect vision about everything that Strange is doing. And that means the that makes these two base all ins that we saw Strange kind of committing to just not likely to work. Mm, yeah, it, it's going to make things very, very tough for him that he wasn't able to make that work because now, yes, he has a third base finished up, but Skillis is already kind of going up to his fourth base. He's been able to round out his uh, technology just by getting up the robotics bay and a second robo now finishing up. He's going to have disruptors coming on out. He's really going to have all the tools in his tool belt he needs, as well as actually plus two weapons. If he can get that out in a relatively short period of time, I don't he's not going to have in time for this push, but that will also be very, very helpful. But the first two disruptors are not actually on the field at the fight. So the shield battery is going to be very important to help keep these units alive against these zealots. I mean, this Sim City, though, is beautiful. There is so much of just a, a tight ball that Skillis can oh, just like hide around and make sure nothing happens. Disruptor is actually not. Disruptor does more damage to Skillis than it does to Strange at this point. But again, this is not in. Yes, there's this plus two timing. It's really strong, certainly, but more disruptors are here. Disrupt. He's, he keeps hitting his own buildings with the with the Nova. It's unfortunate. You know what? <laughs> it's it's not. It's obviously not great that he's like just hitting his pile and stuff. But he's zoning out the army. If that army had just charged straight up the ramp, had dove in on top of the disruptor or something, I actually think that skills would maybe have been in a little bit of trouble there. But now, as it kind of stands, this is still looking really tough. He is killing all the shield batteries. These four seals have been absolutely brutal. Skills is bleeding out a lot of units on that south side now, and these charge lots may complicate things a little bit, but I think as soon as Skills gets another reinforcing warp in, he'll be in a better shot or spot in theory, but man, he just lost all of his immortals over there. The disruptors, they really have to get some big damage done now. I mean, they got a lot of damage to the immortals, but we're still looking at five immortals here, and I don't think yet, no charge is done, so the zealots are likely going to be the answer defensively, and we're going to start to see the, these disruptors killing the immortals if he hits the shot. But the fact that this has gotten as much damage as it's done, despite how really locked down the defense was skill, he did some pretty cool things. And this may still work. The reinforcing zealots are still there. I mean, the disruptors are going to start to knock these immortals down pretty strong. But the fact that this is a question right now, and the fact that it may still... I mean, these immortals are doing so much here. Does this work? Uh, Coco second overcharge finally coming on in. and going to keep these disruptors and these zealots alive for a little bit longer. But the battery gets taken out. Finally, another one of these disruptors is able to soften up an immortal, but it's going to take an extra disruptor to kill off that immortal. Oh my God, Strange is actually up in supply now. This attack just carried on for so long that Skillis eventually ended up crumbling. He lost so much of his army because it was split up between his main, his natural, and his third. And Strange actually ends up winning that game that it looked like Skillis had in the bag. It's funny, you know, Fear Dragon, you were saying, it's kind of okay that he's really only doing more damage to his pylons than his opponent with the first disruptor shots. I actually don't think that's true. I think at, at yeah. those first shots, I think that was really the difference. You get, you land shots, you kill that immortal. That would have been really nice. You kill off a couple zealots. That hold was on such a razor's edge that if you just land those two shots, I think that might've been the difference. Of course, strange snowball to the end of it. But I was looking at that. I'm like, until the very last second, I'm like, yeah, I think skills probably has this. Yeah, I mean, really, really well done there by Strange. I think you're definitely right. Those disruptors did need to get find some more damage there. I really think that just the fact that the immortals there for Strange and these Archons were attacking to that third base, he managed to force field out so much of Skills' army from all of those shield batteries he had invested into. And then there was like this point in time where there were like four or five extra stalkers and maybe like two or three of those disruptors are just sitting in the natural as Basically, Strange just plowed through the rest of Skills' army at the third base. The reinforcements took way too long to get over from the natural over to the third base. So it really was just Skills fighting with half of his army for a lot of that, like the very end of that fight. And that, I feel like, was what really, really was a big turning point for me. Yeah, you know, I'll certainly buy that one. It was kind of cool. Uh, also, an immortal lived on like 5 HP, stock, killed the last stalker, and then got yeah. his hard shield back and was able to get more damage done there. It's a hard... I, Obviously, it's a technical defense, but I think you give Skillis that setup nine games out of 10, 95 games out of 100, I think he wins. 
Strange just did the Bly thing where he's like, I, I'm going to hit you with something <laughs> weird and I'm going to make you overthink it. And I, you're going to make some mistakes maybe because this is a high stress game. You got to win this series to move on to the playoffs. And that matters a lot. And I'm going to put the stress on you. You're the favorite here. You're the one that is fighting against expectations. I have none. I mean, I'm, I'd love to make playoffs. I may have some expectations for myself, but I, I, I don't know how many people went into this game. I let's see. What is it? It's 829,000 channel points to 329 thinking Skillis will win. So yeah, actually probably more points than I expected. But at the end of the day, yeah, Skillis fighting against the weight of expectations and not quite able to do so in game number one. And this means that's strange. You know, you were playing, you were saying it was going to be a two. Well, actually I said, you said it was going to be a two zero, but Hey, it's looking good. Anyways, talking about how things are going to work out in the bottom right. In the blue, down a game in this series. It's Skillis. And over here on the top left-hand side of the map, we have the red Protoss player. It is Strange from Mystery Gaming. Hey man, if you're a... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, I was just thinking, like, I feel like Skillis was still in a decent spot in that last game before like obviously before the attack and everything i feel like deflecting the first wave of that kind of aggression where he forced strange to kind of retreat back strange had to grab a third base and everything i still feel like skills had a decent start for that game so i am very curious how this the beginning phase of game number two is going to end up going here for strange yeah i i think up until the point where gillis missed about four disruptor shots and suddenly there are five immortals left and he can't warp in enough to defend up until that point, he was miles ahead. He was in such a good spot. He had the high ground. He was up a base. He was up two bases. Briefly, he had all, he had this great Sim City to wedge his army behind where he put some gateways down. He had all these sentries that I was watching. Like they shredded the Archons. They popped a lot of them pretty quickly. He's got this immortal account. Disruptors are on the way. There's like seven shield batteries and cannons outside of the third base. All of that together, is, is, it, Skillis was in an incredible position and strange. Well, it's a mystery, but he pulled it back. Appropriate team for him to be on. Exactly. <laughs> yes, in that sense. That's nah. the joke. <laughs> nah, you're you're definitely spot on with that. Uh, we are going to see both these players locking in uh, some proxy pylons. One's to block an excess, one's to lock in the probe so that the adepts can get the kill. They will. Oh my God, Is, are these adepts the shade? No, strange. Oh my God. I think he actually could have gotten that probe further away and either force a cancel on the shade, which I don't think would happen, or the probe would just survive for a little bit longer. That's, that's like so unfortunate. He, had, he did such a sick job micro that probe around. Yeah, and for now, I mean, there's a pylon block in the natural, so, oh, I love it as well. Skills like, look, okay, fine. You got me in game number one. Let's, my, let's make life a little bit more complicated for you, shall we? We're gonna drop a cyber core. <sighs> You're gonna have to go spend a depth. Not gonna get in. They look like, I like this idea again, Skillis, has him distracted with the pile on the cyber before he's like, okay, I'm going to dive in the natural. I'm going to dive in the main base. You're not going to be expecting it. Well, Strange was on top of things. So for now, the Adepts continue to try to shave in. Oh, you want to hear something really annoying? Those Adepts could shade in on top of the Nexus. Like, don't actually finish the shade, but you just use the shade to block the Nexus. Nah, he's not going to do it. I guess the shade was on cooldown then, but that's another like great thing is if you just use one Adept at a time and shade right onto the Nexus location, you can't build a Nexus. Your dragon? I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you're gonna delay that actually for so long with that. No, that's why I, I don't hate blame you. him at all for it. Yeah. So, actually, I want to. This is pretty cool. We saw Skillis do this. Yeah, for, actually, on both sides. This, we, I feel like we've started to see this more and more, right? This early, like, two gate robo. It's not. We talk about three gate robo, this is all in this timing. You just get a quick prism and you put a couple of depths mm -hmm. across the map and it allows you to just dodge around a lot of the sim city we're seeing a lot of protoss players do it right now and fun at this point we're seeing it pretty mirrored skill is a little bit faster on it but i mean two ships Ooh. in the night is that an immortal in that prism? yeah I, okay. I, I i actually really like the new version of the prism drop which is you just load up a couple of centuries you force field in the probes and you just go ham on them. Oh, yeah. It's surprisingly effective. Like, you really do kill workers quite quickly, it feels like, with those sentries. Shout out to the NA Legend Heaven for, I think he was the first person I saw do that. I don't know if he 
invented it, but he figured it out. He certainly was one of the first players to, like, scream to it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you shred everything. One-shotting. you got to split your attacks properly. But for now, three workers go down. But there's an immortal on the other side. That's a lot harder to deal with. Yeah, there's going to be an immortal on uh, skill to side also. It gets force-fielded in. And, you know, there is a, a bit of extra firepower here. So, immortal there for Strange. Oh, my God. It gets force-fielded. Out, Skillis can't actually attack the immortal. Strange saves his own immortal. That was actually such clutch force fielding. That it was also again. I've, I've been I've I've been like 50% talking about this. But did you notice how quickly those shields of the immortal just evaporated with the sentries? Like it, I'm oh, not yeah, sure, yeah. and I I'm not sure if this is true or not. But I think it, it I think it also shreds hard and shield, which is a big deal, right? That's a bunch of extra HP that's just now gone. So, yeah, I mean, that Immortal died, almost died so very quickly. But now Skillis, he's on the other side of the map. He wants to get aggressive. He's up 10 army supply. He's got two Immortals. He's got sentries. He's got the Warp Prism he can deal with. And most importantly, his Warp Prism has taken like 5 HP worth of hull damage. It's a little bit more that you can play with. And by the way, Link two-thirds of the way done here. This is a timing he's going to try to hit for now. Force fields are actually a little bit awkward. They're going to force field the army of strange in but the army of strange on this high ground is actually just stronger right now so yeah he went for it but i don't know how much i like it mm, yeah this is turning into a very awkward engagement for kind of a little bit for both sides i would say but it seems like skills is going to back up he's going to warp in some more units he still has a lot of units and he still has a lot of force field energy available he's going to be able to bully his way up with the superior army size and he's even sending the prism ahead to scout okay no he just picked the Wait, were the Adepts there? Yeah. Oh my god, was he still getting damage done with the Adepts? He That's shaded the two incredible. Adepts in this part of the fight and got a couple yeah. more workers. Super cool. He's gonna get a fourth rope right now. Now both War Prisms are Prism? very low. And actually, Skillis, despite having full HP to start, loses his. Dark Conflict for the Okay, War Prism's dead. Doesn't get the Immortal inside of it. And I think this is probably the end of it for Skillis. He lost one, both. Does he have an Immortal? Okay, so he still has some Immortals. He lost his Immortal, one of them. He lost the Prism, but he does cancel the third base. That is nice. That being said, the Immortal count is continuing to grow for Strange. And Ravi, we saw how much damage Immortals did in the last one. We saw how key that was to the attack. Yeah, the but I, I think in the last game, remember, it was a big committed attack with like charge lots and archons and everything behind it. Look at the gateway count for Strange. Like there's no, there's no way that Strange can go for some really big committed attack but he also doesn't have a third base so the longer this game goes on the more the economy is going to pay off for skillis in the meanwhile skillis is sitting there uh, getting up to his what is that i think like six seven gateways or something he's flooding out units that's going to have charge and stuff i think this is a very different situation from the last game i think so too although i'd like to remind you that strange hit when he was down a base he was on two bases for forever he kind of backed up got his third but didn't really start to see the benefit of it when he went and killed Skillis. And yes, games are very different, obviously. But, you know, Strange was in a was in a similarly rough spot in game number one and was able to make it happen. For now, though, Skillis, he's got his plus one halfway done, adding in charge. This time, there's a big difference. He's getting the Templar Archives. He will have Archons to respond to the Archons. Those big force field walls that caused all the problems at the start of the hold for Skillis in the previous game, they're going to get popped now. They're going to be managed. And actually, I... That actually, I think, is going to make a pretty big difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. What is Strange's kind of longer-term game plan here? So he is getting... Okay, he's getting up his own Temple Archives. He's going to have plus two weapons, charge, and also Archons. So I think that is helpful. The gateway count is eventually going to be followed up there. But you can already see right now, Bamboff, like the difference in army supply is staggering right now. And part of that's the economy. Part of that's the fact that Skills got up to his big gateway flood a lot sooner than Strange was able to. And he's even getting up to 10 gateways a lot, lot faster. Whereas Strange, if you look at this exact moment right now, I know four gateways are coming. Strange is only just now on four gateways. Like, that's all he has right now. Uh, it's really good news for Strange that he has multiple pylons to make sure that his plus two ends because he, if that's a single pylon, the only advantage he had in this game was going to go down. As it stands, it's still a really rough spot, but he does have Archon, Shield, Battery, Overcharge, Immortals here, three of them fighting. And yeah, he's going to lose some workers. Actually, that's the bigger deal. He's going to lose a ton of workers here. Zealots are uncountered in the main base. Look, there's some in the natural as well. And yeah, Strange is kind of taking the fight the third trying to and it's actually not even going to work out really all that well 
but the economic damage done is the true story we're gonna see the shield the sentry battle or excuse me the guardian shield the sentry is fighting pretty well minimizing a ton of the damage so even if it's plus two versus plus one you get plus two armor that invalidates a lot of it and skillless this game goes a lot better a lot closer to how he wanted it to go and we get to move to game three no absolutely that was a, a really really well executed game there for skillless i think that he got like his he got his lead there mm -hmm. and i think again the big difference to me between that first game and the second game is the first game even though skillless managed to maintain that like base advantage and he was able to tech up and disruptors and everything he deflected the first attack there was still something that strange had and that was he still had a big army that was in relatively even even like a little bit higher army supply which you can argue is okay if you have disruptors because you're hoping to get or expecting to try and get big disruptor hits you also have like a five or like eight shield batteries whatever like game number one there was that situation where skills see, still seemed like he was maybe in an okay spot but strange had a large army mm -hmm. and he had the gateway count he had the prism he had the tech to back that up game number two skills gets into a similar position but it's with strange not having the gateway count not having the tech not having like anything besides just I think like a one immortal advantage or something so i think that was a very very difficult and uh, different game for strange to try and come back from yeah i think that's a good point right game one he was attacking got rebuffed a little bit had to take a third base but you're right he had the production there this time he wanted to take a third base gets it canceled and then has to go figure something out so the the order of the order of operations changes a little bit and that does have, have massive impacts on how the game goes but luckily that means we get our third third total game three of the day we had one in asia this is our second one in europe and uh it's gonna be alcyne for map number three so we've seen two games of strange ravi not gonna be a two zero but what does Strange have to do to take the 2-1? Mm, I mean, I would say, I think Strange look like he can make stuff happen with like his aggression and his later game engagements and stuff, I think can go okay in like, say in that first game, as long as he doesn't fall too far behind in the early game. Cause that is the biggest problem to me right now is even in the first game, things looked a little bit scary because he fell behind in game number one. And it was off the back of him committing to that two base aggression and just not finding the opportunity to make that work. He eventually managed to make something happen, but it was still kind of a scary spot. So like, I think moving to game number three, strange, if you can get to the three base economy phase of the game without falling behind, I think I have a lot more confidence in him. All right, so let's see, can he get to the three base economy? Can he maintain, can he get himself into the macro game? It's a good question. Well, let's see if strange has the answer. And over here on the top right hand side of the map our blue protoss player representing team liquid he is skillless yeah to, i mean that really is to me like the biggest complication in this because there's i feel like there's three different answers in my head about who i'm favoring right now one is the just by this series i favor skillless just based on how it's going because of how he's been able to get ahead in the games. Like even in the game he lost, I still feel like skills was not in an unbelievably terrible spot. Whereas like skills was able to find a really, really big kind of like series of victories, I guess, in that second game, in the early game that like allowed him to garner a large advantage. The yeah. second way that I would say is probably just, I mean, it's just, you know, name recognition, whatever skills versus strange. But the third way I do still look at it is, and this is the reason why at the very beginning of the series, I said, I think this is going to be less one-sided than people think it is. It is strange still does win versus skill sometimes. Like the last time they played, which was, again, was an entire year ago. So take it with a grain of salt. Strange won. Strange, again, take it with a grain of salt. It includes games from a long time ago before skills kind of ascended Super Saiyan. Strange has a winning record versus Skillis. Like, it's not unheard of for Strange to be able to make some magic happen against Skillis. Yeah, although, you know, we talked about this, that for the most part, those wins were before Skillis what became Skillis, before he became arguably the third best Protoss player in Europe. Maybe the yeah. second player offline, you know, because Max Max doesn't tend to go, but it's up there, <laughs> right? Punching himself, but just punching really up, making these massive improvements. Uh, 
week after week, month after month. So, you know, stats, you know, they say that men lie, women lie, but stats don't lie. In this case, I do think that stats are lying just a little bit. I think at this yeah. point that even though Skillis has that losing, losing record, I, it doesn't really matter. Now, we do have different build orders. I, I guess actually, no, we did have Stargate in game number one. But Skillis opening Stargate, strange, getting his natural a little bit faster, not getting a Stargate. Skillis, yeah, he should be able to get something done with this, right? But the question really is how much? Yeah, well, I mean, we'll have to wait and see and find out. It's definitely going to depend a lot on how the actual reaction is, where the stalkers and all that stuff are placed and whatnot. So uh, time will tell. But for now, the Adepts are just going to be annoying. They're going to continue to shade on forward. Man should make it through and they see how large that army is. and going to say, no, thanks. That's uh, two stalkers and two sentries. Let's uh, not dive into that. Let's just poke forward, be annoying with our Adepts. Actually getting up to four Adepts. Okay, four Adepts is the stage where i'm kind of like okay if you get four depths in the main base even if your opponent has enough firepower to kill those you can maybe focus fire down some pros but no he's not going to commit to that he's just going to go for the pylon i know he's going to try to sync it up with the oracles i think right you get an oracle yeah. across the map four depths that's really really uh, actually two oracles four depths is really solid so one of the big changes that we had we, we talked about the sentry shield damage often oh he's got time on top of the stalkers i love this this is actually really awesome now he's gonna force a couple warp in, so he's not gonna do more than kill the stalker, but this does make it so hard to mine out of the natural. The key thing though, so not only do sentries do bonus damage to shields now, they're also no longer light units. So, so it takes four adepts to one shot a sentry instead of the two that it previously did. So as Skillis tries to run down the ramp here and maybe make something happen, you can maybe try to snipe some sentries. It doesn't really happen right now, but that is something that you gotta pay attention to. Four sent or four adepts for the most part when you're talking about these early game fights, Four depths are starting to become more of that magic number. So, oh, probes are going to have to get pulled off. It's mining time lost here. We do have to take into consideration, though. Strange, he has not committed a lot of gas to anything but Blinken plus one. His timing, as long as he survives, these adepts being annoying, the Oracle's thinking about shading in, his next timing with Blinken plus one, more stalkers than Skillis is going to be able to have because of where the gas is spent, is going to be pretty powerful. No, you're absolutely right to point that out. It's... These are all very nice pieces of damage. I actually really like how Skills is playing this out, but even the Adepts, they are still useful to a degree in the actual fight. But when it comes to like a Blink Stalker versus a Blink Stalker battle, you're usually going to want to just have Stalkers over a bunch of Adepts. So these are investments and the Oracles themselves also, they are great if you can find damage, but they're not exactly as great in a fight. If Strange is gearing up with the Blink Stalkers to put on some pressure, then his army is going to just straight up be a little bit scarier than Skills is, unless Skills gets that damage done. I think he did do a fair amount of damage, which is like economically pulling the probes, forcing things around, killing off a pylon and stuff, and still just keeping all these units alive. And might be able to kill or delay the third base over here as he is able to find that probe. Thor's on a stasis trap as well, but yeah, I, I, I don't hate at all how Skills was able to find that damage. But you're absolutely right that it was an investment that needed to find something. Uh, he did get something. Uh, I don't yeah. think he got nearly as much as he would have liked to get. Blinks is done, though, so that timing is, is gone. Strange is going to, again, the, the big thing here, Strange is plus one in five seconds. The one thing that he has been very good at doing this entire series is now the Adepts are going to dive in because, hey, there's a distraction at the third. So more work is going to go down. He's going to try to microwave. Most of these Adepts should fall down. Oh, this is super cool. So look at this. So he's going to set up Stasis Trap on the high ground. Stalkers are going to blink and he says, come on, go, go fight me, right? It's going to be fine. Blink on top of me. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's an observer right there. So it's not really going to get, yeah, one stalker blinks and that's it. It was a cool idea. It's not really going to work out. But at the end of the day, Skillis' third base is most of the way done. Strange. He revelation the observer. I actually wonder if he'll, oh. he'll go back. If he continues the revelation, he could try and go back in and snipe it. <laughs> That'd be fun. But again, yeah. we're seeing the setup where skill at Strange is really, really incentivizing getting his quick forge, getting those attack upgrades. But he's kind of given up a lot for it, right? Damage done on the third base, third, or damage done on the natural third base getting canceled because, well, when you commit to so much like that, you're going to have less stalkers, maybe. You're not going to... I mean, it, it's kind of like a reach to talk about positioning, but when you commit so much that, you have less of other things, and skill is doing a really good job of punishing that. Yeah, I mean... Unlike some of the other games, these players are on mirrored kind of compositions that they're going for of stalker, like basically lots of blink stalkers. Obviously, there's the immortal or sorry, the oracles in the mix there for Skillis versus sentries on Strange's side. So there's definitely some differences, even with charge being added on. But 
if you just look at the numbers of kind of what they have skills has a third base and he has a relatively similar composition at the moment with just additional tech coming on out and i really just don't hate skills position at all i feel like he's doing okay even with the delayed upgrade yeah and the four skills are nice right they do zone the stalkers <laughs> out skillless obviously can't really take a fight right now plus one versus plus zero in fact he strange has more stalkers no he doesn't but he's got the immortal and that, that does make a pretty big difference <laughs> But as we get into the mid game here, Ruby, right? Fourth base on the way, much faster for Skillis. Skillis does have this timing. Plus one's going to be done pretty soon. And more importantly, his charge is going to be done. So what is... Oh. I love this when I see Protoss players do this. Skillis has the charge advantage. And he knows that that... And Strange knows that that is going to be a powerful thing. It's a mortal stalker. Charge lots are incredible against this. So what do you do? Do you answer when you're behind? No, you don't. You get Glaive. You warp in a bunch of Adepts when Glaives are done and you shred all the zealots and you make a pretty cool comeback app yeah i mean if you can take that kind of fight where those resident glaive adepts can just shred through the zealots super duper quickly then it can turn into a very interesting fight i can definitely imagine that i'm actually so excited to see that because i have i think i've i've seen things like this attempted like many years ago I have not seen it anytime recently, and I'm actually super interested to see how this plays out. Ooh, nice knife on the Observer. Uh, we actually saw it happen yesterday, I think. Uh, there was a PvP uh. where... Yeah, I am i don't remember who it was because we cast a, I've cast a lot of StarCraft in the last <laughs> few days, but it, we, ha we saw it happen yesterday, and it worked out really nicely. Just the Adepts, the Zealots got shredded, and all of a sudden, turned about as fair play. The game swung on its head, and especially here. Remember, it's plus two versus plus one. This is gonna buy enough time for plus two to complete to allow the Adepts to get ready. Now, here's the thing though. Skillis is much faster into his charge. In fact, there's no charge for Strange. He hasn't built like a single Zealot. It's all Stalkers. Yeah, that is kind of funny. It, it's also worth mentioning there's no, there hasn't been a single Adept built either for Strange. Well, yeah, you don't build it until, the, until Glaives are done. It's only good when you have Glaives mm. on it. You're trying to hide the tech, right? So. Yeah. Skillis doesn't convert out of it, but hey, here's your defensive response. Although he's warping in stalkers, that doesn't really help. There the adepts are going to warp in, and with all these adepts, the in the main base, they're just not going to get nearly as much done as they would like. Especially, again, plus two versus plus one, the adepts shred the zealots. So Skillis just spent a lot of money on this warp in, and yeah, he killed a pylon. Strange mm. is pretty heavily supply blocked, but he's just going to have to recall out. It doesn't really get what you're looking for. Yeah, I, I do like the decision to recall over there because it did seem like it was going to be a big investment of a major loss there dealing with that kind of army. But nice little recovery there. Skillis is going to be up a little bit of supply. It does end up losing the Oracle as it throws down a revelation. But those Immortals going to be really adding quite a bit of a punch that the supply does not entirely reflect right now. And fourth base getting slowed down. I mean, that is, I think, probably my biggest fear right now for Strange is if he's just going to get out Econ, which is kind of the nature of the game when you're going for like mass blink stalker charge lot, he's, you're really looking to just out Econ your opponent and out multis ask him, look at this. The amount of damage he's going to get done from all three different sides right now is actually really crucial. I mean, here's the problem. It, it's, I mean, okay, right now he's just lost 24 probes and that is the problem. Yeah. But Strange did not just take this damage because he was out Econ. He took this damage because he has been supply blocked for the last minute. Losing that pylon in the main base did a ton mm. of damage he didn't properly reinforce so he was just sitting there at like 149 at a one or at a 138 for mm -hmm. quite a while 149 at a 149 or 148 at a 148 for quite a while and he just never reinforced so his army he couldn't re he couldn't reactively warp into deal with all, all of this and all of a sudden it's 66 workers to 24 army supplies are pretty equivalent skillis has the gold base now he's gonna put stalkers in the natural and strange in this position where he's got all in he's got 27 workers his army may be good. He's got better upgrades. He's got four immortals. He's got sentries. He's got a depth. He can win the straight up fight. In fact, he's up in army supply. But does Skillis ever let it move out on the map? A, a big warp in 10 zealots in the main base kills enough infrastructure that he just, yeah, I mean, that's a lot of zealots. 11 zealots warping in right now. A couple of depths, even with shield batteries, even with, uh, even with blaves and upgrades, it doesn't keep you safe from this. Yeah, this is so, so tough. Uh, you're kind of saying like, it, it's nice. It can definitely help out quite a bit, but just the multitask pressure here from skill is really, really forcing Strange to do all in position. Now there is still one hope that Strange is kind of banking on right now, which is I just have an army that you can't actually kill in a straight up fight. And frankly, he is kind of correct about that. Like in a straight up fight, if you just took both of his armies, teleported them into the middle of a cage match right now, 
Strange would actually win. And that is what he's kind of banking on right now. But Skills is running his probes away. He's getting ready for the base trade. And are there any probes that have escaped for there's, Strange? Okay, there's not a single one, but he does have 540 minerals on the map. So he does have this ability to go and- Stra Strange has zero probes and 40 minerals. Yeah, he wants in four doctors. He, okay, so he's just gonna try to take the well, fight. He can't make any units. He, or sorry, probes. Yeah, he's just gonna try to take the fight. So this is fine. I just need to defend my structures. I'm gonna do enough damage, which is not true, by the way. There's a gold base. There's a lot of mining here still available for Skillis. But what he has done with his... Okay, not a lot of probes. That's actually a, a pretty big deal. <laughs> but what he has done here is he has forced Skillis to back up a little bit, right? So he's he recalls, he gets Skillis off his back. Losing a couple stalkers isn't great. But remember what you said with sentries, with immortals, with four immortals here, with the adepts, with everything else. Mm -hmm. Pound for pound, the army of Skillis, even as it's down a little bit in supply, is better. It is stronger if you can take the right fight. And what he's doing right now, taking the fight around the third base or the gold base, he's forcing Ooh. Skillis to take the fight. He's forcing Skillis to attack into him. Otherwise, the economy gets shattered for both sides. So Skillis, he's still in a solid spot. Absolutely. Boy, oh. Strange is kind of doing the thing he has to do. That's a rough overcharge. That's not going to get anything done. Now the Immortals are oh. in a great spot here. Forcefield's doing a good job as well. Strange taking half the fight. And we talked about this. The army is just better for Strange right now. Skillis, run across the map with your stalkers, dude. Just put your put pylons on the map. That's all you got to do. But by opting into this fight, he is giving Strange such a chance in this game. Okay, I'm gonna give Skills a little bit of credit here as he is gonna blink in on top of the Immortals. He is gonna try and focus fire some of them down. He takes a while to kill them. And I think he is actually, with the pro pull, going to have enough that he is able to clean things up. So, oh my God, I, I really was getting afraid there for Skills for a little <laughs> bit with some of those decisions, but he does take the series two to one. I was going to say, I'm gonna give Skills some credit here and say that he doesn't have the vision to see the probe count and the fact that Skills you know, Strange didn't have any more resources to build any more workers, so he doesn't know that information. So he maybe is thinking that it's possible Strange still has some probes somewhere scattered around and are still able to mine or he can rebuild. Going for a base trade might actually end up backfiring really hard on him. So I understand that kind of logic, but my God, some of those like blinks, the overcharge and stuff, I felt like Skills is a little bit of panic mode there. <laughs> Things yeah. were getting very scary. I mean, we had one game where Skillis should have won and he didn't, game one. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you got to you take a look at this and you're going to say, okay, well, it's starting to go wrong again. I have every advantage. I was up two bases. I had, you know, upgrade timing a little bit faster for strange, but I have all this stuff. I should be winning this game massively. I should be winning this game. And the fact that strange is making it really hard. It's like, oh no, it's happening again. <laughs> oh no, this doesn't feel good. I, I got to make the playoffs. That's I'm skillless. I'm good. <laughs> And yeah, at the end of the day, Strange will wait. Strange will fall down. But man, certainly game three, I think it was probably the best uh, best game of the day thus far. I'm not complaining. Yeah, very, very fun game for that uh, game at number three. But that is, like you said, going to mean that Skillis advances to the playoffs. Big congratulations to him and good to see him make it there because I think a lot of people would have been surprised and kind of weirded out and would have said it was a bit of an underperformance if he hadn't made it to the playoffs. So nice that he can uh, kind of rest assured there and we actually have all 16 of our players who have advanced the playoffs then right like because we've completed all of round five for europe that we have and look at this we got an asset ready to go we can talk about the Ooh. games that we saw today in europe strange falling down 2-1 to wrap it up we had young yakov i thought i thought young yakov uh, young yakov and bly was a pretty cool series <laughs> night phoenix had some he didn't win but he had some awesome builds versus lambo that i think are going to kill a ton of zergs on ladder so hey been a good Europe. Yeah, it really has been a a fun day for Europe and everything. And of course, uh, just the list of players that we have moving on to the playoffs is actually quite an exciting one. If you are ever interested in checking that out, it's going to, of course, be the winners of these series from today, as well as all the players who managed to advance out in round three and round four. So, yeah, be sure to check that out as that is going to be starting up next week. But well, we still are not done with the show today. We still have North America left over. Yeah, we got three more series. We got to take a look at actually. I can pull the schedule up because these are things we can do. It's going to be Special Anina, Disconeric, and Maples Plan Cham. So, PVT, ZVP, ZVV, ZVP to end out the day. But before we do that, it's going to be a slightly longer break. But when we're back, 
going to be America's three more series to determine the final three players into the playoffs here of ESL Masters. Well, in general, but ESL Masters America's in about 10 minutes. You love it, you wear it, wear it. Wear your passion. <laughs> Share your passion. Wherever. Whenever. Yes. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, friends. We've had two regions done. Nine players have qualified on into the playoffs. Three from Europe, or three from Asia, six from Europe, and now the final three players of the day. Three best of threes standing between us and the playoffs getting started. Fear Dragon, it's going to be a good day. Three more, well, can continue to be a good day. Three more series remain. But before we talk about that and the games that are upcoming, of course, we have some awesome sponsors. Blizzard, Monster Energy, the U.S. Air Force, ESL Shop, all giving us this opportunity to enjoy, well, more StarCraft and more StarCraft because the playoffs happen next week and they continue the following week. And then there's a LAN. Speaking of LAN, by the way, I think it's already on sale. 15% off use, if you use promo code StarCraft and you can go and spend the rest of it on getting a nice 10-gallon hat. Then you can use that to shovel all your barbecue into. I, I'm told that the hats are not meant to be worn on your heads, Rubby. They're meant as a receptacle of stuff. Like, use it like a bucket because it's a 10-gallon hat, right? I have, can honestly say I've never actually seen someone wearing a 10-gallon hat before. So, you know what? I'll trust you on that. I'll trust that you know better than me on this. <laughs> I, was in, I was in D.C. last week, and, you know, people... If you're from Texas, you wear a 10-gallon hat to, to let people know that you're from Texas. So I saw a lot of them, um, which is weird, right? Because you're not actually in Texas and you wouldn't. Anyway, point <laughs> being, I've seen people wear them. They do wear them. They wear them on their heads. They don't use them as a, they don't use them to tote water around. But, you know, we, we talked about 
going to Texas. But to get there, you have to get through today for those that have already not qualified, which means we have three best of threes. It's Special Nina, it's Disc Eric, it's Maple's Cham. And I think specifically Fear Dragon, we were talking about that second match. And in any other year, we'd say, yeah, Disc, okay, fine. He's going to win this. But you were saying you think Eric's looking pretty good. And Disc is maybe not to that same level. Yeah, I think the way that I would put it, and I think the way that I was putting it before, is I think Disc and Eric is a really tough one to call. And I'm 50-50 on whether or not I would favor Eric. Like, I, I can see a world where I actually do favor Eric coming into that. Just because I think Disc, like we were kind of talking about uh, during the break and stuff before we went live, that Disc is a player who I think has done very well in like the Americas region or done very well in the North Americas region in the past. But I think right at this moment, Disc is not necessarily a player that I look at and say, oh, this is someone who could beat Neeb right now or like beat Astrea or Trigger and like do really, really well and make a top three or top four finish or something. Right now, Disc to me is kind of a little bit more in the middle of the pack for the Americas region in terms of just, I think, his overall uh, strength level at the moment. And I'm so excited and hoping that he'll kind of disprove me on that. But I think Eric has actually been more on the up swing, and I'm actually really looking forward to seeing how Eric's going to do in this. That's going to be funny. You know, in fairness, Eric came from the up, came from round four upper. He was came from a two and one scoreline disc for one and two. But, you know, in, in, fa in credit there a little bit, <laughs> It's not like Eric had a crazy run. He two zeros Fox or he two zeros eggs. I think we would expect him to win those. And then he gets beaten by Estrella in round four. So yes, I agree with you. He's looking pretty strong. We're seeing good results out of him. But when you look at how, like you look at the runs, you're like, okay, well, yeah, he was two one, but who did he beat anyone that you're not expecting him to beat? Are you asking me who I, who he beat that I'm, like, surprised by and think that, oh, he's in really good form because he beat this person? Yeah, because I don't really see that. It's not so much the players that he's beaten, like, in this particular season. I think it's just, like, in various tournaments and stuff, I feel like he's been playing okay. decently well. And, like, I remember, for example, last season, I remember he was, like, taking Estrella to a game three and things like that. He was doing like surprisingly well versus like special and thing like things of that nature. I think it's not so much that right at this like season, he ended up playing Scarlet and like beat Scarlet 2-0. It's not like that. But I think that he has had some pretty decent games so far that this season, even though like, even though he obviously is like two and two, so he has lost some. I think he was yeah favored versus like Foxer and Eggs, so he beat them. I think he still had like some okay-ish games versus Australia, and I still have some hope here come into the uh, this stuff. But we're not actually going to that series. Let's actually talk quickly about this next series because it's gonna be special versus Nina. We'll talk about it more in a second because right now the game is getting started. In the upper right, he is the team Listeran player. In the red, it's special. And down here on the bottom left-hand side of the map, we have the blue Protoss player. She goes by the name of Nina. Now, to me, Nina is a very, very fun player, especially because she can throw out all kinds of weirdness where I think she's one of my favorite players for having this strange ability to play better when she is like fallen behind in a game then i feel like when she is just able to get ahead so i think she makes her a very exciting player to watch and sometimes i almost get a little bit happy when i see that nina like falls slightly behind in the early stages of a game because then i feel like we're in for almost more of a treat of a game oh man i cast so many incredible pvps on juggernauta um however you said that now mm -hmm. uh back in the day because back when nina was a little bit more active because for whatever reason, she'd get a little bit behind, get a little ahead, whatever. But that game would go base trade as hell. And you'd have some of the best, some of the coolest base trades in PvP that, that I have seen in quite a while. But as we get ourselves set up in this series, I think the one thing I want to point out here, or one thing I want to talk about, is the fact that Nina, right, She does, her prep is really good. I talked to her actually yesterday because she went for these quick robo openings against Eric, or against Epic. And she was like, yeah, I just think that he was going to answer. He was going to, uh, Epic was going to go for <laughs> counter blink plays. So I opened up Robo and got a Disruptor, right? Just hard countered the hell out of that one. 
she does if you give her 24 hours to go prep for something she's gonna do a pretty good job so i i'm really excited to see if, as we get into this game number one and really this entire series where exactly the prep goes like what what does she have planned for this final final series here in the group stage yeah well uh, the slightly like fake proxy reaper from special or the, the low ground reaper that was just there to kind of scare nina a bit maybe scared her a tiny tiny bit but nina ended up using the chrono boost on the stalker so still gets out of stalker well in time and kind of in advanced time so maybe that's what special was hoping for just to kind of annoy uh, nina and throw off her build a little bit with that but at the end of the day it's just going to be the two reapers poking around looking for a probe kill are they going to be able to find it nina trying to go for body blocks does not manage to get the uh the body block on the reapers from killing the probe but does still manage to find one of the reapers and is going to soften up the second one yeah so two reapers on the map not i mean they got a probe or two so that is, that is something but yeah losing the map control does be pushed back a little bit but there's a cyclone on the map as well here and it seems like special's got a widow mine probably not going to run out with that but he is very interested in maintaining map control right and giving him giving himself this presence on the map that allows him to lean in and really get some damage done because I, I think when we talked about this we talked about Eric as being this player who might be able to make an upset later on you say he might not even be an upset but if we talk about this series this is one that you know talk to Legal Act is like 80 20 right this is a matchup that's historically special has done very well in and if you're the player that feels like your favorite one of the ways you can do it is just lean into your opponent try to make them feel uncomfortable make force them to make mistakes so you're just because you're better you're gonna theoretically make less of them for now though widow mine you know gotta eat a shot damage on the other two stalkers as well ideally you get that one spot off and now the cyclones of the reapers can dive this pretty heavily at least until the shield battery's done yeah shield battery is going to be very important to finish up but it still has to actually heal up these stalkers so nina finally retreats back with the stalkers enough to heal them up very slightly and that should put an end to most of the aggression here for special just because you know that, that soccer count's gonna have built to a fair enough number reaper will pop in and get some good scouting information confirm just kind of everything that's looking pretty normal for the most part an extra gateway being thrown down so it's going up to four gateways not three that special scouted might be a little bit more aggressive than special uh originally expected but we'll see here's where it gets interesting right nina four gateways and that's a lot of pressure on the map and specials open first of all you know a little bit of tech aggression nothing too significant but he did get an extra reaper but now he's got banshees he's committed to cloak <laughs> actually did he cancel no he didn't get cloak so cloak is done he's building banshees here that's a lot of things that are not stim that's a lot of things that's a lot of guests yes he's got a couple tanks he's gonna have probably two or three by the probably three by the time that nina makes the hit happen but theoretically opening banshees like this does open up avenues because like yes there are tanks there certainly but stim is so far off that there's a lot of time that Nina can look to play around the edges of the map and pick off a tank here, pick off a tank there. There's no bunker in the natural right now. Special should get that started soon. And try to punish the fact that, again, that's a lot of gas. Two Banshees, Cloak. That's stuff that is not there available defensively. Yeah, it's kind of funny because Nina has the Robo finished, has the four gateways, which usually is going to be a big signal for a Protoss player to kind of get a little bit more aggressive but didn't really end up investing in a war prism doesn't have a proxy pilot or anything and is only now moving across the map at kind of like the most unfortunate timing which is as the two banshees show up inside her main base forces a recall so really nina has been so in the dark this banshee moving in and even though it only gets like two workers it's not a ton even man snipe off one of the banshees nina is playing very in the dark right now she is but also she's building herself into the mid game so four gates mm -hmm. maybe a little bit early but she did get the third base eh, reasonably maybe a little slow but reasonably timed and she also got double forge right one one for zealot for gateway units when she gets it started because double forge was done it took a while for those upgrades to get started is actually a pretty big deal if she's able to really there's going to be this plus one stim combat shield timing special's going to have it absolutely if he decides to really take advantage of it but after that you're going to have these one one charge lots and they're going to be I, they're going to be really good we saw how powerful even a single upgrade actually i think it was more than that but in the acheron series how powerful individual upgrade leads can be in this matchup when we're looking at small supplies uh, a bunch of charge lots with 2-2 against a 1-1 bio if you're down 30 supply doesn't really matter the bio is still gonna do well but in these small medium supplies having those upgrades specifically on the charge losses they get on top of the marines and the marauders can make a big difference especially if you catch the terran active on the map so i think that's what nina's going to be looking for here but for now a special third base not done just yet 
but he does have this push. He's got three tanks. He's got a ton of bio. His upgrade's done right around right now. Yeah, this is a scary attack coming toward Nina's side of the map. And Nina, you normally want to use those stalkers to try and buy a little bit of time, but that army is so, so scary. Nina's actually just pulled all the way back with her stalkers. It's not actually bothering to try and do any kind of blink micro, do any kind of pickoffs. Maybe a little bit worried about, uh, like, you know, those sea shanks or the marauders or something, but setting up for a zealot surround and a flank coming in from the top side is going to try and dive in on top of this army. And way more than enough to deal with all of the bio over here. Gets in on top of the sea shanks immortal. Now going to be taking care of those units. So many of the stalkers got focus fired down there for special. So he was able to kill off a large number of the really high value units and the zealots eventually get cleaned up. I, I think special is actually kind of okay ish about that trade, I would imagine. Yeah, I. It's funny you say charging down the ramp like there should be more than enough to defend and based on the supplies I'd agree but Nina took the fight a little bit disjointed the zealots from the top side hit first a lot of them went down and then takes the fight from the bottom side she hits 15 seconds before 1-1 one, one, which in fairness special did force the fight but that fight was by far better than special could have ever hoped for realistically yeah. given the build that Nina's gone for and now there's 2-2 two -two on the way there's a robo bay on the way fourth base all of that because special was forced back but the trades weren't great. Nina traded a lot for that one. It means that we talked about the high value units. I think the Immortal, well, the Immortal stayed alive, but a lot of stalkers went down. It means that Nina, she got this War Prism, sure, but doesn't really have any agency on the map. Doesn't this ability to go and, and chase Special back from whence he came and get damage of her own outside of this War Prism, maybe getting something done. So Special, does he kill Nina? No, but he establishes a good trade. He maintains the supply lead. He's got a chance for a fourth base. And, I don't think you're right. I don't think he's too unhappy about it. Yeah, I, I don't think that Nina is necessarily like she's not dead or anything bad, like super bad like that. She has good upgrades coming. She's going to have 2 2 that's very, very much so on its way. And if it continues to get Crota boosted out, it may not finish in time for this army arriving on her side of the map, but it may finish like in the middle of the battle or something, or especially if she can buy a little bit of time, it may end up finishing there, as well as even Colossus. So Nina still has a lot of things coming out her way that are going to make it a lot easier for her to defend these kind of four bases that she's got set up as well as that war prism but special i mean this push is still looking rather strong and rather scary if he gets set up in a very very aggressive position nina might have a hard time defending but a lot of the bio actually getting caught a bit early there ends up uh taking a bit of damage with some of those units and stimming up the entire army I mean, important to point out here, I love that Cyclone uh, double died. missile turret set up here. Nina's going to try to go down the ramp. Good force builds for now, but Marauders say that's fine. <laughs> sure, force build me in. You're stuck in here with me. The Colossus is dead. The Zealots are dead as well. Liberator's getting damage done. And the problem is, Nina tried to go for a counterattack. She had a warp prism on the other side, but the two missile turrets and the Cyclone, looks like there's one Zealot that got out. That's not enough here. Not whatsoever. Special didn't have to worry about it. Loses a missile turret, loses a Cyclone. Who cares? He crushes down the Colossus. Mm -hmm. He gets 10 probes with a Liberator Harass. And again, it's just a bad route from Nina's Warp Prism. She didn't know that there were two missile, pr missile turrets in the Cyclone there. And if you lose that, you lose that counterattack potential. I mean, the Terran player only has to focus on one spot. Their army is just better. Yeah, that's definitely going to be a rough uh, set of losses there for Nina. But it's kind of an interesting spot now nina still does have the double robo so she's going to be able to add on another colossus start moving into disruptors which i think her control is oftentimes quite good at so we'll see how that actually ends up panning out especially if there's going to be a continued investment into vikings there may actually end up being a lot of i won't say dead supply because we've all learned by now that vikings when they land even if they aren't killing colossus they still can pack a wall up against these stalkers and a lot of other units but I feel like Nina still does have the tools she needs to buy time, stay alive. She has good upgrades. It is a question of how good the engagement she takes is going to be. I mean, she's got a good, decent, Ooh. decent Kange set up right now. Wouldn't mind if, like, a Zealot doesn't really hit all that well. But now Special says, that's fine. You're zoned out. I'm going to force you to fight right now. Into the natural. We're going to mm. go. Good luck here, Nina. The Disruptor is going to pop out right in time. The shots are fantastic here. But the question is, even if the shots are good, does it matter? Yeah, the first shot was incredible. And the second one is not going to get done down, cut down in time or lifted up in time for that matter. And still special is running rough shot all over this. Despite the upgrade lead, everything else special did so much better in that fight than he had any right to given the disruptor shots, given the awkward positioning. And with the reinforcements, he's going to try to hang around a little bit longer. At the end of the day, though, 
Nina, I don't think she's going to be too, too unhappy about it. She forces the Terran back. The supplies equalize a whole lot more. But what she needs, Fear Dragon, he talks about the tools that she wants. There's no fifth base. Special's got four. She needs to develop her economy more. Yeah, if she was able to take a fifth base during all that, I definitely would feel a lot better about her position right now, just because, as you were kind of pointing out, Special was able to expand during the aggression. He's also been so good and consistent about just making sure he's teching up during all these fights. So I think during like the earlier push, he was teching up into those ghosts. During that last push, start throwing down the fusion core during the fights or like toward the end of it. So that is just that kind of like next step thinking that Special keeps having. And Nina, she's going to start adding on Colossus now because the Viking count is so reset. Maybe not the worst idea in the world. There are more Vikings being added on, but it's it's funny. I, I don't hate, like, I think Special is still in a pretty decent spot here, but I also don't still count Nina out of this. I still feel like she has a lot of tools available at her disposal. It's definitely a playable game for Nina, right? It's probably... In this drop, it doesn't really... Yeah, it's going to force a recall, which is awkward with when Special so far on the right side with a lot of the army. But anyway, like, Nina's... I'd say Special maybe, what, 10% ahead, right? He's, he's doing... He's in a good spot. He's certainly in a advantageous position. And if you tried to call the game right now, you'd say, yeah. If you had to make a decision, which has happened in the past, but luckily not recently, mm -hmm. you'd say, okay, Special probably wins the game. But this is still very playable for Nina. She's got her fifth base on the way, plus three armors done, plus three attack getting added in. Move on up to three Colossus. She's got a uh, two disruptors. It's not an incredible number, but she's doing a good job of shadowing the Terran or the Terran army as special tries to stay on top of this. EMP's on a lot of the zealots, but the rest of the army's here, so that should be fine. Special though, he's matching her income for income. He's trading better here, and the conque of the reinforcements are great. There's nothing to deal with the Vikings. The stalkers are here, but they're not shooting. Ooh. Disruptor shot gets gunned down in time, and now with the Colossus gone as well, there's no splash damage. Bio three two bio versus. Well, I guess 2-3 bio, but more importantly, with the ghosts on top of it, if you don't have overwhelming numbers or an incredible surround, you're not winning the fight. So Special knocks down the splash damage, catches Nina in transition, and now it's a 5 base Terran versus a 4 base Protoss. Yeah, now it becomes very, very awkward, and I'm starting to feel a lot better about Special's position in this game. Nina is going to start hurting economically, and it's just the difference in the quality of these units is really going to start showing. Nina is keeping up or was keeping up in supply for a little bit. It may even start to look like she's keeping up in supply after the next warp in, but it is just going to be a bit misleading because the number of high power quality units that Nina has is definitely on the lower side. Unless she's able to make incredible use of those four Colossus, it is going to be rather tough for her. And she has to defend that fifth base. Like if she loses the fifth base again, she just simply is not going to have the economy to keep up with special space. All right, so eight Vikings versus four Colossus. Traditionally, you'd say, ah, that's not enough. These are plus two Vikings. <laughs> They do shred. You have to be very careful with Nita to make sure that you are properly positioned. I do like that she's getting the gold versus the, the linear side where she tried to take. It's just a little bit closer to the rest of your bases, so maybe a little bit easier to defend even if it is a little bit further on the map. <laughs> Stalkers blink four. They get damage on a Liberator. Don't kill it. Here's the thing, though. Extended libera Liberator range is done. Colossus against non-range Liberators are really solid. You outrange the Liberators. You can take a fight under the Aegis of things, and you can start to kill the Bio. With extended range liberators as they are even even though they've been nerfed once it just becomes an extremely technical fight so nina she's maxed out once again but liberators doing damage she's actually gonna do a really nice job knocking down some of the vikings i would think but she's not targeting the vikings down even still wow. i guess guardian shield does enough for now the four colossus they stand strong even though she's taking damage on the bottom side even though liberators have killed about five workers not much more than that they're gonna have to reseed stalkers are there and now nina you know supplies are pretty equal but the better question we're looking at no counter to these Colossus. There are four Colossus on the map. If Nina wanted to run forward and try to put pressure on the third, I wouldn't hate it. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Like, is this a position where Nina could just start getting more aggressive? She has the Observer there, which is scanned, but there's nothing actually attacking. Okay, there we go. There's the one single Liberator <laughs> attacking the Observer, but misses the opportunity. Looks like finally that other Liberator gets cleaned up, but Nina decided to back off, and that's... That's the most interesting thing to me. She had vision of the army she just fought, so she knew what was there. She also had an observer over that kind of location, but she still opted and said, I don't want to continue pushing into that. And that makes me wonder if Nina has like some other game plan that where she'll feel more comfortable as she is taking, honestly, a pretty decent set of trades over there with the Colossus dishing out the damage and also cleaning up this drop over here. Uh, maybe Nina is just waiting to get to a comfortable disruptor count, then she'll feel really good about her position. I don't, one thing that Nina has 
in recent years kind of suffered from a little bit we saw this i think we, we saw this no position better than when she played uko uh two seasons in a row and gave us some like mm -hmm. two hour series each time nina is a more passive player uh there was a time when she was incredibly aggressive and her blink stalker micro just really solid and getting super aggressive on it but in recent years nina has kind of had this tendency to even when she's ahead when she's behind whatever it is to sit back and let the game come to her and try to win like that that's kind of what it feels like right now because you know you talk about getting to a good disruptor count fear dragon i'm with you i understand when you let a terran get to this late when they get to plus three even on their liberators when they get to range liberators in enough numbers when they start to build a bank and build all these bases and three three and all of this stuff ghost counts it becomes extremely hard for the protoss player to go take a fight unless they're you know, maybe they had some tempest or something and they're going to sky toss and that can be a little bit different but generally it feels really hard to take a fight against a terran player so nina opting into that we're gonna have to see if it works out for her for now playing around the zelnaga really nicely knocks down a bunch of vikings some liberators punishes special for being there so even as i say it's hard at the moment nina's doing a pretty good job of it even still yeah i mean her late game armor control has been very on point for a majority of this game and special it's gonna be fighting a little bit extra damage there okay i was a little worried that instructor or something would get picked off by some of the seed shanks the liberators but nina's gonna squeeze on through and finally putting on a little bit of pressure here at one of these bases disruptor shot not gonna be a range of the bio the liberators are gonna zone things out but nina can retreat back to that top left hand base and take that out relatively safely i, I don't know that there's a whole lot special can do to defend this unless he just tries to counterattack. but this is a protoss you can recall yeah, here's what's surprising to me as well is, by the way, Special knows about that Observer on top of his third base. He still has not killed it despite spending one <laughs> scan there. But we don't have building armor. Oh, this is a good opportunity. For She's going to recall. Oh, no, that was actually a horrible opportunity for Nina. She's got to get out of here. I didn't see the army from the right side. Half the army gets recalled. This is incredible for Special. Catching half the army here. Nina has to run away, play around the corner, snipe what she can. But man, what a flank coming in from Special, making it so hard for Nina to take the fight. You know, I looked at that, I'm like, ah, the Liberators are in the air. There's nothing there. You can snipe Liberators this good. But that is not true anymore. Special knocks the rocks down, but now Nina holds an awesome position. She's able to get her way out of it, knocks Liberators down, sits in the middle. More Liberators are going to fall down. Got to be careful to surround on the backside, but Nina, and right now, she's just taking, she's fighting half the army. Shots are going to be okay. Colossus are falling down here, but most of the army on the backside falling down as well. Nina rolling this fight even if this army dies which it won't she has the reinforcing position she killed two bases a special and from a good fight to what looks like a horrible fight turned into an incredible fight and nina she's up 50 supply uh, it was such a strange series of events but i think what happened there was special saw obviously he saw nina caught her in a position where she wasn't quite ready nina recalled a large portion of her army and what was kind of interesting is it looked really bad for her because she had so many units that were left behind that were also getting flanked. But what was funny is that a lot of the units that were getting attacked there were like the Archons and they were beefy units that even as the rat, like the uh, retreat was happening from Nina, Special was also like kind of stimmed up pretty heavily. So as you see a handful of Liberators going down, this is a nice snag for Nina as well. But Nina was retreating and really just like the single Archon was taking a bunch of little like pot shots. But nothing was actually dying for Nina. She managed to get back to her reinforcements in time. And then she started saying, oh, well, actually, you don't have that much. You're in this like limbo line turning the corner. She starts taking a good fight over there. And now special started finding like worse and worse trades. It turned into such a strange situation where it felt like special had Nina's just like, you know, gun against the head. And then suddenly Nina just like turned it around because special kind of chased a little bit too far. And she just said, no, you, and it's wild. This is a game where Nina has been trading about a thousand resources worse as another orbital is going to go down for the majority of this game. And all of a sudden, the Terran player is down 7,000, 6,000 resources. That is not how these late games tend to go. Generally, it's like the Protoss is doing okay, but they went on economy and there's that. Nina just killed two more bases. Special has one base he can mine from. The main base is totally mined out. Natural's gone. That overcharge is a little bit late in this drop. He can kill a base out of Nina's. But on the balance of things here, Fear Dragon, look at it. It's 500 min minerals a minute versus 2,000. This army that Special has is the last army that he's going to have in this game. And Nina running right on top. I mean, EMPs are solid, but there's army in the medevac. Special cannot afford to take this fight. He's not going to be able to make it happen. Nina catches him on the map. And Nina takes game one.
I mean, I feel like in a weird way, that was kind of like the most Nina-esque kind of game I've seen in a while. It's, I won't say it's like the full version of what I sometimes see from Nina, but it really is Nina not falling crazy, crazy far behind, but just seeming like some things are not going very well. Loses, especially like when she was losing the fifth base and stuff. She's not taking the best of trades. Special seems like he's getting a little bit further ahead, taking some slightly better trades as well. And then just something happens. It's it's not like, oh, a Serral moment where Serral just has a base that's mining for longer, has a larger economy. And then you kind of gradually see, not at any one singular moment, but Serral just gets further ahead through the course of the game. It's like with Nina, it's there is a single distinguishable moment that you're like, that was the moment where she did this. And in this micro or this tactical fight, she just got really far back ahead. And I feel like it was that that it was that fight. She was retreating from special where she was first attacked in. And like you were saying, killing off those bases in the top left. But then the, even the retreat, that's where it really just turned around from Nina finding a good trade to Nina turning the game into a massive W. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think Fear Dragon, you gave us the storyline of this game before it even started. You, you start like the first minute. You're like, yeah, I, I, I kind of want to see Nina go down a little bit because when she <laughs> yeah. has the comebacks, they're super cool. And she plays all. It, it's great, and that's exactly what happened. Nina was down a little bit. I think we said ten percent, maybe a ten percent advantage for special at like ten minutes in, just how the game had gone, and all it takes. I, I'm just gonna just another way to say this, dude. I love all Cyanide. It gives us some of the best games. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it definitely was. We're heading on to post youth, which is another very fun map. Um, are, are we post youth? I mean, I'm definitely post youth. <laughs> I'm I'm anything but youth. I'm like the anti youth at this point. Yeah, you know, feeling the bones, the fact you're you're still you're still like the end part. You're not post youth, but you're like at the end part of youth. I would say I'm technically an elder Gen Zer, right? Like you look at. The, the charts it's either for, like yeah. the, the youngest millennial or the oldest gen z um but seeing as i grew up in the middle of nowhere i'm clearly a boomer that being said one thing that is not a boomer is getting into game two and that was a horrible transition ignore it game two <laughs> <laughs> in the upper right here in the red looking solid up until he just took one bad fight and got flanked around and flanked himself it's special And down here in the bottom left-hand side of the map, sitting up 1-0, she is Protoss player in the blue, Nina. Oh, very, very fun player to watch, I think. Uh, definitely one of my favorite and like NA staples, I would say, especially as a streamer. She just has a very, very fun stream where, as I was kind of saying before in the, like, the beginning of the last game, she just has a play style where I think that she, when she is behind in a game, I think she takes risks or takes, I won't even, I don't even make, uh, mean to say like risks in the form of gambles. I know that like there are some players who you say they take a risk and it's a gamble of, I hope that my opponent isn't doing X because if they do X, I'm screwed. If they aren't doing X, then I'm ahead. So the kind of gambles that Nina takes is she kind of gambles on control, I feel like a lot of the time, or the gamble of how a tactical fight will go, or her disruptor control, or things along those lines. And it's kind of she's gambling on the ability that she will be able to out micro or outplay or out multitask or something her opponent in a moment. And I, oh my God, if she actually is able to get an SCV in this day and age of TVP, like that's actually incredible. I think Special got a repair in at the last second to get it down to like, to, to, to recover it. So, okay, this Reaper should have killed the probe a little bit faster. At the end of the day, yeah. probe does not kill the SCV, will die, but you know, I, I live in this world of what if, Ruby. <laughs> what if the SCV died? What if the probe traded his life? But it didn't, it wouldn't actually impact the game all that much, but what if? Yeah, I mean, we'd be, he we'd be hearing about how ridiculous probes are from Juanito. <laughs> Then he'd be uh, he'd have some choice words about it, I'm sure, on his stream or something, or maybe like in Scarlet stream or Sal stream or something like a probes. Am I right? Like how ridiculous are they? But nah, dude, no, SCVs uh, are broken. Yeah. 55 HP versus 50, three shot by oracles and adepts <laughs> instead of two. Ah oh, man, SCVs are broken. 
I mean, if you've ever been SCV pulled as a Protoss player, sometimes you do think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's true, but you know, I ever I think every Protoss player has that moment where they're just like, man, SCVs really are tanky. <laughs> And look at this, so special, Ooh. kind of doing the same thing he did in game number one, right? Single Reaper, not two, but just rallying the Widow Mine onto the other side of the map, just trying to catch a unit here or there in an awkward position. And you know, as we look at how this game is going, by the way, this is a bit of a more aggressive option from Special Barracks Double Gas Factory. But I, I was kind of expecting to see Nina go more for a robo play. Not that it's common, but this was one of those games where it felt mm -hmm. like Special, just given who Special is, down a map, he's an aggressive Terran. There are good sieged up positions. We might try to see some sort of anti-blink play. I guess post youth is really long though, so th there's that. Regardless, blink is on the way. There's a drop on the way. We're gonna have to see how this one really ends up. Yeah, I, I know Nina can definitely try. She can absolutely kind of mix up her strategies and stuff. She's not a player that I think is uh, as she used to be, oh. where she would have her strategy and she would only do that one strategy. But Nina, I think, is absolutely the kind of player that is not afraid to continue doing what her strong suit is, regardless of whether or not it's predictable. I, so. really, I really like how Nina handled that as well. Okay, there's going to be one. Oh, it actually can get five probes. Never mind. I was going to say, hey, I really like how she handled that. It didn't get any damage from the Widow Mine on the left side, but she tried to be a little greedy, right? Like, I'm not going to pull my probes all the way away. I'm just going to pull them a little bit away so I can make them back to mine as quickly as possible. And that didn't draw the Marines further forward where she could fight them. And the Widow Mine got a shot off. And at the end of the day, instead of losing maybe one to two probes, she loses five. Does that make the big difference? I mean, it's damage. It's a lot more than she would have liked. But now the question is, yeah. Blink is done. What can Nina get done here? Yeah, this is a really weird map when it comes to the Blink Stalker stuff. Because ooh, there is such a large area on the left-hand side as well. As, ooh, nice snipe off on the medevac. And Nina's going to commit up. Seeing that that siege tank is over on that left hand side says, oh, well, you know, I'm actually covering the right hand side. Liberator's going to be getting damage done in the meanwhile. Nina ends up having to back off and she really ultimately at the end of the day ends up losing a handful of stalkers and not really trading out for anything more than, I guess, the medevac that she was catching on the retreat. But then moving up the ramp, she only really got a couple of Marines. That's it. Yeah, I like I liked the idea. I, I really did like the idea. But... Special out of Liberator across the map the entire time. Nina's distracted, can't really focus on it, taking more damage. And Special's doing such a good job right now of making life uncomfortable. Nina has the right openings. She could have gotten oh, a lot of a damage done block. with those stalkers, but because of everything else that Special's throwing in Nina's face, it's the game's feeling pretty hard. And Special behind this, pedal to the metal, right? He's moving out with bio, he's moving out with tanks. Stim is a long ways off. It just got started. Plus one just got started. There's no combat shields even on the production tab. But this is a powerful army. And if Nina is forced to get shoved up into a corner, if he, if the tanks all get their siege, it's going to be pretty rough. Now, the one saving grace here, Ravi, as things get started, charge is pretty. It's going to be done pretty quickly. You can get on top of the tanks then. But for right now, Nina just comes quickly into enough? this. What is happening? There's no way this works. Yeah, Nina was trying to go over those siege tanks and she's going to get two of them in exchange for every single stalker. And that, I think that just may very well end up being game because I don't know how you recover from that. Here's the big problem is that charge is finishing up quickly, sure, but it was not quick enough. She was going to like have a very difficult time defending that third base, I think. If she did not do that kind of maneuver, I think the siege tanks siege up in an even better position on top of that third. And I think it's even less, it's like, it's as uh, unlikely that Nina actually defends the third, but I am a, with you 100% that I like the chances better of her giving up the third and actually keeping her stalkers alive and doing something else otherwise. But she did not get a great trade with that. No, she didn't. At least this time, she's going to be able to delay the third base, but there's just too much bio. So this is not going to get canceled. Nina, not going to be able to make that happen. And at this point, special is stimulus three tank push. Runs across the map, kills how many stalkers? Kills 10 stalkers, knocks a base down. He's killed 13 probes. And you talked about game one, about how Nina, you know, sometimes falls behind, brings it back into the late game, school comebacks. You know, Fear Dragon, I don't want to say it, but 16 pro or 16 probes and 10 stalkers in a third base, that's not just falling a little bit behind. That is game ending damage in a significant way. No, absolutely. I, I, Honestly, do think there are some pro players who would have actually just left the game at that point, but 
I think that uh, Nina is not that kind of proto slayer. She really does try even in games where she falls significantly further behind. And I don't blame her because it's kind of the same thing as we saw from Bly earlier on in the group stages in the European region. Sometimes, it's not all the time, but sometimes, maybe even if it's one in every like 20 games that you fall really far behind and you stick in it and try to make something happen, Bly will make that comeback real. And it looks ridiculous when he does it, but you find these opportunities, you out micro your opponent in certain like areas. I think doing big playmaking units like Storms is actually a great way to do it. And Nina is capable of it sometimes. She's absolutely been able to do it a couple of times. It is absolutely going to be the less likely scenario. But what's the harm in trying? No, absolutely not. I mean, this is this is a tournament match. You're on tournament life here, right? Nina's up one, but even still, you lose this series, you're out of the tournament. Absolutely. Go try. Storm is done. Storm from the back side. It almost kills everything. But instead, the war prism is going to go down. Special gets back out. Nina buys some time. But one storm plays just a little bit better. A third storm on top of that army. And suddenly, Nina... I'm not going to say she's ahead in the game, but she is right back into it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if she... I know that there are ghosts out, but if she's able to evade any of the EMPs, she gets another couple of storms like that. I'm not going to say that it's dead even or anything like close to that, because obviously she's still a two basing or like a now very freshly three basing Protoss. But it's she could stay alive against this push. She, if she gets some decent storms again like that, she could very well stay alive. She keeps the high Templar alive. She stops up so many of these units. If the Zealots on the top go over to the right-hand side, I think she can actually take that fight. Yeah, I mean, one Widow Mine's going to get a solid shot here. Ooh. The Vikings, four Vikings, really, they are dead supply. This bio is so low. Yeah, the Archon's dead, but look at this. Nina is making miracles happen. Obviously, the game's still not a good position for her. She's only on 57 workers, only on three bases. But those three storms, and even that's with one high Templar getting EMP'd. So, you know, imagine a fourth storm in that fight and this, this sequence of things. Nina has clawed her way right back into it. Again, it's not easy. She still has to get a fourth face up, double Robo, Colossus, getting those upgrades. But between 1-1 one, one finishing and those storms, I mean, I'm not saying I'm a believer yet, but I may not be the only one. I mean, I'm just going to put it this way. Nina went from a position where she was significantly for, far behind to now she was just far behind. Like she is continuing to take these trades that are going unbelievably well for her. I don't believe she has enough energy for a guardian shield for this fight, which is going to kind of hurt a little bit because that plus plus one or uh, like a plus one upgrade, uh, weapon upgrade would be really helpful, but not going to be the case for this fight. She's going to be able to buy a little bit of time. And, you know, she even has the shield battery. She could technically fall back to if she's okay with just sacrificing a couple of these zealots. And one of mine's are, are getting good shots, but yeah. Yeah. It'd be like, it'd be nice to be effectively plus one, plus three, plus one attack. Guardian shield gives you an additional two armor, but even still, Special's fighting down upgrades. Yes, he's cutting away, and that does make it a little bit more awkward, but he's not able to move through. And if we look at resources lost here, it'd be... I would have expected to say, yeah, Nina's behind in supply or behind in resources lost. It was such a bad early game. But because of those storms, because of those fights she's taken, she's actually heading resources lost. She's got her fourth base up now. Special's only on three. Two, two is about halfway done. Colossus are on the map right now. I think most of the Vikings are dead. There are four of them, a couple more on the way. This game, 150 supply to 139. Nina's up a base. Uh, upgrades are good. If you said, okay, this is a game 12 minutes in, don't look at anything else, don't pay attention to how the game is gone. I this is a pretty reasonable PVT. No, absolutely. And now when you start adding in the disruptors and the disruptor hits that Nina was able to get in the last game, I'm actually genuinely a little bit worried for special. I don't think he's in a theoretically bad spot or anything just yet, but just based on the context of the last game and some of the trades he was taking, I actually think Nina is posing a very, very scary threat here with these disruptors. Now, one thing we got to point out as well as we, we look at this fight is special. He moved out with three ghosts and then stopped building ghosts. So for now, finally, we have a ghost count that is solid, that is respectable. Stocks pulling forward. Archons get big shots there on top of the Vikings as well. But he, he didn't have a lot of ghosts with the army in a lot of these fights. He just tried to run and just shove the army down the throat, just give you no opportunity. Just I am so far ahead, I can win the game. And what that meant was that a lot of those fights, we had like one EMPs, two EMPs, just not really all that great. 
Stars get on top of these Vikings. There are two that remain. Disruptor is not getting a ton, but the Colossus stands strong. There are two of them right now. Shot is incredible <laughs> as well. And special, he just dives right on top. Are, are we back? Are we back? <laughs> are, are we at a point now where we can say that Nina is maybe even ahead? I mean, she has 2-2 two, two upgrades, and I think even though she's lost a lot of the disruptors here, she still has three out on the map, and she's going to be able to clean up the tank. She's going to be able to clean up this push, killing off a ghost potentially over here, or killing off a couple of these medevacs as well, which, by the way, it's Colossus being added in. So any medevac that goes down means it's taking away time from the starport. And I know there's a second starport being added on, but there's actually nothing being made from the first one. The medevac count isn't exactly super high, but more of these medevacs go down. We're going from four to two potentially. Ah, I'm genuinely I, I, getting very worried here for special. Okay, that medevac survived on like one HP. It's gonna get taken down at the end. Sorry, how get the medevac down, please, Nina. Uh, she's gonna get it at the end, but uh, it's a little bit more value than it would have as disruptor shot knocks down the rest of this. And now Nina's up a base. Nina's up in supply. Three three is halfway done. Special. Is he only on single eBay? No, he's on two eBay. He just forgot his armor. You know, I, Ravi, I would like to take back my words. I said, what was it? Five, six minutes ago that we like it when Nina gets a little bit behind because the game gets interesting if she makes a comeback happen. But this is too much damage. Special has gotten too much done. There's, it's game ending damage. I was wrong. Yeah, I think it is big, actually a very <laughs> big enough fan to say I was wrong there. <laughs> It happens, man. Like, Nina is just so, so good at playing in these kind of, like, chaotic games and finding ways to crawl back into a game. I will say, if there was, like, a weakness oftentimes that we see in Nina's play, and I'm always kind of ready and waiting for her to prove me wrong, it is sometimes closing out games, but this is going to be a very interesting fight with a big Disruptor connection, but a lot of her army getting very much so concaved on. She loses so many high-value units. A couple of Colossus also rallying in from the backside. Vikings gonna be able to take care of those 16, 20 workers going down. And almost as if to jinx it. As I said that, yeah, Nina falls drastically far behind in this game. I am so sorry, Nina. I cast her, I'm like, ah, she's back. I was wrong. <laughs> and then immediately it all falls to, falls to pieces there. That drop, double drop from special kills the third base, gets 23 probes. She loses everything on the right side. She still got money which is the crazy thing. She's still on four bases. Now she's on three. Never mind. Still got something. But at this point, I mean, there's no way, right? It, even with 2-1, even down upgrades, the fights in the open field with the Vikings and the EMPs and the drop as well. A game that was looking very good for Nina, extremely reasonable for Nina, falls apart in about 30 seconds. And we, the lucky few, get to go to game three. Yes, we do. After a very, very chaotic game number two, um, yeah, it's it's funny because I do think Nina, again, she's very good at getting herself edges in games. And this is the way I've always rationalized it. I, I'd have to maybe rethink it in the context of that last game because I think the thing that lost her in that last game was obviously she was losing a lot of workers and stuff during that last set of trades. But I think just taking that fight out in the open like that, it's so, so tough. Her army composition really really is about making sure you're taking like the right angle of engagement if you aren't taking the right correct angle of engagement if you're getting concaved on and your disruptors are trying to land big hits on bio but the bio is so spread out the colossus are also not finding amazing damage or anything and that army just does not look nearly as strong as it normally should and that's kind of just what happened special found a incredible fight there at the end that was like one of the best kind of angles of the fight special could ask for mm -hmm. if nina takes a fight at a different position if she pulls back i don't know force fields or disruptor sacrifices one or two disruptors just to like zone out the army or something then i think she can uh, pull back to like more of a choke point take a slightly better trade clean up the drop on the other side that was dealing a lot of damage there's maybe opportunities but that is just one of the difficult things nina i think sometimes she can get ahead in games but i think sometimes closing out from being ahead is one of her weaknesses. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately as well, uh, one thing she did a really good job of that allowed her to do it, most of what she did in game number one, she had really good vision on the map. She knew where Specialist Army was for the most part. Yeah. There was nothing on post dude, like north of that third base. So the drop goes in undetected. Nina tries to take a fight. And even then down upgrade, she's distracted trying to deal with this drop, warp in. It, it gets really awkward. The, the Terran Army is always going to be a little bit more microbole. It dives on top. We saw what happened. But... 
Amphion is game number three. We get to see another game. We are blessed with a third game and what has been a really, really cool series thus far. So friends, we're going to get into that third and final game. One player gets to move on from the series into the playoffs. And the upper left in the red is ahead and then's behind and then wins the game anyways. His name is Special. And down here in the bottom left-hand side of the map, comeback queen, she is Nina. Man, weird, weird series, but this is the kind of fun that I always uh, enjoy from not only North America, but specifically from Nina games where they really do keep you on the edge of your seat. You truly, truly are a fool if you try to too confidently predict who is like, on the verge of winning. I think it's fair to say if a player is ahead at any given moment or something, but man, when it comes to like games with Nina or it comes to games with like Bly or something, I really honestly believe if you try to confidently predict who's about to win, unless it's like a hundred supply differential, I think you're a fool. I think I think you, you've gotten too overconfident about your knowledge of StarCraft, because we move outside the knowledge of normal StarCraft in these kind of games. And to quote Estrella once upon a time in A, we are powerful clowns. Although, <laughs> you know, it's funny. You talk, um, you talk about that, about being able to predict things. I had something to say. Moving on, it's gonna be a century coming out of Nina, which is, you know, again, it's pretty cool. We're seeing more of these century openers, really it's just for vision, right? To be able to go and see exactly what the Terran player is going for. And I was going to ask you, Rubby. Now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the time has passed and it's going to be a warp gate first. But do we see Stargate on this map? Against the Terran, it's kind of an island map on the left side. Tons of dead airspace. Blink is not particularly good here, but mm -hmm. it was like, you know, getting ready for that Twilight opener instead. Yeah, I, I think even though I have said before and I was agreeing with you, I think during Europe or something, or maybe it was during the Asia region, that I do like phoenix and stargate openings on this map just because of all that dead airspace because i think there are like good opportunities for it to follow up in the colossus nina stylistically as a player is such a strong blink player i just expect it i think it is more regardless of what the meta is when nina has the opportunity to go for blink if it is like at least a viable thing to do in the meta i'm more surprised when she doesn't and Four probes, by the way, five probes now, continuing to potentially build up over here if this Hellion gets another shot, does not. But that is a very, very juicy set of trades there for special. I think it's important to point out as well, when the damage happens, because right now it's three minutes and 30 seconds into the game, five probes are dead. If that ran in a couple minutes later, yeah, five probes, eh, less so. So when you compare the two, the damage that Nina took in game one, I think that happened like four or five minutes. And in this game, one might argue that despite Nina losing more probes, I think it was like 10, 12 probes, whatever the number was from that drop and everything else, the Winamine running in, this is the more impactful one, right? It's two Reapers, it's a Hellion. I Hellion survived, the Reapers went down. But going back down like 21 probes, 23 probes off that, that really does slow your economy down quite a bit. The Hellion's going to dive in once again. I don't know how much more it gets. He's going to get it. Hey, there we go. He's going to get a probe. And hey, there's a drop on the way here as well. Special more and more a game over game is just trying to lean into Nina to make her make mistakes early on to punish her forward. Winamine drop here. Actually, she's going to kill one of these Winamines very quickly. Probes have to get pulled away. Nice. Ah, gets a stalker. Not exactly what you're looking for with Nina, but force fields means the Winamine can't run away. The Hellions could die. And nice response there from Nina. Again, the sentry died, I think, right? Oh, did it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a very weird and awkward start there for nina for sure um she is gonna have been powering out those uh chrono boosted probes so her probe count actually despite everything is not looking unbelievably terrible it's like 32 to 41 is pretty reasonable the third base finally starts up around like the five minute mark she's finally able to move out across the map and yeah, well she's she's definitely got to get something done or like look for something she can get done with this blink um, whether it be, you know, picking away at the bunker or finding some scouting information, if she can like pick away at the Raven, force mining time off or something, like I think it would be great. But uh, yeah, I think she really wants to at least find some information about what her opponent's up to. And I think actually funny enough, there is like the, the hop up cliff, the Reaper hop up cliff. That would be a great area for these stalkers to poke in from. Yeah, we saw it happen yesterday. 
can't remember yeah. if it was Nina game or not, but it worked out really nicely. The bunker is going to go down. Supply Depot gets slowed down today, a little bit. Actually. Oh, right? yeah, also today. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, here's the good, here's the great news if you're a Nina fan. Special committed to a Raven, committed to Interference Matrix. This is an anti-Colossus build. There's not even a Robo on the map. This is plus one armor charge. This is an army designed to deal with these early bits of care and aggression. Now, Nina doesn't want to lose more probes. Maybe losing one or two here or there to the Raven is acceptable. Oh, she loses three. Again, trying to get a little bit too greedy on pulling off, pulling forward. Losing a couple probes here there is... is somewhat manageable especially if you can kill the raven but it's rough five more probes go down there's really nothing good to say about that but again at the very least this army in this building is designed to deal with this push that the terran player is getting ready for yep if she can find the right angle of engagement uh then it can work out very very well for her and she's gonna have a couple of these stalkers she's gonna be able to see the potential move out here as the bio forces trying to bait nina into the siege tank fire she does get baited two stalkers going down that is definitely gonna hurt there aren't actually that many stalkers out on the map right now especially because of all the early game damage she took so that is gonna really really be frustrating for her dealing with any kind of push out but uh meta vector up hanging out along the right hand side of the map it's gonna look to try and uh catch nina out of position and again there's just not that much anti either a couple more stalkers got warped in and Nina is actually moving out a little bit more aggressively, looking to maybe meet the army, but it's not actually moving out right now. Yeah. Now, what I think is actually really cool is we see, again, where Raven's going to dive in. Zealots are going to get on top of that, so it really shouldn't get much damage done. But what I think is pretty cool is, again, we're seeing that pretty quick Templar archive. Storm's on the way, getting these high Templar. And we saw how powerful that was in that last game. Nina is, again, she's not in a great spot. She's lost 11 probes and lost a sentry. Some stalkers going down and specifically those stalkers and those sentries those gas heavy tech units early on they do matter quite a bit you don't want to build any more than you really can get away with because you want again that's expensive that slows you down elsewhere but for now okay and if takes half damage looks like it's not gonna properly go down though nina needs to buy about 30 seconds 20 seconds that's when storm's gonna be done special trying to hit right before then plus one stim combat shields but again that's a lot of zealots, mm -hmm. right? Plus one is done on the arm. Plus one armor is done. The zealots can take a fight if they get a good angle. And Storm is getting closer and closer to being complete. That's the timing Nina needs. Yeah, I, I think the thing, though, is that this isn't that committed of a push from Special. Like, he didn't pull any of the Siege Shanks. I don't think that he's looking to try and end the game here. I think he's looking for damage, if he can find it. So the medevac drop was trying to head in at the same time that this battle force is pushing into the front. If Nina had pulled too many of her units away to deal with that medevac drop, then the like bio force at the front finds some damage or now this medevac drop heads back into the third base tries to find like a probe or something over there but now there's double medevac heading into the main base this is all looking for damage i don't think special's expecting this to like win a big army fight right now so well, i think she has time for storm and storm is gonna be definitely building up energy but she definitely needs to make sure she doesn't take too much damage here i mean she's not taking any damage at all she gets the medevac like loses a stalker or two i uh, need to go <laughs> deal with the rest of these marines that's important but that was 30 supply, three medevacs were mm -hmm. the special loss for really not that much data. Now, Nina, supply lead, plus one's gonna be done soon. She's got Storm. Now, a special knows that there are high Templars on the map. Ghost Academy has only just now been started. This buys Nina a ton of time. Fourth phase, I mean, Widow Mines are gonna get a decent shot. But now, Nina can get her fourth phase up. She's, her economy is reasonable. Special's gonna continue to try to multi prong. Why wouldn't, if Nina can lock down her position and like she's got some vision kind of on that on that dead air side where you gotta be careful about Terran pushes. I wouldn't mind seeing Nina go and try to attack into the third base. The natural, that's really hard. There are a lot of tanks there. But the third base is far less defended. Mm, yeah, that is gonna be an interesting one. If Nina decides to do something with that, we're gonna see. Special is gonna continue to just be out on the map and kind of not committed with the aggression, but just looking for opportunities to try and find something knocking down the rocks continue to poke around with kind of uh drops and stuff and frankly the stalker count still isn't actually that high right now for nina so just, nina's just at eight stalkers which is enough to deal with a handful of medevacs that they poke their way forward but storms coming down on top of this army is going to be a little bit annoying ambushing some of special's army forcing these medevacs to work a bit of overtime even forcing them back a bit but it does seem like it's been light pressures from special it doesn't seem like anything really committed is happening on either side right now yeah it's actually you talk about that storm just softening the army up disc played dolan yesterday and it was a game that <laughs> Disc eventually lost but he 
he was in, actually he was much further behind than even Nina got in this game but he just had random high templar on the map and just kept uh -oh. keeping the army so soft is now thinking about stimming up the ramp here there were no high templar in this army EMP not complaining this you gotta choke. be so careful about the force fields up the choke but Nina getting herself set up here storms are or excuse me scans are gonna see some of that now the EMPs go down a little bit Nina this army is very disjointed here where's the storm it's gotta go down it's not gonna land but hey a bunch of zealots doing a pretty nice job anyways now they're trying to unload here vikings on top of the colossus are gonna knock that down and the storm's okay and this is a weird fight because it felt like nina was in a good position to really wipe it instead she doesn't but she still kind of wins the fight anyways and special barely doesn't get that colossus yeah it, i think what was really strange about it is that special had this choke point nina yeah. tried to like cut off the bioforce and going through back through the choke point and just retreating back to the safety of the siege tanks. Special ends up microing further into like a corner of the ramp, but the siege tanks are just wailing away at Nina's army. So Nina starts taking like worse trades there, but then Special realizes that he actually can't defend the siege tanks because reinforcements come in there for Nina and actually clean up. So now Nina has this golden opportunity here where she can try to push in. The Colossus are not really gonna have too much contention. There's so many zealots and look at the full surround there from all of these charge lots. Is it actually enough though? EMPs come out on this army. The Colossus is dealing massive amounts of damage, but Nina just simply does not have enough to actually push forward. 10 seconds before extended thermal lance. I, it, it's crazy that she took that fight right there. And I was about to get so excited, Ruby, because I'm like, look, it's your micro trick. You, you get the charge and it goes so far and it's so cool and it's a full surround. I think just a moving would have been better. <laughs> Straight up, because the Zealots, they got yeah. that full surround, but they weren't fighting. They didn't do any damage. Storm kind of lands, but only hits half the army. And all of a sudden, Nina is in a really rough spot. This one Colossus is going to try to hold the fort down. She's got two more on the way that are going to be done soon. But she can't really delay the fourth base all that much. And all of a sudden, special. He's got a 40 army supply lead. Upgrades are roughly equal. 2-1 versus 1-2. Kind of 6 one way, half dozen the other. At least Nina has her splash damage back, right? She's on three Colossus, adding in the disruptors. It was a horrendous fight. Let's make no bones about it. But it is still a little hard here for special to run up this ramp. Yeah, knocking down the rocks is going to make things a little bit easier for special to try and do something. And remember, even if the arm uh, supplies overall look kind of even-ish, that Nina has a lot of wor extra workers that is not really adding into the army supply. This Ooh. fight for special though is not the fight he was looking for. Oh boy. That was, okay. those were some great force fields. EMP just didn't, they hit some of the army. They didn't get the sentries. So despite the fact that there were like three or four ghosts in the army, those force fields were beautiful. And just like that, this, you know, this game, I, I like to mention it a lot because it's a fun, fantastical animal. But if you've ever seen the old Dr. Doolittle, this game is a push me pull you. I move across the map, you move across the map. We both are trying to go back and forth and it's just all over the place. And now Nina's got her fifth base on the way, maybe able to, eh, I don't think she can put a ton of pressure on specials fourth. But yeah, I mean, look, this is classic NA Starcraft at its best. I have no, like, this game's pretty even now, <laughs> all things considered. Yeah, I mean, I think actually after that last set of trades, just because Nina has had such a stellar economy, I do actually like Nina's position a bit more. I I think that she managed to reset the Colossus count, or sorry, the Viking count while keeping her Colossus alive. I think even has still having a few storms available. She's 3-3 three, three on the way, whereas special still just on plus one armor. I'm actually, I'm liking a lot of things a lot more right now for Nina. I'm a little worried about this this double drop. That's what one special yeah. game number two is going to get deny this for the fifth base. And again, as we talk about this composition that Nina's going for, just in general with the Protoss late game, you want to be ahead economically. I mean, obviously in a game of StarCraft, you want to be ahead economically. He blinks forward, gets a couple of medivacs here, tries to chase around, but corners are absolutely the Terran player's best friend. So Nina has to be kind of careful, but even still, these ghosts are going to go down by far the most important units in this army. Medivacs die as well. And even though Nina loses her fifth base, I think I, I really do like more expanding mm -hmm. bottom right side. It's so far away from where the Terran wants to be. So he wins a fight, loses a base, gets, oh, he's not going to quite get that medevac. If the game goes on, th this game is wild. Fear. I, this is serious. What am I, who am I saying? This game is wild. This series has been wild in the best way possible. Now Nina's active on the map. A single drop mm -hmm. wants to go into the main base. Nina's got like five supply to warp with to counter warp in. So stalkers are gonna she's have to run block over. For that five supply. <laughs> oh, true, she's supply block too. Yeah. Is gonna have to recall some units. Does manage to find the medevac though. And is gonna be able to take care of things. Recall gonna be on cooldown. It just 
may not end up coming to effect, but we'll see as Nina might be catching the army in the middle of the map in a massive limbo line. This is potentially an ideal fight here for Nina as she is going to be able to use these destructors at a very awkward angle. The Colossus can also get some very, very nice, juicy connections off on these Marines, but Nina's still on the retreat, doesn't have the supporting Zealots to actually really make the most of it, and that means that the Colossus are starting to get picked off. Finally, the Zealots are here to help reinforce it. Uh, Nina, wow, almost able to take a really, really good set of trades there, but just not having that frontline buffer she needed for it. I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, this looks like it could be good for both sides. Nina comes down. Oh, that's a good oh. storm. Oh, that's a good storm. But, you know, it's like Nina's coming down the ramp. Special's got a concave ready set up here. And the fact that he decides to re-engage as low as he is is wild. But he knows where the rest of the army is, so I guess that's going to be fine. And now Nina taking the bottom right side base, taking the left side base. Both of them are done, by the way. So now she's up <laughs> technically two bases for the time being over the Terran. Special running over so soon, just going to be one. And do you want to... So Nina won game one on this composition. Blink Stalker, Storm, Disruptor, Heavy Upgrades. Colossus as well. Do you want to see Nina transition? Can you transition on this map? Is it too spread out to move into kind of a Sky Toss idea? Uh, I mean, I don't hate the idea of like a transition in a general vacuum. I just, I feel like Nina is not the player that I think of is doing it. Robotics may getting target fired down is a very nice pick off there for special. I think that these medevacs, yeah, they are going to get focus fired down in exchange. Special was trading out for some of the stalkers, but now also finds this left-hand side base that Nina established. No workers are being transferred over there or anything. So no other loss is going to be taken, but Nina is going to try and follow up with the pressure over here. There's only a couple of medevacs, so it's going to be hard to just like escape on out. Vikings going after the Colossus, but they are diving in right underneath the stalkers. That means that only one of the Colossus gets picked off and two of the Colossus survive. Most of the Vikings end up dying. A special over, I well, he lost a lot of Vikings, so that's fine, but it felt like special almost overbuilt Vikings for that fight. A lot of that, it was like 14 Vikings or something. It was a significant amount. And this army is, quite frankly, it's 3-3. It's better. It's 3-1 for special. He just totally neglected his armor upgrades. So the gateway army by itself was strong enough. The gateway, Archon, Disruptor, whatever it is, the non-robo units were strong enough by themselves to go in and take that fight. And then we saw that happen. So Nina, she's going to kill a planetary. And that base is far more impactful than Nina losing the base. She hadn't even saturated this drop in the main base. Isn't going to get a lot done. Still, or excuse me, cannons as well, knocking down some of the medevacs. Special is a four base Terran. His main base is totally mined up. Natural, pretty much the same way. And Special trying to get too aggressive here with these drops. It was a very expensive 30 seconds. And all of a sudden, Special's down 40 army supply. That shot is going to make it even more. And wait a minute here. Storms are going to go down. STVs have to get pulled. This is a disastrous 30 seconds for Special. But at least the Vikings are knocking the Colossus down. Maybe that's going to be enough. There are no Zealots here as well. Nina needs a little bit more to make this happen. She's breaking herself against the rocks of the Colossus. But at the end of the day, Ravi, even if that's happening, it doesn't matter. She's killed everything else. Yeah. Disruptor fires a shot to hop into nothing as there's a single Marauder there. Even a special clean this up. Nina has just done simply way too much damage. She has way too good of an economy. And she has now nearly doubled the supply of special. Special is going to stick in it for a little bit longer. But I think once some reinforcements arrive here for Nina, Special's going to have to come to terms with the fact that he simply just does not have the tools available to try and mount some kind of miraculous comeback right now. It is going to be so unbelievably difficult. Yeah, I mean, 35 army supply. I don't even know if Special could deal with, for example, like if he tried to do an attack at the bottom right, I don't even think he could deal with the four cannons and a shield battery there right now with his army. Like, it's so, so unbelievably difficult. Storm, not going to happen. Oh, that, that, that's a grim thought, though. Oh, there is another storm on the backside. Planetary is dead as well. Special is dead. And for the first time in a long time, Special's not going to be in the playoffs of the Americas region. And Nina looking a lot better than we've seen in quite a while. Clutches it out three games in a row. Some of the most entertaining StarCraft <laughs> that we've seen in... Well, I'll tell you all day, that's for Dagon sure. What a, what a series. A really, really fun series. And truly, I think just uh, the style of StarCraft that Nina oftentimes plays, which mm -hmm. is chaotic, a little bit crazy, but oftentimes just taking some incredible, very, very flashy engagements or fights that turn games around and turn them on their heads. So really, really well done there. Nina qualifying for that playoff spot. And like you said, knocking special out for the first time in a while. I think it... 
I think it has happened a few times that Special hasn't made it to the playoffs, but it is definitely a rare occasion. Um, but yeah, that's that's our first North American match down of the the three that we have going on. We got two more really really incredible series. I think could have some also very fun uh, potential upsets coming up as well. You know, it's funny. So that series was about an hour long, all, all in. 16 mm -hmm. minutes, 22 minutes, 20 minutes. I think that that series was longer than half of Europe. <laughs> That's actually why I phrased things the way I did to move us to the next, to the break, because we're already behind schedule and these players are waiting for us. <laughs> Wear your passion. <laughs> Share your passion. Wherever. Whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, friends. I think four minutes is just enough time to, like, recover from that last series. I, obviously, I'm not sure if that is even true or not, but enough time to get ourselves ready for our next series because we have a PVZ on the way. It's going to be Disc. It's going to be Eric. And uh, this is the one that we were talking about, Fear Dragon, at the start of the day, where it's like, you know what? I think you were saying, at least, that this might be a little bit more Eric favored than I'm giving it credit for. Yeah, I mean, I think the... What I would, again, say is not that I just automatically think Eric is so much stronger. It's nothing like that. It really is just to me that I could see this very much so being an even series, just because I think the disc has been a player that has been at the top of the NA region in the past, but I think right now his current form is not quite at that level. And I think Eric has been kind of on the up and up in my mind. So I'm, a, I'm looking forward to seeing how this series goes and how Eric is going to decide to approach this. I think disc is... I'm expecting to approach this from a sort of more macro-oriented uh, pacing, but it's more the question of what Eric decides to bring, especially since I think he likes getting very aggressive. He does. He's one of the, I mean, we got the Eric build, right? The 15-15, although in general, that's a macro opening against Protoss players. But hey, he's the guy that two weeks in a row took down Dark with crazy all-ins and an EBT cup twice in a row. It was very cool to watch. I was able to catch that one real time. But yeah, it's kind of funny, right? Because a year ago, I would have said, look, Disc is probably the number four play, player in NA. Certainly after Neve is gone, top three is not out of the likelihood. Is he competing internationally? And not, not, not to the same level, but within the region, he's very, very strong. But seeing his results here, his like results last season, it feels like he's, I don't know if he's playing less. I don't know if he's just, other players are rising up. But he's not kind of at that, well, okay, it's, it's, Disc Scarlet spe or Disc Scarlet special trigger. Um, Australia, there we go. Like top five. It's a little bit more wide open. So I'm with you. I, I don't know. I mean, you did say Strange was going to do well and he played a really awesome series against Skilla. So I'm inclined to believe the man. And you know what? I don't have to believe. I don't have to worry about it. Game one's here. And the upper left, representing Apprentice Esports in the blue, it's Disc. And over here in the top right hand side of the map, we have the red Zerg player. It is Eric. Who is representing Cranky Ducklings. Yeah, you know, shout out. I'm sure we're seeing a uh, light and all the, the ducklings are watching in, tuning in. I think it's probably what, five in the morning down in that Aussie land. So shout out to them for supporting these up and coming talents. You know, they had, oh, they had uh, Vindicta on their team for a while. They have Dolan. They just do a really good job of making it a little bit more possible for players, again, like Eric, like Vindicta, like Dolan, to yeah, maybe commit a little bit more to this and get a little bit better. Yeah, I, I honestly, the Cranky Ducklings as an organization and stuff have done a lot for StarCraft, not only through picking out some of these players and stuff, but also they just put on a lot of events, especially events that are not necessarily at the, just like the pro level, which I think is frankly a very underratedly awesome and important part of the whole starcraft ecosystem so big shout out to them they've they've been really great to see having the scene you know i, I again anyone that goes and supports not just the serials of the world but the people that might be serial one day who knows maybe maybe in a different version of starcraft but you give them that baseline you allow them to go and develop and it really is, is pretty great so for now eric he didn't go for the eric opener we actually didn't see him do that yesterday as well as you know, just because he developed the build, we've really just been seeing people walk away from that. Anyway, so standard opener coming out of Eric. He does get his natural down on location. And oh, what do you think? So Disc is a player that I think of as a, as a Twilight guy. But the way you play PvZ, and in fact, there's no warp gate. Oh, it's 216. I think of him as a guy that's a Twilight guy. But you play TVZ, you play PvZ with a Stargate. So that's where he's going to go. There is a Roach Warren coming down at yeah. 2 minutes and 20 seconds. So uh, the real question to me, like, I, I think Disc can play whatever kind of is like the meta thing. I feel like Disc usually is just playing whatever the meta is. So I'm not surprised to see him mixing it in, like, say, a Stargate and stuff. My question is, has Disc made the move over to what I've seen a lot of pro players doing lately, which is just going for the Void Ray? Or is he going to go straight into the Oracle, which I think is like the more traditional way of doing the Stargate? And 
seeing the queens this far out, I feel like I, if I was a Protoss player, I saw those queens over there, I'd be, immediately be making a Void Ray. Yeah, I mean, Void Ray does, Void Ray stuff on the ground does beat two queens, kind of. He's making an Oracle. Oh, uh-oh. Uh, this doesn't feel good. Roaches are going to get made. Five of them on the way, 12 links. Now, the one thing here is we see the Stalker Mike. Great job of Mike Wait, there's no speed. <laughs> so even if you build links to reinforce, they're not going to reinforce across the map very quickly. And this Adept, I'm just going to take and get the main base. But, you know, it's just going to stay alive for now. Move out. The first Oracle is just about done. Do you build a Void right behind that? That's the question. This has been scouted. There's a ton of gateways are on the way. Shield batteries on the way. This is extremely committed from Eric. Another Oracle coming on out. This is a really interesting decision. Now, if the queens or sorry if the oracles are just going after the queen straight up there's only two queens over here you can still try and get something done warp gate gonna get cancelled it really hurts he's not he's not healing it with the shield batteries i'm actually really surprised i thought he was gonna heal it yeah, i gotta target that down this pylon is very low as well but there aren't enough ravagers to knock it down not to burst it. so this pylon is soaking so much damage one queen remains again the oracle it knocks one of them down but now it's mostly out of energy and how many we don't have any pylons on the way. All the stuff that's here, all the shield batteries don't matter because again, there is nothing to power it. Not for quite a while. So the oracles are gonna sit on top, knock the ravagers down. There are no queens, so that is a, a bit of a win. But this is still 10 dead workers, tons of static defense that have done nothing. Massive investment there. And behind this, Eric, he's droning behind this, right? Adding in more queens, adding in more drones. These links will never fight through that number of shield batteries, but you could run into the main base. See if you can get a little bit more Although you do have to be very careful here, Robbie, as we take a look at what's happening. There are two oracles on the map. Third one on the way. They can run across the map. And with the lack of queens, with the lack of everything oh, else. Oh, no! He didn't hold position the probe. Uh, oh, my God. If he had held position the probe, the, the links actually would not have gotten through with the shield battery healing. I'm sitting here talking about how you got to be careful about oracles diving across and just killing all your drones. But if there are links continuously in the base, spending all the energy getting damage done they can't run across the map and kill all your drones no no can they yeah i mean you're definitely right that is going to be the follow-up concern here from eric and it's kind of weird because you look at the supplies and disc is actually at a decent supply at the end of the day he didn't lose as many workers as eric sacrificed to be able to put on this kind of aggression disc it looked so scary and i think the biggest scary thing normally would be just if you invested in five shield batteries, you really just don't have any kind of counter potential. He doesn't have warp gate. He doesn't have the ability to put on gateway pressure. But like you said, it is just the oracles. Can the oracles get damage done? And when I look at this, a single spore crawler defending against three oracles, I don't even think the queens are actually enough. Yeah, killing off six, seven workers, I, I would happily trade one oracle for that. Yeah, given the game state here, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Eric's economy is is it fair to say shattered i think that's probably not strong enough of a word it's bad and losing these queens as well early on just kind of slow you down a little bit so eric he does have a lair halfway done we're gonna see a follow-up i don't know what it is just yet for now finally it's six and a half minutes in this game ruby and finally there's gonna be there's gonna be speed on the way so the links can actually do something but again oracles continue to dive in <laughs> i my micro's not the best could have got or a little bit more there derping. why yeah they were they were making some wide turns on some of those oracles, which is a, uh, a little trick that you got to just get used to with the oracles and micro ring. But the adapts are going to be able to come in, finish off a couple of these drones, picking off a few more. Again, like if even if he finds six or seven workers over here, just the lost mine time plus the six or seven workers is going to be very, very worthwhile. Already finding six and I mean, the adapts are still alive and denying more mining time. This is phenomenal damage here for disc. Funny, I'm watching you're like, ah, six workers, seven workers, eight workers, you know, it, it keeps updating as you say it. And I just, that clip of Roddy last year, or last season, where Dem is like, it's 10,000 resources less, it's 11, it's 12, and Roddy losing his mind. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's kind of what's happening right now. But Adepts, again, I, I like the addition of these, these random Adepts, right? They're just making it so hard for Eric. And in this game where, I mean, Zerg would love to have an economy. Zerg would love to have an army. It doesn't really exist, although this is pretty cool. Eric taking a page out of Mio Micah's book. That's a very, I can't say it's a very quick Hydra Den because we are almost eight minutes into this game. But given the game state, given how the, you know, functionally the game is like four minutes in or so, just with how every, much everything has been slowed down, getting Double that queen. Hydra Den is pretty cool. I love Disc doing this as well. It's like, yeah, you know, my Oracles, there's nothing here for me to kill at the third base. 
but I do spell damage. I can punch through the larva armor and I can deny some of these army units, maybe some of the drones that might get made. And I'm just going to keep slowing you down. Larva's a problem right now. The queens are not where they need to be in terms of injects. I actually think those three oracles could have just killed the queen. Yeah, and then I think after that, then you just deny my <laughs> at the base even longer. It's technical. But, it's cool. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's still in such a good spot. He's going to continue to dive back in over here because there's only four queens out on the map right now. One of the queens is able to chase the oracles away a little bit at the natural alongside the sport crawler, but all it can do is chase them away. It's not really preventing the drone kills right now. A phoenix was made, which is, I guess, this is just a nice, like, overlord cleanup general thing. Um, interesting decision, but I don't hate it. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm a little worried about this timing coming out from Eric. His supply is horrible. Like, let's be clear, his economy shot. This is his last shot at this game. But we don't have charge. Blink is on the way. There are a mm -hmm. lot of Hydras getting made. Yeah, double Robo Colossus Disruptor would be cool if he gets there. But this timing that's going to be coming out pretty quickly out of Eric, I, you might mm, you might get the double Robo Disruptor out in time. I'm not sure. But with all these Hydras here, there's no splash. Stalkers with Blink are okay. But this is still a, something that just given at where Discus decided mm -hmm. to take this game, this is still something that he has to take extremely seriously. Yeah, I think he's going to be very reliant on force fields. And as long as those force fields are on point, I think that he should, even without the disruptors, be able to hold off against this. But I do agree that like, there is a possibility of Eric taking a fight that he could win. If there was like poor micro on disc side or something, I think that Eric absolutely could win a fight. Yeah, I think that's... It always possible man there are so many this is five centuries almost full on energy so getting up the ramp is really hard he's opening at multiple angles but as long as the oracles are there just constantly revelating how can you find your angle so i think you got to knock the rocks down here come around a different angle these adepts have been so annoying and they're gonna get a couple more drones they're gonna get even more if they could get even more if the queen gets targeted but they're not really gonna do so but still three more drones go down and I feel like the timing's gone. You know, I, I thought Eric, if he was able to hit pretty quickly with roaches and, and hydras, it's like, ah, maybe you can make something happen. But two Colossus are on the map right now. Charge finally getting started, plus two. A blink is done. Eric's going to get his fourth base pretty, or excuse me, Disc is going to get his fourth base pretty quickly. And he's massively up in supplies. So that slim timing we were looking at, Ravi, it's gone. Eric, that was kind of his last shot in this game unless something crazy happens. But hey. I'd like to remind you, the Vanya game, the Wayne game, we had something similar happen. Not happening here, though. No, it's looking a lot grimmer right here for Eric. And uh, he's going to try and damage one of the Colossus, but it's not going to be enough. Colossus survives, Disc survives, and Disc goes up 1-0 to zero against Eric's shenaniganry that uh, does not actually pan out. Almost, it got very close, it looked like, to somehow breaking through, doing lots of damage, panning out. But just, yeah, I think the identification or like disc even getting that adept across the map to see the roaches, being able to full wall in over there to start up six or something shield batteries in, even though the shield batteries didn't look like they were helping in a weird way, like it still also forced the focus fire down to the pylons. It caused a lot of havoc. It did buy a lot of time. The oracles were able to like get a lot, you know, it allowed disc also to like say i'm gonna save my oracle energy instead of imagine if he was across the map with the oracles at the beginning of that fight where the big all-in was happening and his first oracle or two oracles were across the map killing like three or four drones as literally just everything in the front line dies and he doesn't have any oracle energy to save things like i think there are still some critical moments there that if disc didn't uh get like the proper scouting or something things maybe could have turned out differently but Really, really well done there by Disc. Yeah, well played. And again, this is something where you said, ah, maybe, maybe Eric, maybe Disc. I had 80-20 Disc. I, I think he is that <laughs> good. I, I think historically he has been that good, but who knows? I think that build could work. I, I think you're right. And I think it was a really good build choice for the map. Because Ghost River is very close natural to natural. That is not a build that you're going to get any, any sort of results with on, say, say post-youth, right? Which is so long. But you play the builds to the map, you set tempo, and now, you know, even though it didn't work for Eric, maybe this is a little bit too much, uh, too much Cranky Duckling's cope. But that's something that now Disc has to kind of keep in the back of his mind. He's like, okay, he's he's willing to go for these two base roach timings. We don't see that a lot. I got to keep that in mind. Maybe I play a little safer. I don't know. What I do know 
game two is ready to go. And the upper left in the red. He's down a game in this series for the Cranky Duckling. It's Eric. And down over here in the bottom right-hand side of the map, we have the blue Protoss player from Apprentice Esports. He is Disc. I will say, for what it is worth, if you pit a Ligulac prediction against Disc and Eric, it comes out 48-51. Or 48-52, I should say. Really? Yeah. It's huh. actually... 2% favored for Eric. And if you go and you look at the Twitch chat prediction points, 800, what is that? 818 to 18, uh, 812 to 889,000 uh, esports dollars. So that's also right around that like 5149 ish. I'm not going to do the last percentage point, but that's also like on that 50 50 ish uh, range. So maybe I'm just wrong. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you in the sense that I actually do still give favoritism a little bit to disc in this um especially after that first game i think he looked pretty strong but i i really do think that like if eric won this i wouldn't be calling it a massive upset i would say man eric is like really on the up and up and disc is struggling a little bit right now yeah i think that's fair and I, i'm really excited to see what eric has in store for us in the second game he is an aggressive zerg he has been doing that across the region we saw him do it yesterday so Game one, I mean, the roaches didn't, the 20, what was it, like a 20, 32 drone, 29 drone, something like that type of roach timing didn't really work out. It was scouted, even though it was, of course, even though it was really short rush, slowlings are really slow to reinforce, a little rough. <laughs> oh, what is it? Site Delta is another map. It's a bit more standard of a map, probably, is the way we talk about it. What does Eric have in store for us now as we, again, it didn't work, but it might put this just a little bit on notice. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing about aggressive Zerg players, I feel like. When there's an aggressive Zerg player, I really do feel as though there are many different points in time which they can be aggressive. Mm -hmm. And you have to react to all of them pretty differently. So there is the two base aggression where, yeah, they're dropping a Roach Horn at like two minutes and 15 seconds or two minutes and 10 seconds or something. And they're doing that kind of big all in off of slow lings and all that stuff. There's also just the you know, I'm not going to drone up my third base very heavily, and I'm going to actually cancel or kill your third base. There's also the, I'm going for a Hydra Ling all in. There's like the Meal Micah kind of stuff. There's all sorts of different ways you can be an aggressive Zerg player at very different points in time that require very different reactions. So I think Eric is actually pretty diverse in the ways that he puts on pressure. Yep, I'll buy, I'll buy what you're saying. If you're dragging all kinds of different ways, you can get aggressive, all different versions and looks he can give. I want to add one thing though is that none of them are very good <laughs> like i i hear what okay. you're saying but like all in zerg play is just not good in the current meta yeah we're not at the top level obviously but this is not sterile playing max packs or something but you do have to there's a bit of a conceit here terrence have all ins for players have all ins and in general they're not as good as they used to be but for the most part zerg all ins are not nearly as, as strong as they have been in the past and you are kind of giving up some of that more where the Zerg is, where Zerg is a race is powerful to go for these aggressive timings over and over and over again. Because again, they're just, they're not as strong as just playing macro Zerg. Bill, I'm going to let you read Twitch chat and they can be a response for whatever you're saying on that. I'm not going to get involved in that arguments. I mean, there's a reason that Bly isn't winning regionals anymore is all I'm going to say. That is the only reason. Pretty much. You Five understand. workers killed by two adapts is some sick damage alongside six Zerglings that were also picked off there. So uh, Disc finding a very, very strong start there. I mean, already setting up a couple of workers as he's, of course, doing his regular securing of the third base. Does he actually have any uh, adapts over here to defend this? Not enough. And he's going to have to pull those Oracles back, but it might. It's going to be cutting a little bit close in terms of how many hit points the uh, Nexus is going to lose. Ooh, nice round on the Adepts as well. And that's one of the downsides of committing your Adepts that, yes, you got five workers. That was great. But now there's a lot of pressure on your Nexus. You got to warp in more Adepts. The Oracles have to run home. And look at this. Spire. Yeah. Evo Chamber Spire plus one melee. Eric, he did this yesterday. And I think... Oh, no, he lost. It didn't work out with the Freya. But 
he did this on this map in game two he was on the south <laughs> side instead of the north side but this entire build who's getting mainly nest too that's a little interesting but getting plus one melee getting the mutas like this is just designed to force base trades to get your to get the protoss player just as frustrated as possible dominate the map and then when they move out you sweep in and kill all their bases it's Mm. kind of an all-in macro play right because you're never if you're going for this style you're never going to be able to fight never is a strong word it's really oh. hard to fight the protoss army straight up but you never try yeah Ooh, uh, hey. eric had gotten a little bit supply block there as the overlord did get started a little bit late he loses a handful of drones so kind of ends up being okay and the overlord is going to be finishing up right in time for that spire so I guess it ends up being okay. Although I don't know if one overlord is going to account for how many mutas I imagine he wants to make. Yeah, he's got seven supply free. Less than that. Seven supply three. He's going to make 10 mutas. That's 20 supply. Bit unfortunate. Three mutas. Okay. I mean, it'll help deal with the oracles for a little bit, I guess. But there's definitely not the uh, supply he wanted right now. He's kind of playing this like it's a Ling. Oh, Ling's Ooh. get on top of that bad, bad warp in, and now Bailey's into the third base. Oh, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. Actually, not as bad as I thought it was gonna hurt. But the probes still have to run away. Now it hurts as bad as I thought it was gonna <laughs> hurt. And Ling's in the main base continue to constitute a problem. 15 dead workers. And this is he's kind of playing this like a Ling Bane Muta all in. You know, Blink's gonna be done soon, but the Ling's at the natural. Bailey's into the third base as the Muta start to spawn. And you know what, Ravi? We were talking about supply blocks. Trading all your uh, trading all your army for workers is a way to get out of a supply block. That is, uh, in fact, a way to trade out of a supply block. It's not the ideal way, but it does technically work. Man, I'm actually a little bit sad for Eric in terms of what he was trying to set up to do. Because imagine if he hadn't been supply blocked, and the ten mutas are already out, and we're already on the other side of the map, continuing to harass. I actually think it would have been difficult for Disc to move out. As it stands. Maybe it still ends up working out just because the stalkers are actually chasing around these mutas in the, like the middle of the map. But yeah, I, I just I think that if these mutas were already inside the main base, could have caught disc in a very awkward spot. And now the, oh, there's a Colossus popping out just in time. So the Lings are just they run in. They're not going to get much done. But hey, again, Ling stalkers against a bunch of mutas are not very good. They, they can kind of handle it for the time being. But what you need is a cannon, a shield battery in every mineral line. You need if you're going to commit like this, because again, Eric is committing to this. This is not, I'm going to build 10 mutas and we're going into something else. This is, I'm going to build as many mutas as humanly possible. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to win the game like that. Double Stargate, Bleed Beacon, plus one, maybe get Annie and Pulse Crystals. You have to hard counter it to the, to the same level that Eric is committing to it. And that's how Estrella almost lost a game. A game two against Eric. Estrella thought this was going to be some sort of transition into ground behind it, because that's how a lot of Zerg players go. And then 20 meters flew, swoop in and it's like, okay, this is a little awkward now. How do I handle this? Yeah, first Phoenix now out. It's uh, <laughs> it's kind of an awkward spot now. Ooh, Oracle's getting a little bit close to those mutas. Could have gotten a bit dangerous there. Stalker's finding these mutas though. And the mutas trying to take the trade over there. That is one of the fights of all time. <laughs> the slow bailing run in again. Oh my God, not again. The slow bailing run in. Finding 11 workers. That was a lot of bailings for the trade. But I'm actually getting worried about how softened up that Nexus is getting also. I know. I was going to say, it's like one more run by mm -hmm. like that, which is 10, you know, those like 10, 12 bailings or something. If he runs by before the shields recover, I actually think he might just kill the base. Hey, you know, there, there's one benefit, right? Of having, he's chronoing, of course, because he wants more pros back. But chronoing actually gets you your shields back faster too. So, you know, you, you get two for the price of one here. Third base should be okay. And Eric, okay, so Eric's getting a lot of damage. It's been 42 dead probes. Uh, he's got an Oracle, got a couple army units. But again, we're starting to hit, plus two is going to be done soon. Templar Archives on the way eventually. And again, mm. Eric's kind of all, he's only on 64 workers. Fourth base only just now getting started. You're kind of in this situation where the army you're building has a time limit on it. And I love, how do you feel about this build a single Phoenix and I, went back into ground? Yeah, so you were saying that there's a time limit on this let me tell you this grand story that i like to call every single protoss player's ladder game that one ladder <laughs> game they have where you think i have 25 or 30 stalkers my opponent's just making mutas and lings and i'm just taking a fight versus the mutas right now this is going to be fine and then you realize that 30 mutas just run circles around all of your stalkers and by the time you finally take the fight against the stalkers 
or against the mutas in a head-on fight the muta count has grown so big and your economy has fallen so far to the wayside that you are now no longer fighting 20 mutas you're fighting 45 mutas and you still only have 20 stalkers this is actually like the protoss nightmare oh this like this is what i'm saying you get double stargate you get a fleet beacon you need to hard counter it not just kind of soft counter it with phoenix yeah or with the stalkers and by the way around weapons level two plus two is 5.9 seconds from completion and it's still not getting repowered disc and all the chaos and the madness has not paid attention to it properly so having plus two would be a nice thing especially with the archons trying to get on top of the mutas mm -hmm. it's just now it's on the way now things are getting repowered but man that's so much of an opportunity cost it's only two phoenix on the map and again without, without plus one without any pulse crystals they just don't fight well archons are dead this is dead you gotta get a second stargate if eric's gonna do that and now we move into game three dude those slow bailing run buys killing all of those probes the ling run by that managed to squeeze its way through the like almost wall in that disc had and then like that muta transition all three of those things really really i think uh managed to do quite a bit of damage to disc that he was almost prepared for but not quite but it's even scary to think about how that could have been an even more like an even stronger muta te uh, tech switch timing from eric if the supply block hadn't happened if the mutas could have even hit even earlier in larger numbers it could have actually looked even worse so really really nice kind of mix up uh build there from eric i was a little bit concerned about him at some points in that game but he truly truly made that muta tech switch work <laughs> Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. I look at this, it's like, why did Disc not go and right, we gotta let him know we're ready to go. Why did Disc not take that more seriously? I I think that so from the product's perspective, there is this kind of tough choice you sometimes have to make where sometimes you think, if I take this too seriously, like for example, if I throw down a second Stargate and start pumping out Phoenix and I add on a fleet beacon and start looking about Anion Pulse Crystals, and my opponent made 10 mutas, yeah. I'm now heavily over-invested in the Phoenix, and it can potentially become a problem, especially when there's the rest of your opponent's army is just Zerglings on the ground that you now are trying to like lift up each individual Zergling to stop them from killing your third base. You know, even if you only invest in like some of that, sometimes you can still feel like, oh, I'm, I'm over-investing into a little bit. So that is like the thought process that goes in your head. By the time you even see how many uh, mutas your opponent has actually invested into, sometimes you feel like you've already taken so much damage that you can't afford the fleet beacon, which costs 300 extra minerals, 200 extra gas, and all the extra phoenix like, uh, to get made. And you used to think, I should just double down on blink stalkers. But I mean, I guess. It's, it's, it's a catch-22. I'm not saying that I disagree with what you're saying, but it is, I think, a very common thing that happens to Protoss players that get caught kind of with their pants down against mutas. Well, hopefully not again. Get caught with his pants down. And actually, I think the first time on this map today in the upper right, these for Apprentice Esports, it's Dis. And down here on the bottom left hand side of the map, the Red Zerg player from Cranky Ducklings. He is Eric. Now tied up one to one. And got that good old hatchery coming down at a nice nice very early timing before the overlord finished yeah that was a was that a 15 hatch 14 hatch I, I missed the timing but i just saw that the hatchery was like 30 percent done as the overlord was still finishing so you know it's funny when you talk about early early hatches this could just be because he wants to avoid the, the probe scout but uh, if you're going down to 14 hatch that is not i mean that's that's extremely ex you're kind of messing yourself up a little bit by, by doing that but what it does do, I mean, we see it in ZBZ quite a bit. If you go for these early hatches, you can get more lings a little bit faster, pulls faster, and you can try to make some flood happen. I don't think it's going to happen this game, but we have proven that Eric is an aggressive Zerg player, and he does like to try to be on the map a little bit more. Again, it's not going to happen this game. But how do you feel about Dynasty, Ruby? I think this is the first time we've seen it. Actually, this is the first time we've seen this in the last two days, yesterday and today, and a little bit of inside baseball. Just to be clear, when Eric played yesterday... No, maybe that was eggs when eggs played yesterday we were like hey can we get dynasty on eggs maples here it's the one map we haven't gotten we were told by the mm. south american zerg that's like no 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 i don't want dynasty it's too scary so it is interesting to see eric going for something a little bit different as he's going ferocious here on a map a pretty big map 
Yeah, I mean, I, this... Honestly, when it comes to, like, map size and stuff, I really do feel like so many players, they always talk about, like, it's good because people think it's going to be bad, and that's what makes it good, is that it's even less expected. Like, players say that so often that I'm just... I don't even... I'm not even surprised about the map size making it a reason to do it. But it is going to be interesting to see how this pans out, because this did such a good job of scouting it out in the last game. But this game... The Adept is staying at home. This game, the Adept is chasing around two links. If this other link can survive long enough, oh, it does end up getting picked off before the Adept Shade finishes. And even then, I think the, uh, the, whatchamacallit, the Stalker was actually coming on out. Okay, this, this time you see two queens in the middle of the map. Please tell me that you just, like, start, okay, yes, this game he immediately starts throwing down shield batteries and walls off. He doesn't wait until he sees the literal roaches. <laughs> I mean, you know, look, someone told these queens that their boots were made for walking. And they're just walking out the door. They may find themselves in another base, and you know, maybe Disc's home is not as friendly as their own, but their boots were made for walking. You're rubby. And they're gonna walk as far as they can. But yeah, it's, they're just a little bit far ahead. It's a decent scout. It's a late scout, though. So first shield battery's this done. There's only one, one pile on. No, okay. okay second, second pile, pile. On, yeah. yeah. All right. So shield battery overcharge is available. And another thing that Disc, he in the game where he had this happen to him and he still won, but it looked kind of closer, is that he didn't actually heal up his cybernetic spark. Okay, that's a little bit unfortunate. He lets the lings in through, so the shield battery that was being overcharged is gonna get attacked, but he's healing up that shield battery, <laughs> and the probes almost managed to keep it alive, but it got so much value through it that it may end up still being okay. The probes could mineral walk through if they really wanna just add in DPS right now. I guess they're just trying to act as a wall in, but I actually think the disc is totally fine oh, here no. now. This game is over. Yeah. <laughs> Not only is he just fine, that got nothing done. And okay, here, here's my here's my head cannon here. You're dragging about how this is happening. <laughs> he let it get weird in game one because he wanted to, Eric to do it when all everything was on the line, and he <laughs> there therefore was he going to be able to go and say, "Yep, I'm going to smash this." <laughs> you, you thought in game one? No, that was a gift. That was if, the if mind he had the game. foresight to do that, he truly would be an oracle. <laughs> he wouldn't just be making oracles. He would actually be an oracle. But this is truly, truly just one of the roughest spots I can imagine Eric to be in. And Oracle's gonna come in, kill off, let's see, three drones, which if he even gets any more, I don't think he's going to just because Oracles are low on hit points, but three drones, that's like 10% of the economy of Eric. Yeah, um, Eric's gonna take the gold too. And because of all this that happened, any sort of pressure on that gold base from like a ravager or something is, is not going to show up in time to really deny it so he's going to get the gold base as well i meant what i said when that all in when that timing got nothing done it's like no the game's over <laughs> this game may play out for another five minutes because you, you do slow yourself down a little bit as the protoss player in terms of your tech and where you go because you need shield batteries all right you need pylons and all these things but Eric's economy is so far behind. He's on two hats. He's getting a third one down a little bit more forward for the creep spread because it's really hard to hold on to that gold mineral wall with the, the adept possibly existing. Like, <laughs> you go mutas? I, I guess you gotta because any sort of ground based composition is just not gonna get across the map fast enough to do anything and get any damage done. Three more drones go down. I don't. I just don't see a safety release valve for Eric in this game three. No, I'm, I'm actually totally with you on that. I will never call, I will not call any games over too early just because I know what can go wrong through experience. But I am 100% in agreement. It would require Disc to make some very, very large mistakes or missteps, either it being just not actually killing Eric uh, for way too long. I think that is honestly the most common thing that I could see or like the most likely way that I could see Eric somehow mounting a comeback in this game is that Disc does what Disc does almost a little bit too well, which is macro, 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 play safe. Misses the window where he could have just killed Eric as he was maybe being a little bit too greedy. And Eric finds some magical way to kind of gun his uh, gun his opponent down into like an awkward position and actually like kill a ton of workers with a slow baneling run by as we saw in the previous game. Things along the, that nature. Well, but I think it is very, very unlikely to happen. You know, there is one thing we talk about this. Yeah, I can't. I, we were right about going mutas, but he's gonna drop that down once again because again, you go roaches, you go hydras, you're just gonna die. So I, I like 
and that Eric is giving himself different from the normal state the, the standard win condition you know road mm -hmm. road strategy like I'm gonna run on top of the army I'm gonna kill it great we're gonna we're gonna run it straight up the gullet you go mute is like this you're playing on the edges you're nipping you're knocking economy down you're catching off stalkers you were there and well it's not easy to make a comeback and certainly if this was scouted I think this just runs across the map with plus one stalkers and ends the game but at least Eric is giving himself some of those differential win mm. conditions. But, you know, I guess if you're tracking at the end of the day, I'm with you. This is a game on North America. And that does mean that you have, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, it does seem like Disc is not going to be taking any chances. He knows how big of a lead he is, has, and he's not going to be waiting around for too long. He has the War Prism 40 out. He has more Stalkers than there are Lings, or at least did for a moment before another uh, handful of Lings pop. But I mean, when we're at the point where there were more lings, or sorry, stalkers than there were lings, that's already a bad spot. Even just half as many stalkers as there are lings is already a bad spot for the same player. Hey, your dragon, don't worry. There are five, there are seven mutas on the way. They're going to save this game. If Zerg players could lift and somehow you kill every single one, <laughs> pro, but not going to happen. Disc is going to take the 2 1. He's going to secure victory and his playoff spot, knocking Eric out. And he is going to be our second to last player to qualify for those playoffs in North America. Congratulations to Disc. He uh, held off the same all in in two different games to earn that spot. Yeah. Well done. And you know, look, it almost worked in game one. It was a little awkward. <laughs> Eric maybe got a little bit more, but. I think it's one of those things where, especially if you want to be an aggressive player, you have to have three different all-ins. Doing the same thing three times in a row and it just, okay, for, first of all, it didn't work the first time, but doing it again, now it's front of mind. Now Disc is aware of what's going to happen. It's actually kind of funny because this is pretty much how last Disc's last series went, except uh, Dolan, I think, won <laughs> game one. Where Dolan did an all-in game one, it got a little awkward, got a little dicey. I think Dolan won that game. And then he does it in game three and he just gets slapped because Disc has it more, he's more aware of what's happening. And uh, we just had the same thing happen again. Yeah. Well, well done there by Disc. And uh, that is going to mean that we only have one series left over for North America. It is going to be uh, Maples versus Champ. And I believe we're going to be going to, if I have the math correctly on how we've done this almost every single time, a four minute break before we come back and jump into that final series to decide the final player to make it to the playoffs for North America. We'll see you guys there. You love it, you wear it, wear it. Wear your passion. <laughs> Share your passion. Wherever. Whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everyone, for our last series of the day. We've had 11 of them. Some of them have been good. Some of them have been fast. Some of them have been fast and good or good. You get the point. It's been a lot of StarCraft, really, over the entirety of this entire Swiss stage. Five rounds, tons of players, and now, Ravi, one player gets to move on. It's Maples. It's Cham. I think I personally favor Cham quite a bit here, but, yeah, Maples, he got past the PVC to get to this point, and some of his builds were, his builds were pretty cool. Yeah, there's, I'll say the two sides of this, and then I'll tell you my kind of verdict as well, as uh, the game, I think, is, we're in the lobby, and I think the players are, for the most part, ready from what I saw, but... Um, yeah, my, my two little cents on this is one, Cham is heavily favored coming into this and in the sense that Maples has literally never beaten Cham before and Cham is just a much more experienced player. Maples is like the new kid on the block. Cham should really have a big edge in this. That being said, Maples has been able to actually already pull off some pretty big upsets. Defeating Disc and Eggs, I think, are really, really actually pretty sick victories there for uh, for Maples. I think that Maples has had a better shot now than he has ever had at any point in his career. And the real question is, is Maples saying, nobody defeats me 14 times in a row and lives to tell about it? I mean, 14 times in a row is pretty, it's a lot of times. I do love, by the way, you're talking about Legulax. Yeah, he's never won 14 times in a row. Legulax like 80, 20 or something. I love that Twitch chat is pretty 50-50, 775 to 935. Either there are some people that are just really on some hardcore maple hopium right now, some hardcore Canadian fans that say, ah, damn, the torpedo's full speed, full speed ahead, or, you know, <laughs> maybe they know something I don't, because, again, I think this is Cham 2-0. But I don't know. We do have game one though, it's ready to go. I'll sign ease the map. Let's get into it. And the upper right, he's playing for Starlight Twinkle. It's Cham. And down the bottom left hand side, we have the red Protoss player. He is Maples. Playing for Team Gosu. Sorry about that. I thought you were transitioning the game. I just left you hanging there. My bad. It's fine. You know what? Look, if awkward pauses are funny, and I'm being, I'm told, Ravi, that Twitch in general really appreciates when I can, when the person on screen, the streamer, the cast, or whatever it is, is just invisible pain. So this was content. I mean, that is actually very true. That is what I, I know I enjoy watching the streams where the streamer is in pain. <laughs> Shout out to Up a Tree. Who, by the way, did agree with me. I saw him in chat. He was saying, yeah, you know, I've never seen a good Zerg all in. So whether that was sarcastic or not, I don't know. And I'm going to choose to believe he was actually <laughs> agreeing with me. You know what? Sal likes disagreeing with me. So I, I believe that he was agreeing with you. <laughs> I, You know what? There's a lot going for me here and not a lot going against me. So I will tell you know what? Fear Dragon, I'll take that. I'm not going to think too deep. I'm not going to think too deeply about any sort of ulterior motives that may be happening or may or may not exist. <laughs> Fine. I'll get it. I'll All take good. the cheap win. <laughs> yeah. So, to talk about these two players and stuff, I will say now Maples I don't I like I've seen him play. I've definitely seen him like play in various events and stuff. I have not gotten a chance to see as much of his like PvZ in the last 6 or so months because I think in the past, he's always kind of been like a decent player that I would see playing in open bracket events, sometimes showing up for the qualifiers for like an ESL or, you know, a WCS back in the day and things like that, but not necessarily making the super deep runs. And he was a decent player. But I think what I'm more curious about is what has kind of changed for Maples that sort of made him ascend? How is his PVZ looking? Because Cham, I think, can be a very tricky player to face off against in the sense that he isn't tricky. He has gotten to this stage by sort of brute forcing his way through with just honestly really good ability to like macro up a lot of roaches. He makes some smart decisions in the game with the units that he decides to make. But it's not necessarily, he's not a player that's like, well, 
I did this hard preparation of you trying to go for this overlord scout timing or you try to send your adept in at this exact time and then I have these units. That's not the style of StarCraft that Cham plays. Cham is really good at going for his sort of build up a lot of units, hit my opponent hard with them, use them effectively tactically kind of plays. And that's how he gets wins. And I, I really, I call it brute force. And I don't mean that as an insult. I think it is a very, very effective way of winning StarCraft because it's it's scary. When your opponent isn't doing tricks to win, they're just winning because they're throwing units at you at the right times and using them well. That is really hard to play against sometimes. Yeah, just really bludgeoning the opponent. And the way it's funny, the way you describe Jam, and I think this is pretty fair. It, it just, he's the Mexican dark. He'll play with a lot of roaches. He'll hit you upside the head with a lot of stuff. There's not a lot of subtlety to it, but it will work. You ask about eight maples though, because we haven't seen a lot of him. He plays kind of cheesy. He is very much, he is a North American Protoss player with all that means. He's a Canadian Protoss player with all that means. And he hit some really cool timings against eggs yesterday. We, I talked about that Night Phoenix build against Lambo it was two Robo, two Colossus, two four Disruptor, whatever it was. Maples hit with something very similar to that, except it was off single Robo. And that's how he won game three. That's how he shoved through. It was really, really cool. Not happening this game, though. It's funny because I think, again, I think of Maples, he's an aggressive Protoss player. He's going to try to make something happen. But for right now, it's a 333rd base, triple Oracle, getting a couple of depths to be on the map. But again, that's just defensively you're playing. And well, oh, this is so Cham right now. Like, look, look at Cham's Overlord vision. He is not, he has like that one Overlord over at the natural just acting as the kind of peeper cliff he has no interest in actually scouting inside the main base right now he's not like a sacrificing overlord or thing he just builds the spores and says yeah i'm gonna do that and then i'm gonna also make a bunch of links and try and cancel your third base or try and kill off a bunch of these adepts and maples is well positioned with those adepts he's not gonna end up losing that base he also didn't under invest into the adepts he didn't just sit there with two and kind of end up losing them loses the third base so I would say Cham is doing a nice job of trying to account for everything and like trying to find the ways to kind of bully his way forward into a lead. But Maples is holding strong in this so far and five kills is definitely not shabby. Yeah, five kills. He built a lot of lanes and got a single adept that's really mm -hmm. not worth it. So again, not only does he take a lot of drone losses, he builds a lot of lanes that are a lot that worth a lot of drones. So yeah. now these adepts, these oracles trying to run straight up the gullet here. There's no transfuse for these queens, by the way. They can get sniped, especially with the adepts here on top of things. But for right now, it's poking. You shade back. You don't want to go on creep. Not a lot. The leaks can surround, and it's a very easy way to lose the game. But behind this maples, he's adding in a ton of gateways now. Blink on the way. Plus one on the way. And I got to say here, I'm a little shocked to see maples playing so standard. The one exception to what he's doing, you talk about standard play. A, there's no Robo, which has worked its way into the meta quite a bit now. But he's also got a pylon on the right side. And it looks like he's going to turn this into kind of a plus one blink all in. Not playing for four bases and this very heavy macro Protoss. But instead, hit that sharp timing. Blink plus one. And unfortunately for Cham, he's got a Spire on the way. Any money he saves into this, this is the perfect counter build for Maples in this game. Hmm, plus on air weapons on the way here for Ooh. Maples. So oh, no. he did this last. No, he did this yesterday. This is a fake. He's trying to. He did this yesterday. It's all about selling as much wrong as possible. Mm. He's not going for it. He's got to cancel it at the end of the day. I kind of let it go yesterday and get some get carries afterwards. I forget, but this is a fake for right now. It's all about the stalkers, all about these adepts. He's going to get a bunch of queens. One Oracle's dead. Adept shade into the natural. They're going to go down, certainly. This fourth base. I, I don't know if he's got enough. Well, no, he's got a, he's got a pile on the bottom side. He's gonna warp in a bunch more stalkers. And again, if you're saving money, if you're saving money for mutas here, it's a great stasis that goes down. If you're saving money for mutas, that's not lings, that's not roaches, that's not queens. Cam, he's in a bit of trouble. Yeah, I really thought that Maples was missing opportunity to kill that fourth base, but the stasis really making it look a lot better. He does want to get out of there before the uh, stasis expires, as that is still going to be a lot of links. He doesn't want to just be immediately surrounded by that. Has another stasis available. That pylon is a little bit of a bold one, and wow, it's actually going to survive, but the probe does go down. Fourth base getting killed is really, really nice. Another fourth base gets started on the right-hand side of the map. Maples, I mean, he's going to continue this aggression. He starts up charge behind this, starts up a forge. Is he just satisfied with this damage? I think it's it's an interesting question. Is this, I mean, it's very, very big damage. 
but do, can he actually continue this or is he overstaying his welcome i think you got to be really careful right because there's a spire done and if you back up that's going to be a lot of mutas i don't even know if he knows about it that is something you got to be careful about his fourth base is yeah. going to get surrounded by these links it's an awkward fight in the middle of the map as well so fourth base gets killed maybe no just cancelled Lings are actually going to go down or zealots are going to go down even with plus one because there are so many lings right there and what i think is fascinating here i don't know if it's a mistake this may be by design but he's letting plus one complete now this was a fake i i thought it was and it was yesterday but he's letting it complete right now and the crazy thing ravi as we talk about this game having plus one done if you got to transition into phoenixes against all these muters that are going to pop out is actually pretty good for the protoss player yeah no that is actually going to be extremely helpful those phoenix will shred through mutalists with plus one air weapons in the event that he actually has any phoenix out on the map right now but it is going to be 12 mutas already out on the map and if they manage to make their way over to the natural or the main base or the third of maples without maples actually scouting it out that is going to be extremely problematic where are the mutas? the mutas went along the left hand side and they are going unscouted right now oh this is going to be brutal for maples what defenses does he actually have he has a natural shield battery that's at the wall that's it he can warp in three stalkers and make the mutas move to another base and kill that but he is just in the natural he's yeah. in the fourth base as well like he's taking damage absolutely stalkers have to warp in is that's a bit of an artosis final but he's not gonna go for it if he clicks this base the base is dead stalkers are gonna kill the roach warren too maples <laughs> he doesn't care about the mutas he says this is fine i'm gonna go and i'm gonna kill off so much of your tech of your economy of your production that yeah i'm gonna lose some probes and i wish he just clicked the base down he's not going to this was almost so good for maples and it's not horrible I, I know it's still pretty bad but that could have almost been really good no I, i'm with you in the sense that it looked like if he was going to be able to kill the base if he was able to continue killing workers or something maybe there was something that he was able to make happen there but at the end of the day he barely really kills any workers he trades out some of those a lot of those zealots for damage on the hatcheries but doesn't actually end up killing the main hatcher. He slows down the production of roaches. But Bale, I think, you know, 19 roaches is actually as much, many as he really needs for the moment. He's just flooding out lings and banelings to complement these lings. And we do have the final snipe over there on the hatchery, but it may not matter because Cham is going for the kill right now. I or mean, trying to. Banelings are on top of the Archons, so that's not going all that well. These are two one yeah. stalkers on top of the roaches and maples he gets the fourth base he really doesn't take a lot of damage he's well okay the mutas are getting a lot of damage 14 probes go down so he wins the fight and i are we at this point revy where the army is just incontestable for champ like the mutas are being annoying absolutely and they're continuing to shred this economy but it's still 43 workers and these stalkers mm -hmm. with the archons here oh, are really Jam's hard hurt. Cham is in trouble, but he still has the ability to clean this up with reinforcing rallies. He needs to have a good fight, though. Pops the Archon at long last. He is going to be able to use these lings with plus one melee to push that army back. And I actually think it's okay. Like, it's not great, but it's okay that he lost the fourth base. It is salvageable because these mutas are still getting so much damage done. He has been able to shut down so much of the mining left and right that it, it ends up still being better for Cham. But it's not great. And I almost wonder right now, Balemolf, if Cham actually just had the minerals because his mining was like not so contested to just flood out 20 mutas with the 2000 gas he had, would he have just won the game? <laughs> hey, you know, probably. Uh, I think that is <laughs> probably yeah. at this point. But he's not going for it. He's building 13 Ravagers. And remember, you talk about mutas, what do you go for? A Ravager costs the same as a muta. I, that is actually a really key number to think about so every ravager he gets is a muta that's not in the sky and these stasis traps have the potential to just cause so many problems also remember this protoss player 48 worker shirt is on four bases the economy is not all that bad the stasis traps oh they don't get anything done here and the mutas they're thinking about flying on over they can deal with the oracles as well as they can but again the baileys are not getting the best connections that stasis trap on the backside is beautiful overcharge will get targeted down and now finally this fourth base is going to get broken down. Zealots can't really engage. And this is the economic damage, finally, because there are no probes. I, yeah, there are some probes mining at the fourth base, but they're just going to die. Even still, Cham's going to lose his fourth base. This Zerg player is starting to rapidly run out of money. And again, plus two Blink Stalkers, plus one armor Blink Stalkers. They're pretty good. By the way, also, Ravi, this Nude account, not what it once was. It's still strong, but it's only eight. 
and I'm I, I believe genuinely concerned for Cham right I now. I think Maple has this. Which is this wild. is getting very very dicey. Maples, the only thing that's like really not going well for him is the fact that he is now down to 29 workers. But what's weird is that he's 29 workers with four nexus, so he can actually replenish worker count. If he continues defending and Cham keeps throwing units at him like this, then Cham is actually going to struggle because he's just going to be oversaturated on most of his bases right now. He's not oversaturated just yet. I'll actually say he's not oversaturated with his 46 workers, but that is not a significant worker lead anymore. This is really not the position that Cham was in a couple of minutes ago. I mean, look, Rev, I, nine out of eight on the third base is oversaturated to me. Saying. <laughs> okay. That is technically oversaturated, but he could move one worker or two workers over to one of his other bases mm. <laughs> and on set. Yeah, mm. but either way, dude, it is uh, starting to become a problematic situation. Oh, Muta's finding one of the oracles. If he finds the other oracle, that's actually going to be a really nice snag, but shield battery keeps that alive. Muta investment is not going to be doubled down on too because the economy for Cham is just so, so rough right now. It's kind of weird how this game is just Okay, Bailing's uh <laughs> they turn around. A lot of, not a lot of not a lot of anything to kill this third base either. But it's kind of we oh oh well never mind. That's that's pretty rough. 42 workers here remain, and the fourth base is really where the majority of the mining is. But it's wild as we look at this game as another meter should get tagged down here. How we've the game's kind of stabilized. Yeah, the meters are gonna get on top of the fourth mm -hmm. base once again. I, a lot of these mutas should die here with the target fire that doesn't exist. It's wild. And at this point, I, I could see anyone winning. Mm -hmm. There's a fifth base no, I, getting started, but it's going to be hard to hold on to with the Zealots on the north side and just the fact that Maples, I think, knows about it. So, yeah, where do we I go? I'm kind of with you in some ways. I think what I'm worried about is that Maples has been kept back for so long. I actually think it's given Cham the ability to also re-grab his fourth base to... For some reason, also to like take another new base, I guess his fifth base and stuff. If he's able to defend this base over here, I actually think that I still like Champ's position. I just don't know if he actually has had enough time. This is a lot of stalkers. The Archon's also packing quite a wall up with plus two weapons. Roaches and Ravagers are starting to overpower through the Archons. And now it's just Blink Stalkers. A lot of them over to use their Blink. And Cham with the overwhelming numbers, he did end up buying enough time over there. He is gonna be able to push this back. and may even be able to get in on top of this proxy bond. A little bit of an awkward wraparound from the left-hand side with some of those reinforcements, but yeah, Champ does end up having enough. He finally, finally puts the ax and Maples is back and claws out the victory there. Yeah, it's funny. I'm looking at this like, you know, this is probably the best fight Maples is ever going to get. Half the army was chasing the Zealots on the left side, so you're, you're kind of fighting half the army with more than half of your army. It's plus two, plus one, like two one, plus two attack, plus one armor. You have it's only plus two melee, so the roaches don't really benefit. Like, this was the best possible fight that Maples was probably going to find for the rest of the game. Unfortunately, Zerg army on creep fast, <laughs> and they bought just enough time. The fight wasn't bad enough for Cham, and game one does go the way of, does go the way of Cham. But, dude, like, NA has been Stressful. delivering today. This was... Yeah. It's been a lot of fun, I think. A lot of very competitive back and forth, kind of, like, interesting and close series. I think that last game was a little bit wonky just because I think Cham had a very significant lead in that last game and just kind of struggled to close it out there with some of the decisions he was making. And honestly, also, I have to give full credit to Maples on the Zealot run buys and the timing of that alongside with Cham trying to go for the counter. Really, really nicely timed. He was able to get very close to getting a significant amount of damage done with the Zealot run by, which he then actually turned into a kill on the hatchery later on. So nice job from Maples and also just nice job on the defense there with like the Stasis traps and the defense against the Banelings. You were pointing this out, Banewolf. Maples did a great job defending against all of the Banelings like throughout a majority of that game. There was like one Baneling run by and killed 10 workers. And I think all of the rest of the Baneling run bys were not very effective. Yeah. So there was one time yeah. when like there were Banelings with the army on the fourth base. It's like, okay, that, that actually got a lot mm -hmm. of damage done. And I thought that was actually gonna be the end of the game. But no, no, because this is America's and Blink Stalkers are really good and Maples was able <laughs> to make it happen. And now we get Oceanborn. Map number two. And Maples, he played a standard game and went toe-to-toe -to -toe with it. Champ, I, there, was, there were worlds where Maples wins that game. So 
Do you do it again? Or do we see something weird? Because he certainly, Ravi, we know. He's got weird things up the gullet. Or on the docket. He's got weird things in his back pocket. That's the phrase. Anyways, in the upper left, in the red. Down a game, but man, making that far closer than it felt like it had any right to be. It's Maples. And down in the bottom right-hand side of the map, currently sitting up 1-0 and one game away from moving to the playoffs. It is our Blue Zerg player, Cham. I'm saying team of Starlight Twinkle. Best team name. Remember, this is our final do or die game of the uh, the group stages, the final game of the group stages, or I should say series of the group stages, because it could be the final game, but we don't know that yet. Depends on if Cham wins. Can't believe uh, Ravi here, the bias. It's the final game. I, he, you don't believe in Maples. My goodness, Spear Dragon. <laughs> I think that Maples showed some cool stuff in that last game, but there are still some concerns I have about kind of like the early or like the mid game, I should say. I think actually early game, he did a really nice job. He was able to get a lot of kills with the Oracle. He was able to find nice damage with the Adepts and everything. But when it came to that kind of big mid game push and like, Dealing with, for example, the mutas and stuff, Maples really did start, start, to, start to fall apart pretty quickly. So I think that was hopefully just like game one jitters a little bit. Also just getting used to facing off against Cham, who isn't always the biggest muta player. So I'm interested to see what Maples is going to be putting down in game number two. Yeah, you know what's also really weird? Plus one air was finished and not a single muta was, or not a single Phoenix was made against the mutas. Like... I understand that you're kind of worried about what's happening and it, it at a certain once the muta showed up economy is shattered you're really affording a bunch of phoenix is hard but he committed for plus one which i think was a bait that he just kind of forgot to cancel mm -hmm. but i get four get four plus one phoenix and that muta threat is not nearly as strong as it otherwise was yeah i mean frankly it was at the point where a lot of the game there was only seven mutas out yeah. i think three phoenixes like three phoenixes is all you even need to really even deal with that but i'm with you i think that that would have been nice if you already had the stargate i'm a big fan of just investing in like two or three phoenix because you think you can still find value with them you can still pick off some overlords at least that are around the map you can lift up a couple of drones and just get scouting information as well but a little bit unfortunate there. Maples is not going to have that opportunity as game one is now over. It's or the moment is past, Behemoth. We're moving into game number two, and he's got to make his own new decisions for a new game. And, I mean, I would actually be surprised if Cham played exactly the same way as last game. By the way, you know what I love? I'm seeing people in, in chat. Every single time a Protoss player wins a game or loses a game, just being people spam, the only conclusion that I can draw from this is that Protoss needs a, needs a nerf. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how the internet goes uh but yeah no it's gonna be interesting to see where maples is gonna go into this game number two he looked promising we saw some pretty cool ideas uh, obviously some things that would love to see get cleaned up but i gotta say i'm a little surprised to see, uh, yeah he's not no no he's sitting on the pile on a little bit longer but i'm a little cool surprised time, so. to see him just play standard maples had some really cool builds against eggs that you know kind of took his opponent off guard won some games and maybe it's just like Oceanborn, Alcyne are maps that are a little bit too standard to get away with anything super crazy. I don't know. But again, seeing Maples go Oracle into Blink. I mean, yeah, faking the plus one is a little bit weird. But in general, just going for this very standard play. Not what I think of when I think of Maples. I, I feel like when I've seen Maples in the past, this is why I was kind of saying, like, I'm interested to see what Maples is doing right now because I'm less familiar with what his current meta of play is. But I know in the past, I feel like I've seen some decent variety from Maple. So maybe he's been all like doing a lot, little bit more on the all inning side or something, especially maybe during qualifiers or something like that. But it's cool to see that he still has got that kind of macro in his back pocket. He has a little bit of that variety of PV, uh, whatever sort of play style behind him. And this game, we got three oracles coming on up, but then we're going straight into that Twilight Council, adding on the forge, getting into a nice little comfortable zone and already finding some good damage with those oracles, I would say. Yeah, Reaper, I mean, realistically, you're not expecting to get a ton of damage until you get two or three oracles together and then go from there. And I do like this. We've started to see this happen more and more across Korea and Asia and Europe and now in the Americas where you get a couple more adepts than you might. Oh, he can cancel the fourth base. 
he, he's not gonna see it okay, okay well that's a bit unfortunate <laughs> Uh, but you get these adepts with the oracles and generally how Zerg players have been trying to defend it's oh he's gonna get a queen very nicely there it knocks one down but because Ooh. Zerg players tend to go and these are well uh, the second get queen because Zerg players try to be pretty greedy on their defense you can often get something done force a lot of lings out snipe two queens has happened here and Ooh. it's gonna get out okay what most of the adepts are dead one still remains and look at what champ does immediately he's like ah you just used a lot of energy or on your oracles. You just lost a bunch of your adepts. I can cancel this third base. That was a lot of really unfortunate micro there from Maples. I think maybe feeling it a little bit after that last game and kind of how hectic and crazy it got for a lot of it. Uh, I mean, just the fact shaded the adepts back. Two of the adepts didn't actually get fully pulled back as Maples, I think, was maybe microing somewhere else. And so they run back into the lings, they get picked off, which means that the rest of the adepts are a little bit more vulnerable. The oracles right clicking on the hatchery rather than actually killing off the, any of the drones or any of the lings or even the queens. That's another unfortunate one. I'm, I won't say I'm like fully on full on worried here for maples, but I'm starting to get a little bit worried here for maples. Yeah, I don't mean behind this champs double expanding as well. Granted, I think that's effectively one of those bases is a macro hatch. He doesn't tend to really saturate it for a while. Just yeah, if you're going to get a macro hatch, you're going to play Ling heavy. Might as well put it on the map. It gives you creep and means you have an easier expand later on. But Maples, he doesn't have this timing before everything's ready. Is I guess the thing right now. Roaches are on the way. Lings are on the way. But Blink is about 30 seconds out. Plus one's about 30 seconds out, give or take. And as Cham is already on the map here with a ton of stuff. Again, this fourth mm -hmm. and fifth hatch is not there to to mine it's there it's there for lava that's it this attack coming in from cham is pretty scary but again you last a little bit longer blinks done in 10 seconds plus one's done pretty far after that problem is there is no shield battery there's one in the mineral line there's not a lot of stack defense right now stalkers have to run away their blink is done so they do have that shield battery river charge has to get popped here as well and they can go up on the high ground warpins are doing a pretty good job oracles on the back line getting on top of these ravagers and it doesn't look impossible but it is hard rubby um, Chem actually not going after the shield battery overcharge for quite a bit of time, so that ends up buying Maples a lot of time to try and get some extra micro out with these Blink Stalkers that were losing some of the shields, but it seems like he's starting to get a little bit overrun, and yeah, Gateway's getting V power on the low ground as well. Fourth base finishing up the last thing in the world that Maples wanted to have a hunt or 400 extra resources invested into. Good game, good luck gets called. Cham wins the game as Maples just does not see that big roach attack coming. That's a that's a tough one because you have the oracles in your opponent's main base and they're natural. You're running them around. You're like, I see some drones. Like, I see that there's another hatchery and stuff. Surely this all looks okay. But what he didn't realize is how many units are just rallying into the center of the map. He didn't quite catch wind to the fact that he there was no real transition. It was like 56 workers and Maples was... 15 to 20 workers up still making three workers at a time and taking a fourth base it was a it was a rough spot that yeah. was not going to really be defendable yeah that was pretty rough and unfortunately again i it was a beautiful it's funny we taught we opened this series talking about how you know cham doesn't play with a lot of subtlety he just smash mouth zerg running right into you that was a crisp timing he had a right as mm -hmm. like right before blink was done right before the gateways were complete right before plus one was done and yeah maple's I think you'd rather have 10 less probes and five more shield batteries. That would be nice. But again, like that was a really nice timing from Sham. It hit right before mm -hmm. everything was ready. And while we do see Max Packs hold those quite a bit, that's just because he's very, very good. That is not an easy thing to do. And Sham, yeah, he's in the playoffs. Our last Zerg player, uh, excuse me, our last player in general, joining the likes of Eric, joining the likes of Nina. Oh, I'm sorry. Disc moved on. Uh, joining the life, likes of Disc. <laughs> joining the likes of Nina. Ignore the dots. That's a mistake. We'll fix it. Yeah. But really, really sick that we now have our eight players from the Americas region who have moved on to the uh, the playoffs. Unlike Europe, it's not 16 players, so I don't mind rattling off the names of eight players. It's uh, Scarlet Trigger, Estrella Kelazor, Future, Disc, Nina, and now Cham. There are going to be our eight players who make it to the playoffs. Nice performance there, by the way, I want to say from Maples, as I think he is truly one of those like very up and coming players for North America. He's a player that has maybe made it close to qualifying for some of these regionals and stuff, but not actually made it. Uh, I think he made it for a single season, like back in 2021, but got knocked down like 
bottom 16. So this is already kind of like outdoing his previous performance. He can definitely walk away feeling a little bit proud that he made it all the way to round five, made it very close to be able to make it all the way to the playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. This is by far his best result. If he's able to, he could have won game one. It was dicey. It was weird, but he could have done it. And I think if you scout a little bit better in game two, that all in is still pretty holdable. Um, I guess it is uh, pressure, whatever you want to call it. That attack coming in is still pretty holdable. So to see Maples finally kind of crack through and, and go and properly find his way into even just round five and not getting, you know, zero or three in the first three round of the Swiss, it's got to be encouraging. It makes me, I don't know if he's going to attend the open bracket for, for Dallas or not, but it makes me excited about that. And who knows where else we go? I mean, I love seeing players come up. I big Firefly Flan. I'm so excited to see what's going to happen with Lemon and Nami in, in, in the Asian region. It's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's really cool seeing these players develop. It really has been a lot of fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how all those playoffs are going to go. And those are going to be starting next week. And I believe at the day it's starting, it's not like, you know, how some of the previous seasons have gone where you would say, oh, Sunday, like, show ends monday's ept weekly and then we resume tuesday no no no. we're not coming back i believe until thursday for day number 12 the first day of the playoffs asian upper bracket round of eight european upper bracket round 16 part one is uh what's going to happen on thursday that's going to be april 25th and then gonna be asian lower bracket the other half of the european upper bracket uh now the big thing though point out this asian grand finals are happening next sunday the 28th of april and we don't start the Americas bracket until the following Thursday. So if you're really, you're in here and you say, I want to see these Americas players. I want to see Scarlet. I want to see Cham. I want to see, uh, I want to see Nina maybe make a deeper run. That doesn't start until, until May 2nd. So you're going to have to wait a little bit. But in the meantime, there's going to be a ton of good StarCraft to watch. Absolutely. There will be. But uh, that is going to do it for us. We're, we're all done with our StarCraft for today, dude. Yeah. It's been a long go. It's, I mean, we've, some of the games early on were a little fast, a little one side of a man. Nina, Nina special this last series. America's been, um, America's delivered in a way that I don't know, I didn't necessarily expect, but it makes me very happy. I'm always delighted to cast some NA StarCraft, man. It's, it's always a treat. Exactly yeah. what I expected. All right, then. So playoffs start next Thursday. They go for the next two weekends, Thursday through Sunday. As we, chat, we, as we get ready to crown our champion for Americas, for Europe, and for, well, and for Asia as well. And figure out who exactly gets those nice direct seeds on into Dallas. So for now, we're done. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. We'll catch you next Thursday. As the playoffs, they get started for real. You love it, you wear it, wear it. Wear your passion. <laughs> Share your passion. Wherever, whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com.